English Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 1. The Two Drovers by Sir Walter Scott. Part 1. It was the day after Don Fair when my story commences. It had been a brisk market, several dealers had attended from the northern and midland counties in England, and English money had flown so merrily about as to gladden the hearts of the highland farmers. Many large droves were about to set off for England, under the protection of their owners or of the topsmen whom they employed in the tedious, laborious and responsible office of driving the cattle for many hundred miles from the markets where they had been purchased to the fields or farmyards where they were to be fattened for the shambles. The Highlanders, in particular, are masters of this difficult trade of driving, which seems to suit them as well as the trade of war. It affords exercise for all their habits of patient endurance and active exertion. They are required to know perfectly the drove roads which lie over the wildest tracts of the country, and to avoid as much as possible the highways which distress the feet of the bullocks and the turnpikes which annoy the spirit of the drover. Whereas on the broad green or grey track which leads across the pathless moor, the herd not only move at ease and without taxation, but, if they mind their business, may pick up a mouthful of food by the way. At night the drovers usually sleep along with their cattle, let the weather be what it will, and many of these hardy men do not once rest under a roof during a journey on foot from Loch Arbor to Lincolnshire. They are paid very highly, for the trust reposed is of the last importance, as it depends on their prudence, vigilance and honesty, whether the cattle reach the final market in good order and afford a profit to the grazier. But, as they maintain themselves at their own expense, they are especially economical in that particular. At the period we speak of, a highland drover was victualled for his long and toilsome journey with a few handfuls of oatmeal and two or three onions, renewed from time to time, and a ram's horn filled with whisky, which he used regularly but sparingly every night and morning. His dirk, or skeen do, that is, black knife, so worn as to be concealed beneath the arm or by the folds of the plaid, was his only weapon, excepting the cudgel with which he directed the movements of the cattle. A highlander was never so happy as on these occasions. There was a variety in the whole journey which exercised the Celt's natural curiosity and love of motion. There were the constant change of place and scene, the petty adventures incidental to the traffic, and the intercourse with the various farmers, graziers and traders, intermingled with occasional merry-makings, not the less acceptable to Donald that they were void of expense. And there was the consciousness of superior skill, for the Highlander, a child amongst flocks, is a prince amongst herds, and his natural habits induce him to disdain the shepherd's slothful life, so that he feels himself nowhere more at home than when following a gallant drove of his country castle in the character of their guardian. Of the number who left Doon in the morning, and with the purpose we have described, not a gloonomy of them all cocked his bonnet more briskly, or gartered his tartan hose under knee over a pair of more promising spigs, that is legs, than did Robin Oig McCombick, called familiarly Robin Oig, that is, young, or the lesser Robin. Though small of stature, as the epithet Oig implies, and not very strongly limbed, he was as light and alert as one of the deer of his mountains. He had an elasticity of step which, in the course of a long march, made many a stout fellow envy him, and the manner in which he busked his plaid and adjusted his bonnet argued a consciousness that so smart a John Highland man as himself would not pass unnoticed among the lowland lasses. The ruddy cheek, red lips and white teeth set off a countenance which had gained by exposure to the weather a healthful and hardy rather than a rugged hue. If Robin Oig did not laugh, or even smile frequently, as indeed is not the practice among his countrymen, his bright eyes usually gleamed from under his bonnet with an expression of cheerfulness ready to be turned into mirth. The departure of Robin Oig was an incident in the little town in and near which he had many friends, male and female. He was a topping person in his way, transacted considerable business on his own behalf, and was entrusted by the best farmers in the highlands in preference to any other drover in that district. He might have increased his business to any extent had he condescended to manage it by deputy. But except a lad or two, sisters' sons of his own, Robin rejected the idea of assistance, 
conscious, perhaps, how much his reputation depended upon his attending in person to the practical discharge of his duty in every instance. He remained, therefore, contented with the highest premium given to persons of his description, and comforted himself with the hopes that a few journeys to England might enable him to conduct business on his own account in a manner becoming his birth. For Robin Oig's father, Lachlan McCombick, or son of my friend, his actual clan surname being MacGregor, had been so called by the celebrated Rob Roy because of the particular friendship which had subsisted between the grandsire of Robin and that renowned Cateran. Some people even say that Robin Oig derived his Christian name from one as renowned in the wilds of Loch Lomond as ever was his namesake Robin Hood in the precincts of Merry Sherwood. Of such ancestry, as James Boswell says, who would not be proud? Robin Oig was proud accordingly. But his frequent visits to England and to the lowlands had given him tact enough to know that pretensions which still gave him a little right to distinction in his own lonely glen might be both obnoxious and ridiculous if preferred elsewhere. The pride of birth, therefore, was like the miser's treasure, the secret subject of his contemplation, but never exhibited to strangers as a subject of boasting. Many were the words of gratulation and good luck which were bestowed on Robin Oig. The judges commended his drove, especially Robin's own property, which were the best of them. Some thrust out their snuff-mulls for the parting pinch, others tendered the jocondarach or parting cup. All cried, Good luck travel out with you and come home with you. Give you luck in the Saxon market, brave notes in the lower do or black pocket-book, and plenty of English fold in the sporran, that is, pouch of goatskin. The bonny lasses made their adieus more modestly, and more than one, it was said, would have given her best brooch to be certain that it was upon her that his eye last rested as he turned towards the road. Robin Oig had just given the preliminary hoo-hoo to urge forward the loiterers of the drove when there was a cry behind him. Stay, Robin, by the blink. Here is Janet of Tomahurick, old Janet, your father's sister. Plague on her for an old highland witch and spaywife, said a farmer from the cast of Stirling. She'll cast some of her cantrips on the cattle. She canna do that, said another sapient of the same profession. Robin Oig is no the lad to leave any of them without tying said Mungo's knot on their tails. And that will put to her speed the best witch that ever flew over Dimiet upon a broomstick. It may not be indifferent to the reader to know that the Highland cattle are peculiarly liable to be taken or infected by spells and witchcraft, which judicious people guard against by knitting knots of peculiar complexity on the tuft of hair which terminates the animal's tail. But the old woman who was the object of the farmer's suspicion seemed only busied about the drover, without paying any attention to the drove. Robin, on the contrary, appeared rather impatient of her presence. "'What our world fancy,' he said, "'has brought you so early from the Ingleside this morning, Moom. "'I am sure I bid you good evening, "'and had your God's speed last night. "'And left me more siller than the useless old woman will use "'till you come back again, bird of my bosom,' said the Sibyl. "'But it is little I would care for the food that nourishes me, "'or the fire that warms me, or for God's blessed son itself, "'if aught but weal should happen to the grandson of my father.' So let me walk the diesel round you, that you may go safe out into the far foreign land and come safe home." Robin Oig stopped, half embarrassed, half laughing, and signing to those around that he only complied with the old woman to soothe her humour. In the meantime she traced around him with wavering steps the propitiation which some have thought has been derived from the druidical mythology. It consists, as is well known, in the person who makes the diesel, walking three times round the person who is the object of the ceremony, taking care to move according to the course of the sun. At once, however, she stopped short and exclaimed in a voice of alarm and horror, "'Grandson of my father, there is blood on your hand!' "'Hush, for God's sake, aunt,' said Robin Oig. "'You will bring more trouble on yourself with this tajitara, second sight, than you will be able to get out of for many a day.' The old woman only repeated, with a ghastly look, "'There is blood on your hand, and it is English blood. The blood of the gale is richer and redder. Let us see, let us—' Ere Robin Oig could prevent her, 
which indeed could only have been by positive violence, so hasty and peremptory were her proceedings, she had drawn from his side the dirk which lodged in the folds of his plaid, and held it up, exclaiming, although the weapon gleamed clear and bright in the sun, Blood, blood, Saxon blood again! Robin Oig McCombick, go not this day to England! Tut, tut, answered Robin Oig, that will never do neither. It will be next thing to run in the country. For shame, Moom, give me the dirk. You canny tell by the colour the difference betwixt the blood of a black bullock and a white one, and you speak of knowing Saxon from Gaelic blood. All men have their blood from Adam, Moom. Give me my skeen do, and let me go on my road. I should have been half way to Stirling Brig by this time. Give me my dirk and let me go. Never will I give it to you, said the old woman. Never will I quit my hold upon your plaid unless you promise me not to wear that unhappy weapon. The women around him urged him also, saying few of his aunt's words fell to the ground, and as the lowland farmers continued to look moodily on the scene, Robin Oig determined to close it at any sacrifice. Well then, said the young drover, giving the scabbard of the weapon to Hugh Morrison, you lowlanders care nothing for these freaks. Keep my dirk for me. I cannot give it you because it was my father's. But your drove follows ours, and I am content it should be in your keeping, not in mine. Will this do, Moom? It must, said the old woman. That is, if the lowlander is mad enough to carry the knife. The strong westland man laughed aloud. Ha ha, good wife, said he. I am Hugh Morrison from Glenay, come of the manly Morrisons of Auld Lang Syne, that never took short weapon against a man in their lives. And neither needed they, they had their broadswords, when I have this bit supple, showing a formidable cudgel. For dirking o'er the board, I leave that to John Highland man. You needn't snort none of you Highlanders, and you in especial, Robin. I'll keep the bit knife, if you are feared of the old spaywife's tale, and give it back to you whenever you want it. Robin was not particularly pleased with some part of Hugh Morrison's speech, but he had learned in his travels more patience than belonged to his highland constitution originally, and he accepted the service of the descendant of the manly Morrisons, without finding fault with the rather deprecating manner in which it was offered. If he had not had his morning in his head, and been but a drum freeshire hog into the boot, he would have spoken more like a gentleman, but you cannot have more of a sow than a grump. It's shame my father's knife should ever slash a haggis for the like of him. Thus saying, but saying it in Gaelic, Robin drove on his cattle, and waved farewell to all behind him. He was in the greater haste because he expected to join at Falkirk, a comrade and brother in profession with whom he proposed to travel in company. Robin Oig's chosen friend was a young Englishman, Harry Wakefield by name, well known at every northern market and in his way as much famed and honoured as our highland driver of bullocks. He was nearly six feet high, gallantly formed to keep the rounds at Straithfield or maintain the ring at a wrestling match, and although he might have been overmatched perhaps among the regular professors of the fancy, yet as a yokel or rustic or a chance customer he was able to give a bellyful to any amateur of the pugilistic art. Doncaster races saw him in his glory betting his guinea, and generally successfully. Nor was there a main fought in Yorkshire, the feeders being persons of celebrity, at which he was not to be seen if business permitted. But though a sprack lad and fond of pleasures and its haunts, Harry Wakefield was steady, and not the cautious Robin Oig McCombick himself was more attentive to the main chance. His holidays were holidays indeed, but his days of work were dedicated to steady and persevering labour. In countenance and temper Wakefield was the model of old England's merry yeomen, whose cloth-yard shafts in so many hundred battles asserted her superiority over the nations, and whose good sabres in our own time are her cheapest and most assured defence. His mirth was readily excited, for, strong in limb and constitution, and fortunate in circumstances, he was disposed to be pleased with everything about him and such difficulties as he might occasionally encounter were, to a man of his energy, rather matter of amusement than serious annoyance. With all the merits of a sanguine temper, our young English drover was not without his defects. He was irascible, sometimes to the verge of being quarrelsome, 
and perhaps not the less inclined to bring his disputes to a pugilistic decision because he found few antagonists able to stand up to him in the boxing ring. It is difficult to say how Harry Wakefield and Robin Oig first became intimates, but it is certain a close acquaintance had taken place betwixt them, although they had apparently few common subjects of conversation or of interest, so soon as their talk ceased to be of bullocks. Robin Oig, indeed, spoke the English language rather imperfectly upon any other topics but stots and kylos and Harry Wakefield could never bring his broad Yorkshire tongue to utter a single word of Gaelic. It was in vain Robin spent a whole morning during a walk over Minch Moor in attempting to teach his companion to utter, with true precision, the shibboleth the who, which is the Gaelic for a calf. From Tarquar to Murder Cairn, the hill rung with the discordant attempts of the Saxon upon the unmanageable monosyllable and the heartfelt laugh which followed every failure. They had, however, better modes of awakening the echoes, for Wakefield could sing many a ditty to the praise of Moll, Susan, and Sicily, and Robin Oig had a particular gift at whistling interminable pibrochs through all their involutions, and what was more agreeable to his companion's southern ear, knew many of the northern airs, both lively and pathetic, to which Wakefield learned to pipe a bass. Thus, though Robin Oig could have hardly comprehended his companion's stories about horse-racing and cock-fighting or fox-hunting, and although his own legends of clan-fights and creas varied with talk of highland goblins and fairy folk would have been caviar to his companion, they contrived nevertheless to find a degree of pleasure in each other's company, which had for three years back induced them to join company and travel together when the direction of their journey permitted. Each, indeed, found his advantage in this companionship, for where could the Englishman have found a guide through the western highlands like Robin Oig McCombick? And when they were on what Harry called the right side of the border, his patronage, which was extensive, and his purse, which was heavy, were at all times at the service of his highland friend, and on many occasions his liberality did him genuine yeoman's service. End of section 1 International Short Stories, Volume 2 English Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tig Hines International Short Stories, Volume 2 English Stories Edited by William Patton Section 2 The Two Drovers by Sir Walter Scott Part two. Were ever two such loving friends, how could they disagree? O oh, thus it was he loved him dear, and thought how to requite him, and having no friend left but he, he did resolve to fight him, duke upon duke. The pair of friends had traversed with their usual cordiality the grassy wilds of Lidsdale, and crossed the opposite part of Cumberland emphatically called the Waste. In these solitary regions the cattle under the charge of our drovers derived their subsistence chiefly by picking their food as they went along the drove road, or sometimes by the tempting opportunity of a start and o'er loop or invasion of the neighbouring pasture where an occasion presented itself. But now the scene changed before them. They were descending towards a fertile and enclosed country, where no such liberties could be taken with impunity or without previous arrangement and bargain with the possessors of the ground. This was more especially the case, as a great northern fair was upon the eve of taking place, where both the Scotch and the English drover expected to dispose of a part of their cattle, which it was desirable to produce in the market rested and in good order. Fields were therefore difficult to be obtained, and only upon high terms. This necessity occasioned a temporary separation betwixt the two friends who went to bargain, each as he could, for the separate accommodation of his herd. Unhappily it chanced that both of them, unknown to each other, thought of bargaining for the ground they wanted on the property of a country gentleman of some fortune, whose estate lay in the neighbourhood. The English drover applied to the bailiff on the property, who was known to him. It chanced that the Cumbrian squire, who had entertained some suspicions of his manager's honesty, was taking occasional measures to ascertain how far they were well founded, and had desired that any inquiries about his enclosures, with a view to occupy them for a temporary purpose, 
should be referred to himself. As, however, Mr. Ireby had gone the day before upon a journey of some miles' distance to the northward, the bailiff chose to consider the check upon his full powers as for the time removed, and concluded that he could best consult his master's interest, and perhaps his own, in making an agreement with Harry Wakefield. Meanwhile, ignorant of what his comrade was doing, Robin Oig, on his side, chanced to be overtaken by a good-looking, smart little man upon a pony, most knowingly hogged and cropped as was then the fashion, the rider wearing tight leather breeches and long-necked bright spurs. This cavalier asked one or two pertinent questions about markets and the price of stock. So Robin, seeing him a well-judging civil gentleman, took the freedom to ask him whether he could let him know if there was any grassland to be let in the neighbourhood for the temporary accommodation of his drove. He could not have put the question to more willing ears. The gentleman of the buckskins was the proprietor with whose bailiff Harry Wakefield had dealt, or was in the act of dealing. "'Thou art in good luck, my canny Scot,' said Mr. Ireby, to have spoken to me. For I see thy cattle have done thy day's work, and I have at my disposal the only field within three miles that is to be let in these parts. The drove can be gang two, three, four miles very pretty well indeed, said the cautious Highlander. But what would his honour be asking for the beasts be the head, if she was to take the park for two or three days? We won't differ, Sonny, if you let me have six stots for winterers, in the way of reason. And which beasts would your honour be for having? Why, let me see. The two black, the dun one, yon doddy, him with the twisted horn, the brocket. How much by the head? Ah, said Robin, your honour is a judge, a real judge. I couldn't have set off the best six beasts better myself, me that ken em as if they were my bairns, poor things. Well, how much per head, Sawney? continued Mr. Ireby. It was high markets at Doon and Falkirk, answered Robin. And thus the conversation proceeded, until they had agreed on the pre-just for the bullocks, the squire throwing in the temporary accommodation of the enclosure for the cattle into the boot, and Robin making, as he thought, a very good bargain, provided the grass was but tolerable. The squire walked his pony alongside of the drove, partly to show him the way, and see him put into possession of the field, and partly to learn the latest news of the northern markets. They arrived at the field and the pasture seemed excellent. But what was their surprise when they saw the bailiff quietly inducting the cattle of Harry Wakefield into the grassy Goshen which had just been assigned to those of Robin Oig McCombick by the proprietor himself? Squire Ireby set spurs to his horse, dashed up to his servant, and learning what had passed between the parties, briefly informed the English drover that his bailiff had let the ground without his authority, and that he might seek grass for his cattle wherever he would since he was to get none there. At the same time he rebuked his servant severely for having transgressed his commands, and ordered him instantly to assist in ejecting the hungry and weary cattle of Harry Wakefield, who were just beginning to enjoy a meal of unusual plenty, and to introduce those of his comrade whom the English drover now began to consider as a rival. The feelings which arose in Wakefield's mind would have induced him to resist Mr. Ireby's decision. But every Englishman has a tolerably accurate sense of law and justice, and John Fleecebumpkin, the bailiff, having acknowledged that he had exceeded his commission, Wakefield saw nothing else for it than to collect his hungry and disappointed charge and drive them on to seek quarters elsewhere. Robin Oig saw what had happened with regret and hastened to offer his English friend to share with him the disputed possession. But Wakefield's pride was severely hurt, and he answered disdainfully, Take it all, man, take it all. Never make two bites of a cherry. Thou canst talk over the gentry and blear a plain man's eye. Out upon you, man. I would not kiss any man's dirty latchets for leave to bake in his oven. Robin Oig, sorry but not surprised at his comrade's displeasure, hastened to entreat his friend to wait but an hour till he had gone to the squire's house to receive payment for the cattle he had sold, and he would come back and help him to drive the cattle into some convenient place of rest and explained to him the whole mistake they had both of them fallen into. But the Englishman continued indignant. Thou hast been selling, hast thou? Ay, ay, thou was a cunning lad for kenning the hours of bargaining. Go to the devil with thyself, for I will ne'er see thy false loon's visage again. 
thou should be ashamed to look me in the face. I am ashamed to look no man in the face, said Robin Oig, something moved. And moreover, I will look you in the face this blessed day, if you abide at the clochan down yonder. Mayhap you would as well keep away, said his comrade, and turning his back on his former friend, he collected his unwilling associates, assisted by the bailiff, who took some real and some affected interest in seeing Wakefield accommodated. After spending some time in negotiating with more than one of the neighbouring farmers, who could not, or would not, afford the accommodation desired, Harry Wakefield, at last, and in his necessity, accomplished his point by means of the landlord of the alehouse, at which Robin Oig and he had agreed to pass the night when they first separated from each other. Mine host was content to let him turn his cattle on a piece of barren moor, at a price little less than the bailiff had asked for the disputed enclosure, and the wretchedness of the pasture, as well as the price paid for it, were set down as exaggerations of the breach of faith and friendship of his Scottish crony. This turn of Wakefield's passions was encouraged by the bailiff, who had his own reasons for being offended against poor Robin, as having been the unwitting cause of his falling into disgrace with his master, as well as by the innkeeper and two or three chance guests, who stimulated the drover in his resentment against his quondam associate, some from the ancient grudge against the Scots, which, when it exists anywhere, is to be found lurking in the border counties, and some from the general love of mischief which characterises mankind in all ranks of life, to the honour of Adam's children be it spoken. Good John Barleycorn also, who always heightens and exaggerates the prevailing passions, be they angry or kindly, was not wanting in his offices on this occasion, and confusion to false friends and hard masters was pledged in more than one tankard. In the meanwhile, Mr. Ireby found some amusement in detaining the northern drover at his ancient hall. He caused the cold round of beef to be placed before the Scot in the butler's pantry, together with a foaming tankard of home-brewed, and took pleasure in seeing the hearty appetite with which these unwonted edibles were discussed by Robin Oig McCombick. The squire himself, lighting his pipe, compounded between his patrician dignity and his love of agricultural gossip, by walking up and down while he conversed with his guest. "'I passed another drove,' said the squire, "'with one of your countrymen behind them. There were something less beasts than your drove. Doddies, most of them. A big man was with them. None of your kilts, though, but a decent pair of breeches. Do you know who he may be?' "'What? Oh, I? That might, could, and would be Huey Morrison. I didn't think he would have been so well up. He has made a day on us but his Argyll shires will have wearied shanks. How far was he behind? I think about six or seven miles, answered the squire, for I passed them at Christenbury Crag, and I overtook you at the Holland Bush. If his beasts be leg-weary, he will be maybe selling bargains. Now, now, Huey Morrison is no the man for bargains. You mun come to some highland body like Robin Oak herself for the like of these. But I mun be wishing you good-night and twenty of them, let alone one. And I'm one down to the clochan to see if the lad Harry Wackfelt is out of his humdudgeons yet." The party at the alehouse were still in full talk, and the treachery of Robin Oig still the theme of conversation when the supposed culprit entered the apartment. His arrival, as usually happens in such a case, put an instant stop to the discussion of which he had furnished the subject and he was received by the company assembled with that chilling silence which, more than a thousand exclamations, tells an intruder that he is unwelcome. Surprised and offended, but not appalled by the reception which he experienced, Robin entered with an undaunted and even a haughty air, attempted no greeting, as he saw he was received with none, and placed himself by the side of the fire, a little apart from a table at which Harry Wakefield, the bailiff, and two or three other persons were seated. The ample Cumbrian kitchen would have afforded plenty of room, even for a larger separation. Robin, thus seated, proceeded to light his pipe and call for a pint of tuppenny. "'We have no tuppence ale,' answered Ralph Heskett, the landlord. "'But as thou find'st thy own tobacco, it's like thou mayst find thy own liquor, too. It's the wont of thy country, I wot.' "'Shame, good man,' said the landlady, a blithe, bustling housewife hastening herself to supply the guest with liquor. Thou knowest well enow what the strange man wants, 
and it's thy trade to be civil man. Thou shouldst know that if the Scot likes a small pot, he pays a sure penny." Without taking any notice of this nuptial dialogue, the Highlander took the flagon in his hand, and addressing the company generally, drank the interesting toast of good markets to the party assembled. "'The better that the wind blew fewer dealers from the north,' said one of the farmers, "'and fewer highland runs to eat up the English meadows.' "'Soul of my body, but you are wrong there, my friend,' answered Robin with composure. "'It's your fat Englishmen that eat up our Scots cattle, poor things.' "'I wish there was some to eat up their drovers,' said another. "'A plain Englishman canna make bread with a kennin of them.' "'Or an honest servant keep his master's favour, but they will come sliding in between him and the sunshine,' said the bailiff. "'If these be jokes,' said Robin Oig, with the same composure, "'there is o'er many jokes upon one man.' "'It's no joke, but downright earnest.' said the bailiff. Harky, Mr. Robin Ogg, or whatever is your name, it's right we should tell you that we are all of one opinion, and that is that you, Mr. Robin Ogg, have behaved to our friend Mr. Harry Wakefield here like a raff and a blackguard. Nay doubt, nay doubt, answered Robin with great composure, and you are a set of very pretty judges, for whose brains or behaviour I would not gi a pinch of sneezing. If Mr. Harry Wakefield kens where he is wronged, he kens where he may be righted. He speaks truth, said Wakefield, who had listened to what had passed, divided between the offence which he had taken at Robin's late behaviour and the revival of his habitual feelings of regard. He now rose and went towards Robin, who got up from his seat as he approached and held out his hand. That's right, Harry, go it, serve him out, resounded on all sides. Tip him the nailer, show him the mill. Hold your peace, all of you, and be said Wakefield, and then addressing his comrade, took him by the extended hand with something alike of respect and defiance. Robin, he said, thou hast used me ill enough this day, but if you mean, like a frank fellow, to shake hands and take a tussle for love on the sod, why, I'll forgive thee, man, and we shall be better friends than ever. And would it no be better to be good friends without more of the matter? said Robin. We will be much better friendships with our pains hale than broken. Harry Wakefield dropped the hand of his friend, or rather threw it from him. I did not think I had been keeping company for three years with a coward. Coward belongs to none of my name, said Robin, whose eyes began to kindle, but keeping the command of his temper. It was no coward's legs or hands, Harry Wakefield, that drew you out of the fords of Frew when you was drifted o'er the black rock, and every eel in the river expected a share of you. And that is true enough, too said the Englishman, struck by the appeal. "'Dad zooks!' exclaimed the bailiff. "'Sure Harry Wakefield, the nattiest lad at Whitson, Treast, Wooler Fair, Carlisle Sands, or Stagshaw Bank, is not going to show the white feather. <laughs> this comes of living so long with kilts and bonnets. Men forget the use of their daddies. "'I may teach you, Master Fleecebumpkin, that I have not lost the use of mine,' said Wakefield, and then went on. This will never do, Robin. We must have a turn-up, or we shall be the talk of the countryside. I'll be damned if I hurt thee. I'll put on the gloves, Ginda like. Come, stand forward like a man. To be beaten like a dog, said Robin. Is there any reason in that? If you think I have done you wrong, I'll go before your judge, though I neither know his law nor his language. A general cry of, No, no, no law, no lawyer. A bellyful and be friends was echoed by the bystanders. But, continued Robin, if I am to fight, I have no skill to fight like a jack in apes with hands and nails. How would you fight, then? said his antagonist, though I am thinking it would be hard to bring you to the scratch anyhow. I would fight with broadswords, and sink point on the first blood drawn, like a gentleman's. A loud shout of laughter followed the proposal which indeed had rather escaped from poor Robin's swelling heart than had been the dictate of his sober judgment. "'Gentlemen, quotha!' was echoed on all sides with a shout of unextinguishable laughter. "'Very pretty, gentlemen, God wot! Can't get two swords for the gentleman to fight with, Ralph Heskett?' "'No, but I can send to the armory at Carlisle and lend them two forks to be making shift with in the meantime.' "'Tush, man!' said another. 
The bonny Scots come into the world with a blue bonnet on their heads, a dark and pistol at their belt. Best send post, said Mr. Fleece Bumpkin, to the squire of Corby Castle to come and stand second to the gentleman. In the midst of this torrent of general ridicule, the Highlander instinctively gripped beneath the folds of his plaid. But it is better not, he said in his own language, a hundred curses on the swine-eaters who know neither decency nor civility. Make room, the pack of you, he said, advancing to the door. But his former friend interposed his sturdy bulk and opposed his leaving the house, and when Robin Oig attempted to make his way by force, he hit him down on the floor with as much ease as a boy bowls down a nine-pen. A ring! A ring! was now shouted, until the dark rafters and the hams that hung on them trembled again, and the very platters on the bink clattered against each other. Well done, Harry! Give it him home, Harry! Take care of him now! He sees his own blood! Such were the exclamations, while the Highlander, starting from the ground, all his coldness and caution lost in frantic rage, sprung at his antagonist with the fury, the activity, and the vindictive purpose of an incensed tiger-cat. But when could rage encounter science and temper? Robin Oig again went down in the unequal contest, and as the blow was necessarily a severe one, he lay motionless on the floor of the kitchen. The landlady ran to offer some aid, but Mr. Fleecebumpkin would not permit her to approach. "'Let him alone,' he said. "'He'll come to within time.' He has not got half his broth yet. He has got all I mean to give him, though, said his antagonist, whose heart began to relent towards his old associate. I would rather by half give the rest to yourself, Mr. Fleecebumpkin, for you pretend to know a thing or two, and Robin had not art enough even to peel before setting to, but fought with his plaid dangling about him. Stand up, Robin, my man, all friends now, and let me hear the man that will speak a word against you or your country for your sake. Robin Oig was still under the domination of his passion, and eager to renew the onset, but being withheld on the one side by the peacemaking Dame Hesket, and on the other aware that Wakefield no longer meant to renew the combat, his fury sunk into gloomy sullenness. "'Come, come, never grudge so much at it, man,' said the brave-spirited Englishman, with the placability of his country. "'Shake hands, and we will be better friends than ever.' "'Friends!' exclaimed Robin Oig with strong emphasis. Friends, never look to yourself, Harry Wackfelt. Then the curse of Cromwell on your proud Scots stomach, as the man says in the play, and you may do your worst and be damned, for one man can say nothing more to another after a tussle than that he is sorry for it. On these terms the friends parted. Robin Oig drew out in silence a piece of money, threw it on the table, and then left the alehouse. But turning at the door, he shook his hand at Wakefield, pointing with his forefinger upwards, in a manner which might imply either a threat or a caution. He then disappeared in the moonlight. Some words passed after his departure between the bailiff, who piqued himself on being a little of a bully, and Harry Wakefield, who, with generous inconsistency, was now not indisposed to begin a new combat in defence of Robin Oig's reputation although he could not use his daddies like an Englishman, as it did not come natural to him. But Dame Hesket prevented this second quarrel from coming to a head by her peremptory interference. "'There should be no more fighting in her house,' she said. "'There had been too much already. And you, Mr. Wakefield, may live to learn,' she added, "'what it is to make a deadly enemy out of a good friend.' "'Poor Dame! Robin Oig is an honest fellow, and will never keep malice.' Do not trust to that. You do not know the dour temper of the Scots, though you have dealt with them so often. I have a right to know them, my mother being a Scot. And so is well seen on her daughter, said Ralph Hesket. End of section two. International Short Stories, Volume Two. English Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tig Hines. International Short Stories, Volume 2. English Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 3. The Two Drovers, by Sir Walter Scott. Part 3. This nuptial sarcasm gave the discourse another turn. 
Fresh customers entered the taproom or kitchen, and others left it. The conversation turned on the expected markets, and the reports of prices from different parts both of Scotland and England. Treaties were commenced, and Harry Wakefield was lucky enough to find a chap for part of his drove, at a very considerable profit, an event of consequence more than sufficient to blot out all remembrances of the unpleasant scuffle in the earlier part of the day. But there remained one party from whose mind that recollection could not have been wiped away by the possession of every head of cattle betwixt Esk and Eden. This was Robin Oig McCombick. "'That I should have had no weapon,' he said, "'and for the first time in my life. Blighted be the tongue that bids the Highlander part with the dark. The dark, eh? The English blood? My moom's word? When did her word fall to the ground?' The recollection of the fatal prophecy confirmed the deadly intention which instantly sprang up in his mind. Ah! Morrison cannot be many miles behind. And if it were an hundred, what then? His impetuous spirit had now a fixed purpose and motive of action, and he turned the light foot of his country towards the wilds, through which he knew by Mr. Ireby's report that Morrison was advancing. His mind was wholly engrossed by the sense of injury, injury sustained from a friend and by the desire of vengeance on one whom he now accounted his most bitter enemy. The treasured ideas of self-importance and self-opinion, of ideal birth and quality, had become more precious to him, like the hoard to the miser, because he could only enjoy them in secret. But that hoard was pillaged. The idols which he had secretly worshipped had been desecrated and profane. Insulted, abused, and beaten, he was no longer worthy, in his own opinion, of the name he bore or the lineage which he belonged to. Nothing was left to him, nothing but revenge. And as the reflection added a galling spur to every step, he determined it should be as sudden and signal as the offence. When Robin Oig left the door of the alehouse, seven or eight English miles at least lay betwixt Morrison and him. The advance of the former was slow, limited by the sluggish pace of his cattle. The last left behind him stubble-field and hedgerow, crag and dark heath, all glittering with frost-rime in the broad November moonlight at the rate of six miles an hour. And now the distant lowing of Morrison's cattle is heard, and now they are seen creeping like moles in size and slowness of motion on the broad face of the moor, and now he meets them, passes them, and stops their conductor. "'May good betide us,' said the Southlander. Is it you, Robin McCombick, or your wraith? It is Robin Oig McCombick, answered the Highlander, and it is not. But never mind that, but be given me the skeen do. What? Are you far back to the Highlands? The devil, have yon sell off all before the fair? This beats all for quick markets. I have not sold, I am not going north. Maybe I will never go north again. Give me back my dirk, Hugh Morrison or there will be words between us. Indeed, Robin, I'll be better advised before I yield back to you. It is a one chancy weapon in a highland man's hand, and I am thinking you will be about some barns breaking. Tut, tut, let me have my weapon, said Robin Oig impatiently. Holy and fairly, said his well-meaning friend, I'll tell you what will do better than these dorking doings. Ye ken highlander and lowlander and border men are all a man's bairns when you're over the Scots dyke. See the Eskdale clants and fighting Charlie of Lissadell and the Lockerby lads and the four dandies of Lust Ruther and a wean mare grey plaids are coming up behind. And if you are wronged, there is the hand of a manly Morrison. We'll see you right it if Carlyle and Stanwick's baith took up the feud. To tell you the truth, said Robin Oig, desirous of eluding the suspicions of his friend, I have enlisted with a party of the Black Watch and must march off to-morrow morning. Enlisted? Were you mad or drunk? You must buy yourself off. I can lend you twenty notes and twenty to that, if the droves sell. I thank you, thank ye, Huey. But I go with good will to the gate that I am going. So the dirk, the dirk. There it is for you, then, since less would a serve. But think on what I was saying. Ways me, it'll be sair news for the braes of Balquither, that Robin Oig McCombick should a run an ill gate and take it on. Ill news in Balquither indeed, echoed poor Robin. But God speed you, Huey, and send you good markets. Ye winna meet with Robin Oig again, either at Triest or Fair. 
So saying, he shook hastily the hand of his acquaintance, and set out in the direction from which he had advanced, with the spirit of his former pace. "'There's something wrong with the lad,' muttered the Morrison to himself. "'But we will maybe see better into it in the morn's morning.' But long ere the morning dawned, the catastrophe of our tale had taken place. It was two hours after the affray had happened, and it was totally forgotten by almost every one when Robin Oig returned to Heskett's Inn. The place was filled at once by various sorts of men with noises corresponding to their character. There were the grave low sounds of men engaged in busy traffic, with the tough, the song and the riotous jest of those who had nothing to do but to enjoy themselves. Among the last was Harry Wakefield, who, amidst a grinning group of smock-frocks, hobnailed shoes and jolly English physiognomies, was trolling forth the old ditty, What though my name be Roger, who drives the plough and cart, when he was interrupted by a well-known voice saying in a high and stern voice, marked by the sharp highland accent, Harry Wakefield, if you be a man, stand up. What is the matter? What is it? The guests demanded of each other. It's only a damned Scotsman, said Fleece Bumpkin, who was by this time very drunk, whom Harry Wakefield helped to his broth today, who is now come to have his cowled kale het again. Harry Wakefield, repeated the same ominous summons. Stand up, if you be a man. There is something in the tone of deep and concentrated passion which attracts attention and imposes awe, even by the very sound. The guests shrunk back on every side and gazed at the Highlander as he stood in the middle of them, his brows bent and his features rigid with resolution. "'I will stand up with all my heart, Robin, my boy, but it shall be to shake hands with you and drink down all unkindness. It is not the fault of your heart, man, that you don't know how to clench your hands.' By this time he stood opposite to his antagonist, his open and unsuspecting look strangely contrasted with a stern purpose which gleamed wild, dark, and vindictive in the eyes of the Highlander. "'Tis not thy fault, man, that not having the luck to be an Englishman, thou canst not fight more than a schoolgirl." "'I can fight,' answered Robin Oig, sternly but calmly, "'and you shall know it. You, Harry Wackfelt, showed me to-day how the Saxon churls fight. I show you now how the Highland Dunny Wassel fights.' He seconded the word with the action and plunged the dagger, which he suddenly displayed, into the broad chest of the English yeoman with such fatal certainty and force that the hilt made a hollow sound against the breastbone, and the double-edged point split the very heart of his victim. Harry Wakefield fell and expired with a single groan. His assassin next seized the bailiff by the collar and offered the bloody poniard to his throat, whilst dread and surprise rendered the man incapable of defence. It were very just to lay you beside him, he said, but the blood of a base pickthank shall never mix on my father's dirk with that of a brave man. As he spoke, he cast the man from him with so much force that he fell on the floor, while Robin, with his other hand, threw the fatal weapon into the blazing turf fire. There, he said, take me who likes, and let fire cleanse blood if it can. The cause of astonishment still continuing, Robin Oig asked for a peace officer, and a constable having stepped out, he surrendered himself to his custody. "'A bloody night's work you have made of it,' said the constable. "'Your own fault,' said the Highlander. "'Had you kept his hands off me two hours since, he would have been now as well and merry as he was two minutes since.' "'It must be sorely answered,' said the peace officer. "'Never do you mind that. Death pays all debts. It will pay that too.' The horror of the bystanders began now to give way to indignation, and the sight of a favourite companion murdered in the midst of them, the provocation being, in their opinion, so utterly inadequate to the excess of vengeance, might have induced them to kill the perpetrator of the deed even upon the very spot. The constable, however, did his duty on this occasion, and with the assistance of some of the more reasonable persons present, procured horses to guard the prisoner to Carlisle to abide his doom at the next assizes. While the escort was preparing, the prisoner neither expressed the least interest nor attempted the slightest reply. Only before he was carried from the fatal apartment he desired to look at the dead body which, raised from the floor, had been deposited upon the large table 
at the head of which Harry Wakefield had presided but a few minutes before, full of life, vigour, and animation, until the surgeon should examine the mortal wound. The face of the corpse was decently covered with a napkin. To the surprise and horror of the bystanders, which displayed itself in a general, ah, drawn through clenched teeth and half-shut lips, Robin Oig removed the cloth and gazed with a mournful but steady eye on the lifeless visage which had been so lately animated that the smile of good-humoured confidence in his own strength, of conciliation at once and contempt towards his enemy, still curled his lip. While those present expected that the wound, which had so lately flooded the apartment with gore, would send forth fresh streams at the touch of the homicide, Robin Oig replaced the covering with a brief exclamation, he was a pretty man. My story is nearly ended. The unfortunate Highlander stood his trial at Carlisle. I was myself present, and as a young Scottish lawyer, or barrister at least, and reputed a man of some quality, the politeness of the Sheriff of Cumberland offered me a place on the bench. The facts of the case were proved in the manner I have related them and whatever might be at first the prejudice of the audience against a crime so un-English as that of assassination from revenge, yet when the rooted national prejudices of the prisoner had been explained, which made him consider himself as stained with indelible dishonour when subjected to personal violence, when his previous patience, moderation, and endurance were considered, the generosity of the English audience was inclined to regard his crime as the wayward aberration of a false idea of honour rather than as flowing from a heart naturally savage or perverted by habitual vice. I shall never forget the charge of the venerable judge to the jury, although not at that time liable to be much affected either by that which was eloquent or pathetic. "'We have had,' he said, in the previous part of our duty, alluding to some former trials, to discuss crimes which in fair disgust and abhorrence, while they call down the well-merited vengeance of the law. It is now our still more melancholy task to apply its salutary, though severe enactments, to a case of a very singular character, in which the crime, for crime it is, and a deep one, arose less out of the malevolence of the heart than the error of the understanding, less from any idea of committing wrong than from an unhappily perverted notion of that which is right. Here we have two men, highly esteemed, it has been stated, in their rank of life, and attached, it seems, to each other as friends, one of whose lives has been already sacrificed to a punctilio, and the other is about to prove the vengeance of the offended laws, and yet both may claim our commiseration at least, as men acting in ignorance of each other's national prejudices, and unhappily misguided rather than voluntarily erring from the path of right conduct. In the original cause of the misunderstanding we must in justice give the right to the prisoner at the bar. He had acquired possession of the enclosure which was the object of competition by a legal contract with the proprietor, Mr. Irobie, and yet, when accosted with reproaches undeserved in themselves, and galling doubtless to a temper at least sufficiently susceptible of passion, he offered, notwithstanding, to yield up half his acquisition for the sake of peace and good neighbourhood, and his amical proposal was rejected with scorn. Then follows the scene at Mr. Heskett, the publican's, and you will observe how the stranger was treated by the deceased, and, I am sorry to observe, by those around, who seemed to have urged him in a manner which was aggravating in the highest degree. While he asked for peace and composition, and offered submission to a magistrate or to a mutual arbiter, the prisoner was insulted by the whole company, who seem on this occasion to have forgotten the national maxim of fair play, and while attempting to escape from the place in peace, he was intercepted, struck down, and beaten to the effusion of his blood. Gentlemen of the jury, it was with some impatience that I heard my learned brother, who opened the case for the Crown, give an unfavourable turn to the prisoner's conduct on this occasion. He said the prisoner was afraid to encounter his antagonist in fair fight, or to submit to the laws of the ring, and that, therefore, like a cowardly Italian, he had recourse to his fatal stiletto, to murder the man whom he dared not meet in manly encounter. I observed the prisoner shrink from this part of the accusation with the abhorrence natural to a brave man. And as I would wish to make my words impressive when I point his real crime, 
I must secure his opinion of my impartiality by rebutting everything that seems to me a false accusation. There can be no doubt that the prisoner is a man of resolution, too much resolution. I wish to heaven that he had less, or rather that he had had a better education to regulate it. Gentlemen, as to the laws my brother talks of, they may be known in the bull-ring or the bear-garden or the cockpit, but they are not known here or if they should be so far admitted as furnishing a species of proof that no malice was intended in this sort of combat, from which fatal accidents do sometimes arise, it can only be admitted when both parties are in part casu, equally acquainted with, and equally willing to refer themselves to that species of arbitrament. But it will be contended that a man of superior rank and education is to be subjected, or is obliged to subject himself, to this course of brutal strife perhaps in opposition to a younger, stronger, or more skilful opponent? Certainly even the pugilistic cold, if founded upon the fair play of merry old England, as my brother alleges it to be, can contain nothing so preposterous. And, gentlemen of the jury, if the laws support an English gentleman, wearing, we will suppose, his sword in defending himself by force against the violent personal aggression of the nature offered to this prisoner, they will not less protect a foreigner and a stranger involved in the same unpleasing circumstances. If, therefore, gentlemen of the jury, when thus pressed by a vis major, the object of obloquy to a whole company, and of direct violence from one at least, and, as he might reasonably apprehend, from more, the panel had produced the weapon which his countrymen, as we are informed, generally carry about their persons, and the same unhappy circumstance had ensued which you have heard detailed in evidence, I could not in my conscience have asked you to form a verdict of murder. The prisoner's personal defence might indeed, even in that case, have gone more or less beyond the modremen and culpite tutelar spoken of by lawyers, but the punishment incurred would have been that of manslaughter, not of murder. I beg leave to add that I should have thought this milder species of charge was demanded in the case supposed, notwithstanding the statute of James I, Cap. 8 which takes the case of slaughter by stabbing with a short weapon, even without malice prepense, out of the benefit of clergy. For this statute of stabbing, as it is termed, arose out of a temporary cause, and as the real guilt is the same, whether the slaughter be committed by the dagger or by sword or pistol, the benignity of the modern law places them all on the same, or nearly the same, footing. But, gentlemen of the jury, the pinch of the case lies in the interval of two hours interposed betwixt the reception of the injury and the fatal retaliation. In the heat of a fray and shod melee, law, compassionating the infirmities of humanity, makes allowance for the passions which rule such a stormy moment, for the sense of present pain, for the apprehension of further injury, for the difficulty of ascertaining with due accuracy the precise degree of violence which is necessary to protect the person of the individual, without annoying or injuring the assailant more than is absolutely necessary. But the time necessary to walk twelve miles, however speedily performed, was an interval sufficient for the prisoner to have recollected himself, and the violence with which he carried his purpose into effect, with so many circumstances of deliberate determination, could neither be induced by the passion of anger nor that of fear. It was the purpose and the act of predetermined revenge, for which law neither can, will, nor ought to have any sympathy or allowance. It is true, we may repeat to ourselves, in alleviation of this poor man's unhappy action, that his case is a very peculiar one. The country which he inhabits was, in the days of many now alive, inaccessible to the laws not only of England, which have not even yet penetrated thither, but to those to which our neighbours of Scotland are subjected and which must be supposed to be, and no doubt actually are, founded upon the general principles of justice and equity which pervade every civilised country. Amongst their mountains, as among the North American Indians, the various tribes were wont to make war upon each other, so that each man was obliged to go armed for his own protection. These men, from the ideas which they entertained of their own descent and of their own consequence, regarded themselves as so many cavaliers or men-at-arms rather than as the peasantry of a peaceful country. Those laws of the ring, as my brother terms them, were unknown to a race of warlike mountaineers. That decision of quarrels by no other weapons than those which nature has given every man 
must to them have seemed as vulgar and preposterous as to the noblesse of France. Revenge, on the other hand, must have been as familiar to their habits of society as to those of the Cherokees or Mohawks. It is indeed, as described by Bacon, at bottom a kind of wild, untutored justice, for the fear of retaliation must withhold the hands of the oppressor where there is no regular law to check daring violence. But although this may be granted, and though we may allow that, such having been the case of the highlands in the days of the prisoner's fathers, many of the opinions and sentiments must still continue to influence the present generation, it cannot and ought not, even in this most painful case, to alter the administration of the law, either in your hands, gentlemen of the jury, or in mine. The first object of civilization is to place the general protection of the law, equally administered, in the room of that wild justice which every man cut and carved for himself, according to the length of his sword and the strength of his arm. The law says to the subjects, with a voice only inferior to that of the deity, Vengeance is mine. The instant that there is time for passion to cool and reason to interpose, an injured party must become aware that the law assumes the exclusive cognizance of the right and wrong betwixt the parties, and opposes her inviolable buckler to every attempt of the private party to right himself. I repeat that this unhappy man ought personally to be the object rather of our pity than our abhorrence, for he failed in his ignorance and from mistaken notions of honour. But his crime is none the less that of murder, gentlemen, and in your high and important office it is your duty so to find. Englishmen have their angry passions as well as Scots, and should this man's actions remain unpunished, you may unsheath, under various pretences, a thousand daggers betwixt the land's end and the Orkneys. The venerable judge thus ended what, to judge by his apparent emotion, and by the tears which filled his eyes, was really a painful task. The jury, according to his instructions, brought in a verdict of guilty, and Robin Oig McCombick, alias MacGregor, was sentenced to death, and left for execution which took place accordingly. He met his fate with great firmness, and acknowledged the justice of his sentence but he repelled indignantly the observations of those who accused him of attacking an unarmed man. "'I give a life for the life I took,' he said, "'and what can I do more?' End of section 3「Chapter 4 of International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 2. English Stories. Edited by William Patton. Chapter 4. Mr. Deuce Ace. Diamond Cut Diamond. By William Thackeray. The name of my next master was, if possible, still more elegant and euphonious than that of my first. I now found myself body-servant to the Honourable Algernon Percy Deuceace, youngest and fifth son of the Earl of Crabs. Algernon was a barrister, that is, he lived in Pump Court, Temple, a vulgar neighbourhood which perhaps my readers don't know. Suffice to say, it's on the confines of the city, and the chosen abode of the lawyers of this metropolis. When I say that Mr. Deuceace was a barrister, I don't mean that he went sessions, or surcoats as they call them, but simply that he kept chambers, lived in pump court, and looked out for a commissionership, or a revisionship, or any other place that the Whig government could give him. His father was a Whig peer, as the laundress told me and had been a Tory peer. The fact is, his lordship was so poor that he would be anything or nothing to get provisions for his sons, and an income for himself. I fancy that he allowed Algernon two hundred a year, and it would have been a very comfortable maintenance, only he never paid him. However, the young gentleman was a gentleman, and no mistake. He got his allowance of nothing a year, and spent it in the most honourable and fashionable manner. 
he kept a cab, he went to Holmax and Crockford's, he moved in the most exquisite circles, and troubled the law books very little, I can tell you. Those fashionable gents have ways of getting money which common people don't understand. Though he only had a third floor in Pump Court, he lived as if he had the wealth of Croesus. The ten-pound notes flew about as common as haypence. Claret and champagne was at his house as vulgar as gin, and very glad I was, to be sure, to be a valet to a Zion of the nobility. Deuce Ace had in his sitting room a large picture on a sheet of paper. The names of his family was wrote on it. It was wrote in the shape of a tree, a growing out of a man in armor's stomach, and the names were on little plates among the boughs. The picture said that the Deuceaces came into England in the year 1066, along with William Conquerwins. My master called it his pedigree. I do believe it was because he had this picture, and because he was the Honorable Deuceace, that he managed to live as he did. If he had been a common man, you'd have said that he was no better than a swindler. It's only rank and birth that can warrant such singularities as my master showed. For it's no use disguising it. The Honorable Algernon was a gambler. For a man of vulgar family, it's the worst trade that can be. For a man of common feelings of honesty, this profession is quite impossible. But for a real thoroughbred gentleman, it's the easiest and most profitable line he can take. It may perhaps appear curious that such a fashionable man should live in the temple, but it must be recollected that it's not only lawyers who live in what's called the inns of court. Many bachelors who have nothing to do with law have here their lodgings, and many sham barristers who never put on a wig and gown twice in their lives keep apartments in the temple instead of Bond Street, Piccadilly, or other fashionable places. For instance, on our staircase, so these houses are called, there was eight sets of chamberses, and only three lawyers. These was bottom floor, Scrooson, Hewson, and Jewson attorneys. First floor, Mr. Sergeant Flabber. Opposite, Mr. Counselor Bruffy. And second pair, Mr. Hagerstony, an Irish counselor practicing at the Old Bailey, and likewise what they call reporter to the Morning Post newspaper. Opposite him was wrote, Mr. Richard Blewett, and on the third floor, with my master, lived one Mr. Dawkins. This young fellow was a newcomer into the temple, and unlucky it was for him, too. He'd better have never been born, for it's my firm opinion that the temple ruined him, that is, with the help of my master and Mr. Dick Blewett, as you shall hear. Mr. Dawkins, as I was gave to understand by his young man, had just left the University of Oxford, and had a pretty little form of his own, six thousand pound or so, in the stocks. He was just of age, an orphan who had lost his father and mother, and having distinguished himself at college, where he gained several prizes, was come to town to push his form and study the barrister's business. Not being of a very high family himself, Indeed, I have heard say his father was a cheesemonger or something of that low sort. Dawkins was glad to find his old Oxford friend, Mr. Blewett, younger son to rich Squire Blewett of Leicestershire, and to take rooms so near him. Now, though there was a considerable intimacy between me and Mr. Blewett's gentleman, there was scarcely any betwixt our masters, mine being too much of the aristocracy to associate with one of Mr. Blewett's sort. Blewett was what they call a betting man. He went regular to Tattlesell's, kept a pony, wore a white hat, a bluebeard's eye handkerchief, and a cutaway coat. In his manners he was the very contrary of my master, who was a slim, elegant man as ever I see. He had very white hands, rather a sallow face with sharp, dark eyes, and small whiskers neatly trimmed, and as black as Warren's jet. He spoke very low and soft. He seemed to be watching the person with whom he was in conversation, and always flattered everybody. As for Blewett, he was quite another sort. He was always swearing, singing, and slapping people on the back, as hearty and as familiar as possible. He seemed a merry, careless, honest creature, 
whom one would trust with life and soul. So thought Dawkins, at least, who, though a quiet young man, fond of his books, novels, Byron's poems, flute-playing, and such scientific amusements, grew hand in glove with honest Dick Blewett, and soon after with my master, the Honourable Algernon. Poor Dahl! He thought he was making good connections and real friends. He had fallen in with a couple of the most atrocious swindlers that ever lived. Before Mr. Dawkins's arrival in our house, Mr. Deuceace had barely condescended to speak to Mr. Blewett. It was only about a month after that circumstance that my master, all of a sudden, grew very friendly with him. The reason was pretty clear. Deuce Ace wanted him. Dawkins had not been an hour in master's company before he knew that he had a pigeon to pluck. Blewett knew this, too, and being very fond of pigeon, intended to keep this one entirely to himself. It was amusing to see the Honorable Algernon maneuvering to get this poor bird out of Blewett's claws, who thought he had it safe. In fact, he'd brought Dawkins to these chambers for that very purpose, thinking to have him under his eye and strip him at leisure. My master very soon found out what was Mr. Blewett's game. Gamblers know gamblers, if not by instinct, at least by reputation and though Mr. Blewett moved in a much lower sphere than Mr. Deuceace, they knew each other's dealings and characters perfectly well. "'Charles, you scoundrel,' says Deuceace to me one day. He always spoke in that kind way. "'Who is this person who has taken the opposite chambers and plays the flute so industriously?' "'It's Mr. Dawkins, a rich young gentleman from Oxford, and a great friend of Mr. Blewett's, sir,' says I. They seemed to live in each other's rooms. Master said nothing, but he grinned. My, eye, he did grin. Not the foul fiend himself could sneer more satanically. I knew what he meant. Imprimish. A man who plays the flute is a simpleton. Secondly, Mr. Blewett is a rascal. Third mo, when a rascal and a simpleton is always together, and when the simpleton is rich, one knows pretty well what will come of it. I was but a lad in them days, but I knew what was what as well as my master. It's not gentlemen only that's up to snuff. Law bless us, there was four of us on this staircase, four as nice young men as you ever see. Mr. Bruffy's young man, Mr. Dawkins's, Mr. Blewett's, and me and we knew what our masters was about as well as they did themselves. For instance, I can say this for myself, there wasn't a paper in Deuce Ace's desk or drawer, not a bill, a note, or memorandum, which I hadn't read as well as he. With Blewett's it was the same. Me and his young man used to read them all. There wasn't a bottle of wine that we didn't get a glass, nor a pound of sugar that we didn't have some lumps of it. We had keys to all the cupboards. We peeped into all the letters that came and went. We pored over all the bill files. We'd the best pickings out of the dinners, the livers of the fowls, the forcemeat balls out of the soup, the eggs from the salad. As for the coals and candles, we left them to the laundresses. You may call this robbery. Nonsense. It's only our right. A servant's perquisites is as sacred as the laws of England. Well, the long and short of it is this. Richard Blewett, Esquire, was situated as follows. He'd an income of three hundred a year from his father. Out of this he had to pay one hundred and ninety for money borrowed by him at college, seventy for chambers, seventy more for his horse, eighty for his servant on board wages, and about three hundred and fifty for a separate establishment in the Regency Park. Besides this, his pocket money, say a hundred, his eaten, drinking, and wine merchant's bill, about two hundred more. So that you see, he laid by a pretty handsome sum at the end of the year. My master was different, and being a more fashionable man than Mr. B, in course he owed a deal more money. There was first a count contrary at Crockford's, three thousand seven hundred and eleven pounds bills of exchange and IOUs, but he didn't pay these in most cases. 
4,963 pounds. 21 tailors' bills in all, 1,306 pounds, 11 shillings and 9 pence. 3 horse dealers due, 402 pounds. 2 coach builder, 506 pounds. Bills contracted at Cambridge, 2,193 pounds, 6 shillings and 8 pence. Sundries, 987 pounds, 6 shillings. Total, 14,069 pounds, 8 shillings, and 5 pence. I give this as a curiosity. People don't know how, in many cases, fashionable life is carried on, and to know even what a real gentleman owes is something instructive and agreeable. But to my tale. The very day after my master had made the inquiries concerning Mr. Dawkins, which I have mentioned already, he met Mr. Blewett on the stairs and beautiful it was to see how this gentleman, who had before been almost cut by my master, was now received by him. One of the sweetest smiles I ever saw was now visible on Mr. Deuceace's countenance. He held out his hand, covered with a white kid glove, and said, in the most friendly tone of voice possible, "'What, Mr. Blewett? It's an age since we met. What a shame that such near neighbors should see each other so seldom!' Mr. Blewett, who was standing at his door in a pea-green dressing-gown, smoking a cigar, and singing a hunting chorus, looked surprised, flattered, and then suspicious. "'Why, yes,' says he, "'it is, Mr. Deuceace, a long time. Not, I think, since we dined at Sir George Hockey's. By the way, what an evening that was, hey, Mr. Blewett? What wine, what capital songs! I recollect your May Day in the morning.' cuss me the best comic song i ever heard i was speaking to the duke of doncaster about it only yesterday you know the duke i think mr blewett said quite surly no i don't not know him cries the master why hang it blewett he knows you as every sporting man in england does i should think why man your good things are in everybody's mouth at newmarket and so master went on chaffing mr blewett that gentleman at first answered him quite short and angry, but after a little more flummery he grew as pleased as possible, took in all Deuce Ace's flattery, and believed all his lies. At last the door shut, and they both went into Mr. Blewett's chambers together. Of course I can't say what passed there, but in an hour Master came up to his own room as yeller as mustard, and smelling sadly of tobacco smoke. I never seen any gentleman more than he was. He'd been smoking cigars along with Blewett. I said nothing, in course, though I'd often heard him express his horror of Bacca, and knew very well he would as soon swallow poison as smoke. But he wasn't a chap to do a thing without a reason. If he'd been smoking, I warrant he had smoked to some purpose. I didn't hear the conversation between them, but Mr. Blewett's man did. It was... Well, Mr. Blewett, what capital cigars! Have you one for a friend to smoke? The old fox, it wasn't only the cigars he was smoking. Walk in, says Mr. Blewett. And then they began a chaffing together. Master very anxious about the young gentleman who had come to live in our chambers, Mr. Dawkins, and always coming back to that subject, saying that people on the same staircase ought to be friendly. How glad he'd be, for his part, to know Mr. Dick Blewett and any friend of his, and so on. Mr. Dick, however, seemed quite aware of the trap laid for him. "'I really don't know this Dawkins,' says he. "'He's a cheesemonger's son, I hear. And though I've exchanged visits with him, I don't intend to continue the acquaintance, not wishing to associate with that kind of people.' So they went on, Master Fishin' and Mr. Blewett not wishing to take the hook at no price. "'Confound the vulgar thief!' muttered my master, as he was laying on his sofa, after being so very ill. "'I've poisoned myself with his infernal tobacco, and he has foiled me. The cursed swindling boar! He thinks he'll ruin this poor cheesemonger, does he? I'll step in and warn him.' I thought I should bust a laughin' when he talked in this style. I knew very well what his warning meant. Lock in the stable door but stealing the horse first. 
Next day his stratagem for becoming acquainted with Mr. Dawkins he executed, and very pretty it was. Besides poetry and the flute, Mr. Dawkins, I must tell you, had some other partialities. Namely, he was very fond of good eating and drinking. After dawdling over his music and books all day, this young gentleman used to sally out of evenings, dine sumptuously at a tavern, drinking all sorts of wine along with his friend Mr. Blewett. He was a quiet young fellow enough at first, but it was Mr. B who, for his own purposes no doubt, had got him into this kind of life. Well, I needn't say that he who eats a fine dinner and drinks too much overnight wants a bottle of soda water and a grill, perhaps, in the morning. Such was Mr. Dawkins's case, and regular almost as twelve o'clock came, the waiter from Mr. Dick's coffee-house was to be seen on our staircase, bringing up Mr. D.'s hot breakfast. No man would have thought there was anything in such a trifling circumstance. Master did, though, and pounced upon it like a cock on a barleycorn. He sent me out to Mr. Morell's in Piccadilly for what's called a Strasbourg pie, in French a patty de foie gras. He takes a card and nails it on the outside case. Patty de foie gras come generally in a round wooden box, like a drum. And what do you think he writes on it? Why, as follows. Quote, for the Honorable Algernon Percy Deuceace, etc., 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 with Prince Talleyrand's compliments. End quote. Prince Talleyrand's compliments, indeed. I laugh when I think of it still, the old serpent. He was a serpent, that Deuceace, and no mistake. Well, by a most extraordinary piece of ill luck, the next day, punctually as Mr. Dawkins's breakfast was coming up the stairs, Mr. Algernon Percy Deuceace was going down. He was as gay as a lark, humming an opera tune, and twisting round his head his heavy gold-headed cane. Down he went very fast, and by a most unlucky accident struck his cane against the waiter's tray, and away went Mr. Dawkins's grill, cayenne, ketchup, soda water, and all. I can't think how my master should have chose such an exact time. To be sure, his window looked upon the court, and he could see every one who came into our door. As soon as the accident had took place, Master was in such a rage as to be sure no man ever was in before. He swore at the waiter in the most dreadful way. He threatened him with his stick, and it was only when he see that the waiter was rather a bigger man than himself that he was in the least pacified. He returned to his own chambers and John, the waiter, went off for more grill to Dixie's coffee-house. "'This is a most unlucky accident, to be sure, Charles,' says Master to me, after a few minutes' pause, during which he had been and wrote a note, put it in an envelope, and sealed it with his big seal of arms. "'But stay, a thought strikes me. Take this note to Mr. Dawkins, and that pie you brought yesterday. And hark ye, you scoundrel, if you say where you got it, I will break every bone in your skin. These kind of promises were among the few which I knew him to keep, and as I loved both my skin and my bones, I carried the note, and of course said nothing. Waiting in Mr. Dawkins's chambers for a few minutes, I returned to my master with an answer. I may as well give both of these documents, of which I happen to have taken copies. 1. The Honorable A. P. Deuceace to T. S. Dawkins, Esquire, Temple, Tuesday. Mr. Deuceace presents his compliments to Mr. Dawkins, and begs at the same time to offer his most sincere apologies and regrets for the accident which has just taken place. May Mr. Deuceace be allowed to take a neighbor's privilege, and to remedy the evil he has occasioned to the best of his power. If Mr. Dawkins will do him the favor to partake of the contents of the accompanying case, from Strasbourg direct, and the gift of a friend, on whose taste as a gourmand Mr. Dawkins may rely, perhaps he will find that it is not a bad substitute for the pâté which Mr. Deuceace's awkwardness destroyed. It will also, Mr. Deuceace is sure, be no small gratification to the original donor of the plat when he learns that it has fallen into the hands of so celebrated a bon vivant as Mr. Dawkins. 
T. S. Dawkins, Esquire, etc., etc., etc. 2. From T. S. Dawkins, Esquire, to the Honorable A. P. Deuceace. Mr. Thomas Smith Dawkins presents his grateful compliments to the Honorable Mr. Deuceace, and accepts with the greatest pleasure Mr. Deuceace's generous proffer. It would be one of the happiest moments of Mr. Smith Dawkins' life if the Honorable Mr. Deuceace would extend his generosity still further and condescend to partake of the repast which his munificent politeness has furnished. Temple, Tuesday. Many and many a time, I say, have I grinned over these letters, which I had wrote from the original by Mr. Bruffy's copying clerk. Deuceace's flam about Prince Talleyram was perfectly successful. I saw young Dawkins blush with delight as he read the note, and tore up four or five sheets before he composed the answer to it, which was as you read above, and wrote in a hand quite trembling with pleasure. If you could have but seen the look of triumph in Deuceace's wicked black eyes when he read the note. I never see a demon yet, but I can fancy one a-holding a writhing soul on his pitchfork and smiling like Deuceace. He dressed himself in his very best clothes, and in he went, after sending me over to say that he would accept with pleasure Mr. Dawkins' invite. The pie was cut up, and a most friendly conversation begun betwixt the two gentlemen. Deuceace was quite captivating. He spoke to Mr. Dawkins in the most respectful and flattering manner, agreed in everything he said, praised his taste, his furniture, his coat, his classic knowledge, and his playing on the flute. You'd have thought to hear him that such a polygon of excellence as Mr. Dawkins did not breathe, that such a modest, sincere, honorable gentleman as Deuceace was to be seen nowhere except in Pump Court. Poor Daw was completely taken in. My master said he'd introduce him to the Duke of Doncaster, and heaven knows how many knobs more, till Dawkins was quite intoxicated with pleasure. I know as a fact, and it pretty well shows the young gentleman's character, that he went that very day and ordered two new coats, on purpose to be introduced to the Lord's in. But the best joke of all was at last. Singing, swaggering, and swearing, up the stairs came Mr. Dick Blewett. He flung open Mr. Dawkins' door, shouting out, Daw, my old buck, how are you? When all of a sudden he sees Mr. Deuceace, his jaw dropped, he turned chalky white, and then burning red, and looked as if a straw would knock him down. "'My dear Mr. Blewett,' says my master, smiling and offering his hand, "'how glad I am to see you. Mr. Dawkins and I were just talking about your pony. Pray sit down.' Blewett did, and now was the question who should sit the other out. But, law bless you, Mr. Blewett was no match for my master. All the time he was fidgety, silent, and sulky. On the contrary, Master was charming. I never heard such a flow of conversation or so many witticisms as he uttered. At last, completely beat, Mr. Blewett took his leave. That instant Master followed him, and passing his arm through that of Mr. Dick, led him into our chambers and began talking to him in the most affable and affectionate manner. But Dick was too angry to listen. At last, when Master was telling him some long story about the Duke of Doncaster, Blewett bust out, A plague on the Duke of Doncaster! Come, come, Mr. Deuceace! Don't you be running your rigs upon me. I ain't the man to be bamboozled by long-winded stories about dukes and duchesses. You think I don't know you? Every man knows you and your line of country. Yes, you're after young Dawkins there, and think to pluck him. But you shan't. No, by blank, you shan't. The reader must recollect that the oaths which interspersed Mr. B.'s conversation I have left out. Well, after he'd fired a volley of them, Mr. Ducey spoke as cool and slow as possible. Hark ye, Blewett. I know you to be one of the most infernal thieves and scoundrels unhung. If you attempt to hector with me, I will cane you. If you want more, I'll shoot you. If you meddle between me and Dawkins, I'll do both. I know your whole life, you miserable swindler and coward. I know you have already won two hundred pounds of this lad, and want all. 
I will have half, or you never shall have a penny. It's quite true that Master knew things, but how was the wonder? I couldn't see Mr. B.'s face during this dialogue, being on the wrong side of the door, but there was a considerable pause after those compliments had passed between the two gentlemen, one walking up and down the room, t'other, angry and stupid, sitting down and stamping with his foot. Now listen to this, Mr. Blewett, continues Master at last. If you're quiet, you shall have half this fellow's money, but venture to win a shilling from him in my absence or without my consent, and you do it at your peril. Well, well, Mr. Deuces, cries Dick, it's very hard, and I must say not fair. The game was of my starting, and you've no right to interfere with my friend. Mr. Blewett, you are a fool. You professed yesterday not to know this man, and I was obliged to find him out for myself. I should like to know by what law of honor I'm bound to give him up to you. It was charming to hear this pair of rascals talking about honor. I declare I could have found it in my heart to warn young Dawkins of the precious way in which these chaps were going to serve him. But if they didn't know what honor was, I did. And never, never did I tell tales about my masters when in their service. Out in course, the obligation is no longer binding. Well, the next day there was a grand dinner at our chambers. White soup, turbot, and lobster sauce, saddle of scotch mutton, grouse, and maroni, wine, champagne, hock, madeira, a bottle of port, and ever so many of claret. The company present was three, namely the Honorable A. P. Deuceace, R. Blewett, and Mr. Dawkins, Esquires. My eye, how we gentlemen in the kitchen did enjoy it. Mr. Blewite's man ate so much grouse when it was brought out of the parlor that I really thought he would be sick. Mr. Dawkins's gentleman, who was only about thirteen years of age, grew so ill with maroni and plum pudding, so to be obliged to take several of Mr. D.'s pills, which one half killed him. But this is all promiscuous. I ain't talking of the servants now, but the masters. Would you believe it? After dinner, and perhaps eight bottles of wine between the three, the gentleman sat down to Artie. It's a game where only two plays, and where, in course, when there's only three, one looks on. First they played crown points, and a pound the bet. At this game they were wonderful equal, and about supper-time, when grilled ham, more champagne, deviled biscuits, and other things was brought in, the play stood thus. Mr. Dawkins had won two pounds, Mr. Blewett thirty shillings, the Honorable Mr. Deuceace having lost three pounds ten shillings. After the doula and the champagne, the play was a little higher. Now it was pound points, and five pound the bet. I thought to be sure, after hearing the compliments between Mr. Blewett and Master in the morning, that now poor Dawkins' time was come. Not so. Dawkins won always. Mr. B. betting on his play, and giving him the very best of advice. At the end of the evening, which was about five o'clock the next morning, they stopped. Master was counting up the score on a card. Blewett says he, I've been unlucky. I owe you, let me see, yes, five and forty pounds. Five and forty, says Blewett, and no mistake. I will give you a check, says the honorable gentleman. Oh, don't mention it, my dear sir. But Master got a great sheet of paper and drew him a check on Messrs. Pump, Algit, and Company, his bankers. Now, says Master, I've got to settle with you, my dear Mr. Dawkins. If you had backed your luck, I should have owed you a very handsome sum of money. Voyons. Thirteen points at a pound. It is easy to calculate. And drawing out his purse, he clinked over the table thirteen golden sovereigns which shone till they made my eyes wink. So did poor Dawkins's, as he put out his hand, all trembling, and drew them in. Let me say, added Master, let me say, and I've had some little experience, that you are the very best écarté player with whom I ever sat down. Dawkins's eyes glistened as he put the money up, and said, Law, deuce ace, you flatter me. Flatter him? I should think he did. It was the very thing which Master meant. But mind you, Dawkins, continued he, 
I must have my revenge, for I'm ruined, positively ruined by your luck. Well, well, says Mr. Thomas Smith Dawkins, as pleased as if he had gained a million. Shall it be tomorrow? Blewett, what say you? Mr. Blewett agreed in course. My master, after a little demurring, consented to. We'll meet, says he, at your chambers. But mind, my dear fellow, not too much wine. I can't stand it at any time, especially when I have to play a carte with you. Poor Dawkins left our rooms as happy as a prince. Here, Charles, says he, and flung me a sovereign. Poor fellow, poor fellow. I know what was a-coming, but the best of it was that these thirteen sovereigns which Dawkins won, Master had borrowed them from Mr. Blewett. I brought em with seven more from that young gentleman's chambers that very morning, for since his interview with Master, Blewett had nothing to refuse him. Well, shall I continue the tale? If Mr. Dawkins had been the least bit wiser, it would have taken him six months before he lost his money. As it was, he was such a confounded ninny that it took him a very short time to part with it. Next day, it was Thursday, and Master's acquaintance with Mr. Dawkins had only commenced on Tuesday. Mr. Dawkins, as I said, gave his party. Dinner at seven. Mr. Blewett and the two Mr. D's as before. Play begins at eleven. This time I knew the business was pretty serious, for we servants was packed off to bed at two o'clock. On Friday I went to Chambers, no master. He came in for five minutes at about twelve, made a little toilet, ordered more doulas and soda water, and back again he went to Mr. Dawkins's. They had dinner there at seven again, but nobody seemed to eat, for all the victuals came out to us gentlemen. They had in more wine, though, and must have drunk at least two dozen in the thirty-six hours. At ten o'clock, however, on Friday night, back my master came to his chambers. I saw him as I never saw him before, namely, regular drunk. He staggered about the room, he danced, he hiccuped, he swore, he flung me a heap of silver, and finally he sunk down exhausted on his bed. I pulling off his boots and clothes and making him comfortable. When I had removed his garments, I did what it's the duty of every servant to do. I emptied his pockets and looked at his pocketbook and all his letters. A number of accidents have been prevented that way. I found there, among a heap of things, the following pretty document. I owe you forty-seven hundred pounds. Thomas Smith Dawkins. Friday. 16th January. There was another bit of paper of the same kind. I owe you four hundred pounds. Richard Blewett. But this, in course, meant nothing. Next morning at nine, Master was up, and as sober as a judge. He dressed and was off to Mr. Dawkins. At ten he ordered a cab, and the two gentlemen went together. Where shall he drive, sir? says I. Oh, tell him to drive to the bank. Poor Dawkins, his eyes red with remorse and sleepless drunkenness, gave a shudder and a sob as he sunk back in the vehicle, and they drove on. That day he sold out every halfpenny he was worth except five hundred pounds. About twelve Master had returned, and Mr. Dick Blewett came striding up the stairs with a solemn and important air. Is your master at home? says he. Yes, sir, says I, and in he walks. I, in course, with my ear to the keyhole, listening with all my might. Well, says Blewett, we made a pretty good night of it, Mr. Deuces. You settled, I see, with Dawkins. Settled, says master. Oh, yes, yes, I've settled with him. Four thousand seven hundred, I think. About that, yes. That makes my share. Let me see. Two thousand three hundred and fifty, which I'll thank you to fork out. Upon my word, why, Mr. Blewett, says my master, I don't really understand what you mean. You don't know what I mean, says Blewett, in an accent such as I never before heard. You don't know what I mean. Did you not promise me that we were to go shares? Didn't I lend you twenty sovereigns the other night to pay our losings to Dawkins? 
didn't you swear on your honor as a gentleman to give me half of all that might be won in this affair agreed sir says deuce ace agreed well sir and now what have you to say why that i don't intend to keep my promise you infernal fool and ninny do you suppose i was laboring for you do you fancy i was going to the expense of giving a dinner to that jackass yonder that you should profit by it get away sir leave the room sir or stop here i will give you the four hundred pounds your own note of hand sir for that sum if you will consent to forget all that has passed between us and that you have never known mr algernon deuce ace i've seen people angry before now but never any like blewett he stormed groaned bellowed swore at last he fairly began blubbering now cussing and gnashing his teeth now praying dear mr deuces to grant him mercy at last master flung open the door heaven bless us it's well i didn't tumble head over heels into the room and said charles show the gentleman downstairs my master looked at him quite steady blewett slunk down as miserable as any man i ever see as for dawkins heaven knows where he was charles says my master to me about an hour afterwards i am going to paris you may come too if you please end of chapter four International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 5. The Brothers. A Tale by Edward Bulwer Lytton. Part 1. You must imagine, then, dear Gertrude, said Trevelyan, a beautiful summer day, and by the same faculty that none possesses so richly as yourself, for it is you who can kindle something of that divine spark even in me. You must rebuild those shattered towers in the pomp of old, raise the gallery and the hall, man the battlements with waters and give the proud banners of ancestral chivalry to wave upon the walls but above sloping half down the rock you must fancy the hanging gardens of liebenstein fragrant with flowers and basking in the noonday sun on the greenest turf underneath an oak there sat three persons in the bloom of youth two of the three were brothers the third was an orphan girl whom the lord of the opposite tower of sternfels had bequeathed to the protection of his brother the chief of liebenstein the castle itself and the domain that belonged to it passed away from the female line and became the heritage of otho the orphan's cousin and the younger of the two brothers now seated on the turf and oh said the elder whose name was warbeck you've twined a chaplet for my brother have you not dearest leoline a simple flower for me the beautiful orphan for beautiful she was gertrude as the heroine of the tale you bid me tell ought to be should she not have to the dreams of my fancy your lustrous hair and your sweet smile and your eyes of that blue that are never never silent ah pardon me that in a former tale i denied the heroine the beauty of your face and remember that to atone for it i endowed her with the beauty of your mind the beautiful orphan blushed to her temples and culling from the flowers in her lap the freshest of the roses began weaving them into a wreath for warbeck it would be better said the gay otho to make my sober brother a chaplet of the rue and cyprus the rose is much too bright a flower for so serious a knight leoline held up her hand reprovingly let him laugh dearest cousin said warbeck gazing passionately on her changing cheek and thou leoline believe that the silent stream runs the deepest at this moment they heard the voice of the old chief their father calling aloud for leoline for ever when he returned from the chase he wanted her gentle presence 
and the hall was solitary to him if the light sound of her step and the music of her voice were not heard in welcome leoline hastened to her guardian and the brothers were left alone nothing could be more dissimilar than the features and the respective characters of otho and warbeck otho's countenance was flushed with the brown hues of health his eyes were of the brightest hazel his dark hair wreathed in short curls round his open and fearless brow the jest ever echoed on his lips and his step was bounding as the foot of the hunter of the alps bold and light was his spirit if at times he betrayed the haughty insolence of youth he felt generously and though not ever ready to confess sorrow for a fault he was at least ready to brave peril for a friend but warbeck's frame though of equal strength was more slender in its proportions than that of his brother the fair long hair that characterized his northern race hung on either side of a countenance calm and pale and deeply impressed with thought even to sadness his features more majestic and regular than otho's rarely varied in their expression more resolute even than otho he was less impetuous more impassioned and he was also less capricious the brothers remained silent after leoline had left them otho carelessly braced on his sword that he had lain aside on the grass but warbeck gathered up the flowers that had been touched by the soft hand of leoline and placed them in his bosom the action disturbed otho he bit his lip and changed color at length he said with a forced laugh it must be confessed brother that you carry your affection for our fair cousin to a degree that even relationship seems scarcely to warrant it is true said warbeck calmly i love her with a love surpassing that of blood how said otho fiercely do you dare think of leoline as a bride dare repeated warbeck turning yet paler than his wonted hue yes i have said the word no warbeck that i too love leoline i too claim her as my bride and never while i can wield a sword never while i wear the spurs of knighthood will i render my claim to a living rival even he added sinking his voice though that rival be my brother warbeck answered not his very soul seemed stunned he gazed long and wistfully on his brother and then turning his face away ascended the rock without uttering a single word this silence startled otho accustomed to vent every emotion of his own he could not comprehend the forbearance of his brother he knew his high and brave nature too well to imagine that it arose from fear might it not be contempt or might he not at this moment intend to seek their father and the first to proclaim his love for the orphan advance also the privilege of the elder born as these suspicions flashed across him the haughty otho strode to his brother's side and laying his hand on his arm said whither goes thou and dost thou consent to surrender leoline does she love thee otho answered warbeck breaking silence at last and his voice spoke so deep in anguish that it arrested the passions of otho even at their height it is thou who art now silent continued warbeck speak doth she love thee and has her lip confessed it i have believed that she loved me faltered otho but she is of maiden bearing and her lip at least has never told it enough said warbeck release your hold stay said otho his suspicions returning stay yet one word dost thou seek my father he ever honored thee more than me wilt thou own to him thy love and insist on thy right of birth by my soul and my hope of heaven do it and one of us two must fall poor boy answered warbeck bitterly how little thou canst read the heart of one who loves truly thinkest thou i would wed her if she loved thee thinkest that i could even to be blessed myself give her one moment's pain out on the thought away then wilt not thou seek our father said otho abashed our father has our father the keeping of leoline's affection answered warbeck and shaking off his brother's grasp he sought the way to the castle as he entered the hall he heard the voice of leoline 
she was singing to the old chief one of the simple ballads of the time that the warrior and the hunter loved to hear he paused lest he should break the spell a spell stronger than a sorcerer's to him and gazing upon leoline's beautiful form his heart sank within him his brother and himself had each that day as they sat in the gardens given her a flower his flower was the fresher and the rarer his he saw not but she wore his brother's in her bosom the chief lulled by the music and wearied with the toils of the chase sank into sleep as the song ended and warbeck coming forward motioned to leoline to follow him he passed into a retired and solitary walk and when they were a little distance from the castle warbeck turned round and taking leoline's hand gently said let us rest here for one moment dearest cousin i have much on my heart to say to thee and what is there answered leoline as they sat on a mossy bank with the broad rhine glancing below what is there that my kind warbeck would ask of me ah would it might be some favor something in poor leoline's power to grant for ever from my birth you have been to me most tender most kind yon i have often heard them say taught my first steps to walk you formed my infant lips into language and in after years when my wild cousin was far away in the forests at the chase you would brave his gay jest and remain at home lest leoline should be weary in the solitude ah would i could repay you warbeck turned away his cheek his heart was very full and it was some moments before he summoned courage to reply my fair cousin said he those were happy days but they were the days of childhood new cares and new thoughts have now come on us but i am still thy friend leoline and still thou wilt confide in me thy young sorrows and thy young hopes as thou ever didst wilt thou not leoline canst thou ask me said leoline and warbeck gazing on her face saw that though her eyes were full of tears they yet looked steadily upon his and he knew that she loved him only as a sister he sighed and paused again ere he resumed enough said he now to my task once on a time dear cousin there lived among the mountains a certain chief who had two sons and an orphan like thyself dwelt also in his halls and the elder son but no matter let us not waste words on him the younger son then loved the orphan dearly more dearly than cousins love and fearful of refusal he prayed the elder one to urge his suit to the orphan leoline my tale is done canst thou not love otho as he loves thee and now lifting his eyes to leoline he saw that she trembled violently and her cheek was covered with blushes say continued he mastering himself is not that flower his present a token that he is chiefly in thy thoughts ah warbeck do not deem me ungrateful that i wear not yours also but hush said warbeck hastily i am but as thy brother is not otho more he is young brave and beautiful god grant that he may deserve thee if thou givest him so rich a gift as thy affections i saw less of otho in my childhood said leoline evasively therefore his kindness of late years seemed stranger to me than thine and thou wilt not then reject him thou wilt be his bride and thy sister answered leoline bless thee mine own dear cousin one brother's kiss then and farewell otho shall thank thee for himself he kissed her forehead calmly and turning away plunged into the thicket then nor till then he gave vent to such emotions as had leoline seen them otho's suit had been lost for ever for passionately deeply as in her fond and innocent heart she loved otho the happiness of warbeck was not less dear to her when the young knight had recovered his self-possession he went in search of otho he found him alone in the wood leaning with folded arms against a tree and gazing moodily on the ground warbeck's noble heart was touched at his brother's dejection cheer thee otho said he i bring thee no bad tidings i have seen leoline i have conversed with her 
nay start not she loves thee she is thine generous generous warbeck exclaimed otho and he threw himself on his brother's neck no no said he th this must not be thou hast the elder claim i resign her to thee forgive me my waywardness brother forgive me think of the past no more said warbeck the love of leoline is an excuse for greater offences than thine and now be kind to her her nature is soft and keen i know her well for i have studied her faintest wish thou art hasty and quick of ire but remember that a word wounds where love is deep for my sake as for hers think more of her happiness than thine own now seek her she waits to hear from thy lips the tale that sounded cold upon mine with that he left his brother and once more re-entering the castle he went into the hall of his ancestors his father still slept he put his hand on his gray hair and blessed him then stealing up to his chamber he braced on his helm and armor and thrice kissing the hilt of fate sword said with a flushed cheek henceforth be thou my bride and then passing from the castle he sped by the most solitary paths down the rock gained the rhine and hailing one of the numerous fishermen of the river won the opposite shore and alone but not sad for his high heart supported him and leoline at least was happy he hastened to frankfort the town was all gaiety and life arms clanged at every corner the sounds of martial music the wave of banners the glittering of plume casks the neighing of war steeds all united to stir the blood and inflame the sense st bertrand had lifted the sacred cross along the shores of the rhine and the streets of frankfort witnessed with what success on that same day warbeck assumed the sacred badge and was enlisted among the knights of the emperor conrad now we must suppose some time to have elapsed and otho and leoline were not yet wedded for in the first fervor of his gratitude to his brother otho had proclaimed to his father and to leoline the conquest warbeck had obtained over himself and leoline touched to the heart would not consent that the wedding should take place immediately let him at least said she not be insulted by a premature festivity and give him time amongst the lofty beauties he will gaze upon in a far country to forget otho that he once loved her who is the beloved of thee the old chief applauded this delicacy and even otho in the first flush of his feelings towards his brother did not venture to oppose it they settled then that the marriage should take place at the end of a year months rolled away and an absent and moody gloom settled upon otho's brow in his excursions with his gay companions among the neighboring towns he heard of nothing but the glory of the crusaders of the homage paid to the heroes of the cross at the courts they visited of the adventures of their life and the exciting spirit that animated their war in fact neither minstrel nor priest suffered the theme to grow cold and the fame of those who had gone forth to the holy strife gave at once emulation and discontent to the youths who remained behind and my brother enjoys this ardent and glorious life said the impatient otho while i whose arm is as strong and whose heart is as bold languish here listening to the dull tales of a hoary sire and the silly songs of an orphan girl his heart smote him at the last sentence but he had already begun to weary of the gentle love of leoline perhaps when he had no longer to gain a triumph over a rival the excitement paled or perhaps his proud spirit secretly chafed at being conquered by his brother in generosity even when outshining him in the success of love but poor leoline once taught that she was to consider otho her betrothed surrendered her heart entirely to his control his wild spirit his dark beauty his daring valor won while they awed her and in the fitfulness of his nature were those perpetual springs of hope and fear that are the fountains of ever agitated love she saw with increasing grief the change that was growing over otho's mind nor did she divine the cause 
surely i have not offended him thought she among the companions of otho was one who possessed a singular sway over him he was a knight of that mysterious order of the temple which exercised at one time so great a command over the minds of men a severe and dangerous wound in a brawl with an english knight had confined the templar at frankfort and prevented his joining the crusade during his slow recovery he had formed an intimacy with otho and taking up his residence at the castle of liebenstein had been struck with the beauty of leoline prevented by his oath from marriage he allowed himself a double license in love and doubted not could he disengage the young knight from his betrothed that she would add a new conquest to the many he had already achieved artfully therefore he painted to otho the various attractions of the holy cause and above all he failed not to describe with glowing colors the beauties who in the gorgeous east distinguished with the prodigal favor the warriors of the cross dowries unknown in the more sterile mountains of the rhine accompanied the hand of these beauteous maidens and even a prince's daughter was not deemed he said too lofty a marriage for the heroes who might win kingdoms for themselves to me said the templar such hopes are eternally denied but you were you not already betrothed what fortunes might await you by such discourses the ambition of otho was perpetually aroused they served to deepen his discontent at his present obscurity and to convert to distaste the only solace it afforded in the innocence and affection of leoline one night a minstrel sought shelter from the storm in the halls of liebenstein his visit was welcomed by the chief and he repaid the hospitality he had received by the exercise of his art he sang of the chase and the gaunt hound started from the hearth he sang of love and otho forgetting his restless dreams approached to leoline and laid himself at her feet louder then and louder rose the strain the minstrel sang of war he painted the feats of the crusaders he plunged into the thickest of the battle the steed neighed the trump sounded and you might have heard the ringing of the steel but when he came to signalize the names of the boldest knights high among the loftiest sounded the name of sir warbeck of liebenstein thrice had he saved the imperial banner two chargers slain beneath him he had covered their bodies with the fiercest of the foe gentle in the tent and terrible in the fray the minstrel should forget his craft ere the rhine should forget its hero the chief started from his seat leoline clasped the minstrel's hand speak you have seen him he lives he is honored i myself am but just from palestine brave chief and noble maiden i saw the gallant knight of liebenstein at the right hand of the imperial conrad and he lady was the only knight whom admiration shone upon without envy its shadow who then continued the minstrel once more striking his harp who then would remain inglorious in the hall should not the banners of his sires reproach him as they wave and shall not every voice from palestine strike shame into his soul right cried otho suddenly and flinging himself at the feet of his father thou hearest what my brother has done and thine aged eyes weep tears of joy shall i only dishonor thine old age with a rusted sword no grant me like my brother to go forth with the heroes of the cross noble youth cried the harper therein speaks the soul of sir warbeck hear him sir knight hear the noble youth heaven cries aloud in his voice said the templar solemnly my son i cannot chide thine ardor said the old chief raising him with trembling hands but leoline thy betrothed pale as a statue with ears that doubted their sense as they drank in the cruel words of her lover stood the orphan she did not speak she scarcely breathed she sank into her seat and gazed upon the ground till at the speech of the chief both maiden pride and maiden tenderness restored her consciousness and she said i uncle shall i bid otho stay when his wishes bid him depart he will return to thee noble lady covered with glory said the harper 
but otho said no more the touching voice of leoline went to his soul he resumed his seat in silence and leoline going up to him whispered gently act as though i were not and left the hall to commune with her heart and to weep alone i can wed her before i go said otho suddenly as he sat that night in the templar's chamber why that is true and leave thy bride in the first week a hard trial better than incur the chance of never calling her mine dear kind beloved leoline assuredly she deserves all from thee and indeed it is no small sacrifice at thy years and with thy mane to renounce forever all interest among the noble maidens thou wilt visit ah from the galleries of constantinople what eyes will look down on thee and what ears learning that thou art otho the bridegroom will turn away caring for thee no more a bridegroom without a bride nay man much as the cross wants warriors i am enough thy friend to tell thee if thou weddest to stay peaceably at home and forget in the chase the labours of war from which thou wouldest strip the ambition of love i would i knew what were best said otho irresolutely my brother ha shall he for ever excel me but leoline how will she grieve she who left him for me was that thy fault said the templar gaily it may many times chance to thee again to be preferred to another troth it is a sin under which the conscience may walk lightly enough but sleep on it otho my eyes grow heavy the next day otho sought leoline and proposed to her that their wedding should precede his parting but so embarrassed was he so divided between two wishes that leoline offended hurt stung by his coldness refused the proposal at once she left him lest he should see her weep and then then she repented even of her just pride end of section five international short stories volume two english stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org international short stories volume two english stories edited by william patton section six the brothers a tale by edward bulwer lytton part two but otho striving to appease his conscience with the belief that hers now was the sole fault busied himself in preparations for his departure anxious to outshine his brother he departed not as warbeck alone and unattended but levying all the horse men and money that his domain of sternfels which he had not yet tenanted would afford he repaired to frankfort at the head of a glittering troop the templar affecting a relapse tarried behind and promised to join him at that constantinople of which he had so loudly boasted meanwhile he devoted his whole powers of pleasing to console the unhappy orphan the force of her simple love was however stronger than all his arts in vain he insinuated doubts of otho she refused to hear them in vain he poured with the softest accents into her ear the witchery of flattery and song she turned heedlessly away and only pained by the courtesies that had so little resemblance to otho she shut herself up in her chamber and pined in solitude for her forsaken the templar now resolved to attempt darker arts to obtain power over her when fortunately he was summoned suddenly away by a mission from the grand master of so high import that it could not be resisted by a passion stronger in his breast than love the passion of ambition he left the castle to its solitude and otho peopling it no more with his gay companions no solitude could be more unfrequently disturbed meanwhile though ever and anon the fame of warbeck reached their ears it came unaccompanied with that of otho of him they had no tidings and thus the love of the tender orphan was kept alive by the perpetual restlessness of fear at length the old chief died and leoline was left utterly alone 
One evening, as she sat with her maidens in the hall, the ringing of a steed's hoofs were heard in the outer court. A horn sounded, the heavy gates were unbarred, and a knight of a stately mane and covered with the mantle of the cross entered the hall. He stopped for one moment at the entrance, as if overpowered by his emotion. In the next, he had clasped Leoline to his breast. Dost thou not recognize thy cousin Warbeck? He doffed his casque, and she saw that majestic brow which, unlike Otho's, had never changed or been clouded in its aspect to her. The war is suspended for the present, said he. I learned my father's death, and I have returned home to hang up my banner in the hall and spend my days in peace. Time and the life of camps had worked their change upon Warbeck's face. The fair hair, deepened in its shade, was worn from the temples, and disclosed one scar that rather aided the beauty of a countenance that had always something high and martial in its character. But the calm it had once worn had settled down into sadness. He conversed more rarely than before, and though he smiled not less often nor less kindly, the smile had more of thought and the kindness had forgot its passion. He had apparently conquered a love that was so early crossed, but not that fidelity of remembrance which made Leoline dearer to him than all others, and forbade him to replace the images he had graven upon his soul. The orphan's lips trembled with the name of Otho, but a certain recollection stifled even her anxiety. Warbeck hastened to forestall her questions. Otho was well, he said and sojourning at Constantinople. He had lingered there so long that the crusade had terminated without his aid. Doubtless now he would speedily return. A month, a week, nay, a day might restore him to her side. Leoline was inexpressibly consoled. Yet something remained untold. Why, so eager for the strife of the sacred tomb, had he thus tarried at Constantinople? She wondered. She wearied. Conjecture but she did not dare to search farther. The generous Warbeck concealed from her that Otho led a life of the most reckless and indolent dissipations, wasting his wealth in the pleasures of the Greek court, and only occupying his ambition with the wild schemes of founding a principality in those foreign climes which the enterprises of the Norman adventurers had rendered so alluring to the knightly bandits of the age. The cousins resumed their old friendship, and Warbeck believed that it was friendship alone. They walked again among the gardens in which their childhood had strayed. They sat again on the green turf whereon they had woven flowers. They looked down on the eternal mirror of the Rhine. Ah, could it have reflected the same unawakened freshness of their life's early spring? The grave and contemplative mind of Warbeck had not been so contented with the honors of war, but that it had sought also those calmer sources of emotion which were yet found amongst the sages of the East. He had drunk at the fountain of the wisdom of those distant climes, and had acquired the habits of meditation which were indulged by those wiser tribes from which the crusaders brought back to the north the knowledge that was destined to enlighten their posterity. Warbeck, therefore, had little in common with the ruder chiefs around. He did not summon them to his board, nor attend their noisy wassails. Often late at night in yon shattered tower, his lonely lamp shone still over the mighty stream, and his only relief to loneliness was in the presence and the song of his soft cousin. Months rolled on, when suddenly a vague and fearful rumor reached the castle of Liebenstein. Otho was returning home to the neighboring tower of Sternfels, but not alone. He brought back with him a Greek bride of surprising beauty, endowered with almost regal wealth. Leoline was the first to discredit the rumor. Leoline was soon the only one who disbelieved. Bright in the summer noon flashed the array of horsemen. Far up the steep ascent wound the gorgeous cavalcade. The lonely towers of Liebenstein heard the echo of many a laugh and peal of merriment. Otho bore home his bride to the halls of Sternfels. That night there was a great banquet in Otho's castle. The light shone from every casement, and music swelled loud and ceaselessly within. By the side of Otho, glittering with the prodigal jewels of the east, sat the Greek. Her dark locks, her flashing eye, the false colors of her complexion, dazzled the eyes of her guests. 
on her left hand sat the templar by the holy rood quoth the templar gaily though he crossed himself as he spoke we shall scare the owls tonight on those grim towers of liebenstein thy grave brother sir otho will have much to do to comfort his cousin when she sees what a gallant life she would have led with thee poor damsel said the greek with affected pity doubtless she will now be reconciled to the rejected one i hear he is a knight of a comely mien peace said otho sternly and quaffing a large goblet of wine the greek bit her lip and glanced meaningly at the templar who returned the glance naught but a beauty such as thine can win my pardon said otho turning to his bride and gazing passionately in her face the greek smiled well sped the feast the laugh deepened the wine circled when otho's eyes rested on a guest at the bottom of the board whose figure was mantled from head to foot and whose face was covered by a dark veil beshrew me said he aloud but this is scarce courteous at our revel will the stranger vouchsafe to unmask these words turned all eyes to the figure and they who sat next it perceived that it trembled violently at length it rose and walking slowly but with grace to the fair greek it laid beside her a wreath of flowers it is a simple gift lady said the stranger in a voice of such sweetness that the rudest guest was touched by it but it is all i can offer and the bride of otho should not be without a gift at my hands may ye both be happy and with these words the stranger turned and passed from the hall silent as a shadow bring back the stranger cried the greek recovering her surprise twenty guests sprang up to obey her mandate no no said otho waving his hand impatiently touch her not heed her not at your peril the greek bent over the flowers to conceal her anger and from amongst them dropped the broken half of a ring otho recognized it at once it was the broken half of that ring which he had broken with his betrothed alas he required not such a sign to convince him that figure so full of ineffable grace that touching voice that simple action so tender in its sentiment that gift that blessing came only from the forsaken and forgiving leoline but warbeck alone in his solitary tower paced to and fro with agitated steps deep undying wrath at his brother's falsehood mingled with one burning one delicious hope he confessed now that he had deceived himself when he thought his passion was no more was there any longer a bar to his union with leoline in that delicacy which was breathed into him by his love he had forborne to seek or to offer her the insult of consolation he felt that the shock should be borne alone and yet he pined he thirsted to throw himself at her feet nursing these contending thoughts he was aroused by a knock at his door he opened it the passage was thronged by leoline's maidens pale anxious weeping leoline had left the castle with but one female attendant none knew whither they knew too soon from the hall of sternfels she had passed over in the dark and inclement night to the valley in which the convent of bornhofen offered to the weary of spirit and the broken of heart a refuge at the shrine of god at daybreak the next morning warbeck was at the convent's gate he saw leoline what a change one night of suffering had made in that face which was the fountain of all loveliness to him he clasped her in his arms he wept he urged all that love could urge he besought her to accept that heart which had never wronged her memory by a thought o oh, leoline didst thou not say once that these arms nursed thy childhood that this voice soothed thine early sorrows ah trust to them again and for ever from a love that forsook thee turn to the love that never swerved no said leoline no what would the chivalry of which thou art the boast what would they say of thee wert thou to wed one affianced and deserted who tarried years for another and brought to thine arms only that heart which he had abandoned no and even if thou as i know thou wouldst be wert callous to such wrong of thy high name shall i bring to thee a broken heart and bruised spirit shalt thou wed sorrow and not joy and shall sighs that will not cease 
and tears that may not be dried be the only dowry of thy bride thou too for whom all blessings should be ordained no forget me forget thy poor leoline she hath nothing but prayers for thee in vain warbeck pleaded in vain he urged all that passion and truth could urge the springs of earthly love were forever dried up in the orphan's heart and her resolution was immovable she tore herself from his arms and the gate of the convent creaked harshly on his ear a new and stern emotion now wholly possessed him though naturally mild and gentle he cherished anger when once it was aroused with the strength of a calm mind leoline's tears her sufferings her wrongs her uncomplaining spirit the change already stamped upon her face all cried aloud to him for vengeance she is an orphan said he bitterly she hath none to protect to redress her save me alone my father's charge over her forlorn youth descends of right to me what matters it whether her forsaker be my brother he is her foe hath he not crushed her heart hath he not consigned her to sorrow till the grave and with what insult no warning no excuse with lewd wassailers keeping revel for his new bridles in the hearing before the sight of his betrothed enough the time hath come when to use his own words one of us two must fall he half drew his sword as he spoke and thrusting it back violently into the sheath strode home to his solitary castle the sound of steeds and of the hunting horn met him at his portal the bridal train of sternfells all mirth and gladness were parting for the chase that evening a knight in complete armor entered the banquet hall of sternfells and defied otho on the part of warbeck of liebenstein to mortal combat even the templar was startled by so unnatural a challenge but otho reddening took up the gauge and the day and spot were fixed discontented wroth with himself a savage gladness seized him he longed to wreak his desperate feelings even on his brother nor had he ever in his jealous heart forgiven that brother his virtues and his renown at the appointed hour the brothers met as foes warbeck's visor was up and all the settled sternness of his soul was stamped upon his brow but otho more willing to brave the arm than to face the front of his brother kept his visor down the templar stood by him with folded arms it was a study in human passions to his mocking mind scarce had the first trump sounded to this dread conflict when a new actor entered on the scene the rumor of so unprecedented an event had not failed to reach the convent of bornhofen and now two by two came the sisters of the holy shrine and the armed men made way as with trailing garments and veiled faces they swept along into the very lists at that moment one from amongst them left her sisters with a slow majestic pace and paused not till she stood right between the brother foes warbeck she said in a hollow voice that curdled up his dark spirit as it spoke is it thus thou wouldst prove thy love and maintain thy trust over the fatherless orphan whom thy sire bequeathed to thy care shall i have murder on my soul at that question she paused and those who heard it were struck dumb and shuddered the murder of one man by the hand of his own brother away warbeck i command shall i forget thy wrongs leoline said warbeck wrongs they united me to god they are forgiven they are no more earth has deserted me but heaven hath taken me to its arms shall i murmur at the change and thou otho here her voice faltered thou dost thy conscience smite thee not wouldst thou atone for robbing me of hope by barring against me the future wretch that i should be could i dream of mercy could i dream of comfort if thy brother fell by thy sword in my cause Otho, I have pardoned thee, and blessed thee and thine. Once perhaps thou didst love me. Remember how I love thee. Cast down thine arms. Otho gazed at the veiled form before him. Where had the soft Leoline learned to command? He turned to his brother. He felt all that he had inflicted upon both. 
and casting his sword upon the ground he knelt at the feet of leoline and kissed her garment with a devotion that votary never lavished on a holier saint the spell that lay over the warriors around was broken there was one loud cry of congratulation and joy and thou warbeck said leoline turning to the spot where still motionless and haughty warbeck stood have i ever rebelled against thy will said he softly and buried the point of his sword in the earth yet leoline yet he added looking at his kneeling brother yet art thou already better avenged than by this steel thou art thou art cried otho smiting his breast and slowly and scarce noting the crowd that fell back from his path warbeck left the lists leoline said no more her divine errand was fulfilled she looked long and wistfully after the stately form of the knight of liebenstein and then with a slight sigh she turned to otho this is the last time we shall meet on earth peace be with us all she then with the same majestic and collected bearing passed on toward the sisterhood and as in the same solemn procession they glided back toward the convent there was not a man present no not even the hardened templar who would not like otho have bent his knee to leoline once more otho plunged into the wild reveille of the age his castle was thronged with guests and night after night the lighted hall shone down thwart the tranquil rhine the beauty of the greek the wealth of otto the fame of the templar attracted all the chivalry from far and near never had the banks of the rhine known so hospitable a lord as the knight of sternfels yet gloom seized him in the midst of gladness and the revel was welcome only as the escape from remorse the voice of scandal however soon began to mingle with that of envy at the pomp of otho the fair greek it was said weary of her lord lavished her smiles on others the young and the fair were always most acceptable at the castle and above all her guilty love for the templar scarcely affected disguise otho alone appeared unconscious of the rumor and though he had begun to neglect his bride he relaxed not in his intimacy with the templar it was noon and the greek was sitting in her bower alone with her suspected lover the rich perfumes of the east mingled with the fragrance of flowers and various luxuries unknown till then in those northern shores gave a soft and effeminate character to the room i tell thee said the greek petulantly that he begins to suspect that i have seen him watch thee and mutter as he watched and play with the hilt of his dagger better let us fly ere it is too late for his vengeance would be terrible were it once aroused against us ah why did i ever forsake my own sweet land for these barbarous shores there love is not considered eternal nor inconstancy a crime worthy death peace pretty one said the templar carelessly thou knowest not the laws of our foolish chivalry thinkest thou i could fly from a knight's halls like a thief in the night why verily even the red cross would not cover such dishonor if thou fearest that thy dull lord suspects let us part the emperor hath sent to me from frankfurt ere evening i might be on my way thither and i left to brave the barbarian's revenge alone is this thy chivalry nay prate not so wildly answered the templar surely when the object of his suspicion is gone thy woman's art and thy greek wiles can easily allay the jealous fiend do i not know thee glycera why thou wouldst fool all men save a templar and thou cruel wouldst thou leave me said the greek weeping how shall i live without thee the templar laughed slightly can such eyes ever weep without a comforter but farewell i must not be found with thee to-morrow i depart for frankfurt we shall meet again as soon as the door closed on the templar the greek rose and pacing the room said selfish selfish how could i ever trust him yet i dare not brave otho alone surely it was his step that disturbed us in our yesterday's interview nay i will fly i can never want a companion she clapped her hands a young page appeared she threw herself on her seat and wept bitterly the page approached and love was mingled with his compassion 
why weepest thou dearest lady said he is there aught in which conrad's services services ah thou hast read his heart his devotion may avail otho had wandered out the whole day alone his vassals had observed that his brow was more gloomy than its wont for he usually concealed whatever might prey within some of the most confidential of his servitors he had conferred with and the conference had deepened the shadow of his countenance he returned at twilight the greek did not honor the repast with her presence she was unwell and not to be disturbed the gay templar was the life of the board thou carriest a sad brow to-day sir otho said he good faith thou hast caught it from the air of liebenstein i have something troubles me answered otho forcing a smile which i would fain impart to thy friendly bosom the night is clear and the moon is up let us forth alone into the garden the templar rose and he forgot not to gird on his sword as he followed the knight otho led the way to one of the most distant terraces that overhung the rhine sir templar said he pausing answer me one question on thy knightly honour was it thy step that left my lady's bower yester eve at vesper startled by so sudden a query the wily templar faltered in his reply the red blood mounted to otho's brow nay lie not sir knight these eyes thanks to god have not witnessed but these ears have heard from others of my dishonour as otho spoke the templar's eyes resting on the water perceived a boat rowing fast over the rhine the distance forbade him to see more than the outline of two figures within it she was right thought he perhaps that boat already bears her from the danger drawing himself up to the full height of his tall stature the templar replied haughtily sir otho of sternfels if thou hast deigned to question thy vassals obtain from them only an answer it is not to contradict such minions that the knights of the temple pledge their word enough cried otho losing patience and striking the templar with his clenched hand draw traitor draw alone in his lofty tower warbeck watched the night deepen over the heavens and commune mournfully with himself to what end thought he have these strong affections these capacities of love this yearning after sympathy been given me unloved and unknown i walk to my grave and all the nobler mysteries of my heart are for ever to be untold and thus musing he heard not the challenge of the warder on the wall or the unbarring of the gate below or the tread of footsteps along the winding stair the door was thrown suddenly open and otho stood before him come he said in a low voice trembling with passion come i will show thee that which shall glad thine heart twofold is leoline avenged warbeck looked in amazement on a brother he had not met since they stood in arms against the other's life and he now saw that the arm that otho extended to him dripped with blood trickling drop by drop upon the floor come said otho follow me it is my last prayer come for leoline's sake come at that name warbeck hesitated no longer he girded on his sword and followed his brother down the stairs and through the castle gate the porter scarcely believed his eyes when he saw the two brothers so long divided go forth at that hour alone and seemingly in friendship warbeck arrived at that epoch in the feelings when nothing stuns followed with silent steps the rapid strides of his brother the two castles as you are aware are scarce a stone's throw from each other in a few minutes otho paused at an open space in one of the terraces of sternfels on which the moon shone bright and steady behold he said in a ghastly voice behold and warbeck saw on the sward the corpse of the templar bathed with the blood that even still poured fast and warm from his heart hark said otho he it was who first made me waver in my vows to leoline he persuaded me to wed yon whited falsehood hark he who had thus wronged my real love dishonored me with my faithless bride and thus thus 
thus as grinding his teeth he spurned again and again the dead body of the templar thus leoline and myself are avenged and thy wife said warbeck pityingly fled fled with a hireling page it is well she was not worth the sword that was once belted on by leoline the tradition dear gertrude proceeds to tell us that otho though often menaced by the rude justice of the day for the death of the templar defied and escaped the menace on the very night of his revenge a long and delirious illness seized him the generous warbeck forgave forgot all save that he had once been consecrated by leoline's love he tended him through his sickness and when he recovered otho was an altered man he forswore the comrades he had once courted the revels he had once led the halls of sternfels were desolate as those of liebenstein the only companion otho sought was warbeck and warbeck bore with him they had no topic in common for one subject warbeck at least felt too deeply ever to trust himself to speak and yet did a strange and secret sympathy reunite them they had at least a common sorrow often they were seen wandering together by the solitary banks of the river or amidst the woods without apparently interchanging word or sign otho died first and still in the prime of youth and warbeck was now left companionless in vain the imperial court wooed him to its pleasures in vain the camp proffered him the oblivion of renown ah could he tear himself from a spot where morning and night he could see afar amidst the valley the roof that sheltered leoline and on which every copse every turf reminded him of former days his solitary life his midnight vigils strange scrolls about his chamber obtained him by degrees the repute of cultivating the darker arts and shunning he became shunned by all but still it was sweet to hear from time to time of the increasing sanctity of her in whom he had treasured up his last thoughts of earth she it was who healed the sick she it was who relieved the poor and the superstition of that age brought pilgrims from afar to the altars that she served many years afterwards a band of lawless robbers who ever and anon broke from their mountain fastness to pillage and to desolate the valleys of the rhine who spared neither sex nor age neither tower nor hut nor even the houses of god himself laid waste the territories round bornhofen and demanded treasures from the convent the abbess of the bold lineage of rudesheim refused the sacrilegious demand the convent was stormed its vassals resisted the robbers inured to slaughter won the day already the gates were forced when a knight at the head of a small but hardy troop rushed down from the mountainside and turned the tide of the fray wherever his sword flashed fell a foe wherever his war cry sounded was a space of dead men in the thick of the battle the fight was won the convent saved the abbess and the sisterhood came forth to bless their deliverer laid under an aged oak he was bleeding fast to death his head was bare and his locks were gray but scarcely yet with years one only of the sisterhood recognized that majestic face one bathed his parched lips one held his dying hand and in leoline's presence passed away the faithful spirit of the last lord of liebenstein oh said gertrude through her tears surely you must have altered the facts surely surely it must have been impossible for leoline with a woman's heart to have loved otho more than warbeck my child said vane so think women when they read a tale of love and see the whole heart bared before them but not so act they in real life when they see only the surface of character and pierce not its depths until it is too late end of section six International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. International Short Stories, Volume 2 English Stories Edited by William Patton Section 7 Dr. Manette's Manuscript by Charles Dickens I, Alexandre Manette, unfortunate physician, native of Beauvais, and afterwards resident in Paris, write this melancholy paper in my doleful cell in the Bastille during the last month of the year, 1767. I write it at stolen intervals, under every difficulty. I design to secret it in the wall of the chimney, where I have slowly and laboriously made a place of concealment for it. Some pitying hand may find it there, when I and my sorrows are dust. These words are formed by the rusty iron point, with which I write with difficulty, in scrapings of soot and charcoal from the chimney, mixed with blood, in the last month of the tenth year of my captivity. Hope has quite departed from my breast. I know from terrible warnings I have noted in myself that my reason will not long remain unimpaired. But I solemnly declare that I am at this time in the possession of my right mind, that my memory is exact and circumstantial, and that I write the truth, as I shall answer for these my last recorded words, whether they be ever read by men or not, at the eternal judgment seat. One cloudy moonlight night in the third week of December, I think the twenty-second of the month, in the year 1757, I was walking on a retired part of the quay by the Seine for the refreshment of the frosty air, at an hour's distance from my place of residence in the street of the School of Medicine, when a carriage came along behind me, driven very fast. As I stood aside to let that carriage pass, apprehensive that it might otherwise run me down, a head was pulled out at the window, and a voice called to the driver to stop. The carriage stopped as soon as the driver could rein in his horses, and the same voice called to me by my name. I answered. The carriage was then so far in advance of me that two gentlemen had time to open the door and alight before I came up with it. I observed that they were both wrapped in cloaks and appeared to conceal themselves. As they stood side by side near the carriage door, I also observed that they both looked of about my own age, or rather younger, and that they were greatly alike in stature, manner, voice, and, as far as I could see, face, too. "'You are Dr. Manette,' said one. "'I am.' "'Dr. Manette, formerly of Beauvais,' said the other, the young physician, originally an expert surgeon, who within the last year or two has made a rising reputation in Paris. "'Gentlemen,' I returned, I am that Dr. Manette of whom you speak so graciously. We have been to your residence, said the first, and not being so fortunate as to find you there, and being informed that you were probably walking in this direction, we followed in the hope of overtaking you. Will you please to enter the carriage? The manner of both was imperious, and they both moved, as these words were spoken, so as to place me between themselves and the carriage door. They were armed. I was not. "'Gentlemen,' said I, "'pardon me, but I usually inquire who does me the honour to seek my assistance, and what is the nature of the case to which I am summoned?' The reply to this was made by him who had spoken second. "'Doctor, your clients are people of condition. As to the nature of the case, our confidence in your skill assures us that you will ascertain it for yourself better than we can describe it. Enough. Will you please enter the carriage?' I could do nothing but comply, and I entered it in silence. They both entered after me, the last springing in after putting up the steps. The carriage turned about and drove on at its former speed. I repeat this conversation exactly as it occurred. I have no doubt that it is word for word the same. I describe everything exactly as it took place, constraining my mind not to wander from the task. Where I make the broken marks that follow here, I leave off for the time and put my paper in its hiding place. The carriage left the streets behind, passed the north barrier, and emerged upon the country road. 
at two-thirds of a league from the barrier. I did not estimate the distance at that time, but afterwards when I traversed it. It struck out of the main avenue, and presently stopped at a solitary house. We all three alighted and walked by a damp soft footpath in a garden where a neglected fountain had overflowed to the door of the house. It was not opened immediately in answer to the ringing of the bell, and one of my two conductors struck the man who opened it with his heavy riding glove across the face. There was nothing in this action to attract my particular attention, for I had seen common people struck more commonly than dogs. But the other of the two, being angry likewise, struck the man in like manner with his arm. The look and bearing of the brothers were then so exactly alike that I then first perceived them to be twin brothers. From the time of our alighting at the outer gate, which we found locked, and which one of the brothers had opened to admit us, and had relocked, I had heard cries proceeding from an upper chamber. I was conducted to this chamber straight, the cries growing louder as we ascended the stairs, and I found a patient in a high fever of the brain, lying on a bed. The patient was a woman of great beauty and young, assuredly not much past twenty. Her hair was torn and ragged, and her arms were bound to her sides with sashes and handkerchiefs. I noticed that these bonds were all portions of a gentleman's dress. On one of them, which was a fringed scarf for a dress of ceremony, I saw the armorial bearings of a noble, and the letter E. I saw this within the first minute of my contemplation of the patient, for in her restless striving she had turned over on her face on the edge of the bed and had drawn the end of the scarf into her mouth, and was in danger of suffocation. My first act was to put out my hand to relieve her breathing, and in moving the scarf aside, the embroidery on the corner caught my sight. I turned her gently over, placed my hands upon her breast to calm her and keep her down, and looked into her face. Her eyes were dilated and wild and she constantly uttered piercing shrieks and repeated the words, My husband, my father, and my brother, and then counted up to twelve and said, Hush! For an instant, and no more, she would pause to listen, and then the piercing shrieks would begin again, and she would repeat the cry, My husband, my father, and my brother, and would count up to twelve and say, Hush! There was no variation in the order of the manner. There was no cessation but the regular moment's pause in the utterance of these sounds. How long, I asked, has this lasted? To distinguish the brothers, I will call them the elder and the younger. By the elder, I mean him who exercised the most authority. It was the elder who replied, Since about this hour last night. She has a husband, a father, and a brother. A brother. I do not address her brother. He answered with great contempt, No. She has some recent association with the number twelve. The younger brother impatiently rejoined, With twelve o'clock? See, gentlemen, said I, still keeping my hands upon her breast, how useless I am as you have brought me. If I had known what I was coming to see, I could have come provided. As it is, time must be lost. There are no medications to be obtained in this lonely place. The elder brother looked to the younger, who said haughtily, There is a case of medicines here, and brought it from a closet and put it on the table. I opened some of the bottles, smelt them, and put the stoppers to my lips. If I had wanted to use anything save narcotic medicines that were poisons in themselves, I would not have administered any of those. Do you doubt them? asked the younger brother. You see, monsieur, I am going to use them, I replied, and said no more. I made the patient swallow, with great difficulty and, after many efforts, the dose that I had desired to give. As I intended to repeat it after a while, and as it was necessary to watch its influence, I sat down by the side of the bed. There was a timid and suppressed woman in attendance, wife of the man downstairs, who had retreated into a corner. The house was damp and decayed, indifferently furnished, 
evidently recently occupied and temporarily used. Some thick old hangings had been nailed up before the windows to deaden the sound of the shrieks. They continued to be uttered in their regular succession, with the cry, My husband, my father, and my brother, the counting up to twelve, and hush. The frenzy was so violent that I had not unfastened the bandages restraining the arms, but I had looked to them to see that they were not painful. The only spark of encouragement in the case was that my hand upon the sufferer's breast had this much soothing influence, that for minutes at a time it tranquilized the figure. It had no effect upon the cries. No pendulum could be more regular. For the reason that my hand had this effect, I assume, I had sat by the side of the bed for half an hour, with the two brothers looking on, before the elder said, There is another patient. I was startled, and asked, Is it a pressing case? You had better see, he carelessly answered, and took up a light. The other patient lay in a back room across a second staircase, which was a species of loft over a stable. There was a low plastered ceiling to a part of it. The rest was open to the ridge of the tiled roof, and there were beams across. Hay and straw were stored in that portion of the place, faggots for firing, and a heap of apples in sand. I had to pass through that part to get at the other. My memory is circumstantial and unshaken. I try it with these details, and I see them all, in this my cell in the Bastille, near the close of the tenth year of my captivity, as I saw them all that night. On some hay on the ground, with a cushion thrown under his head, lay a handsome peasant boy, a boy of not more than seventeen at the most. He lay on his back with his teeth set, his right hand clenched on his breast, and his glaring eyes looking straight upward. I could not see where his wound was as I kneeled on one knee over him, but I could see that he was dying of a wound from a sharp point. I am a doctor, my poor fellow, said I. Let me examine it. I do not want it examined, he answered. Let it be. It was under his hand, and I soothed him to let me move his hand away. The wound was a sword thrust, received from twenty to twenty-four hours before. But no skill could have saved him if it had been looked to without delay. He was then dying fast. As I turned my eyes to the elder brother, I saw him looking down at this handsome boy, whose life was ebbing out, as if he were a wounded bird or hare or rabbit, not at all as if he were a fellow creature. "'How has this been done, monsieur?' said I. "'A crazed young common dog, a serf, forced my brother to draw upon him, and has fallen by my brother's sword like a gentleman. There was no touch of pity, sorrow, or kindred humanity in this answer. The speaker seemed to acknowledge that it was inconvenient to have that different order of creature dying there, and that it would have been better if he had died in the usual obscure routine of his vermin kind. He was quite incapable of any compassionate feeling about the boy or about his fate. The boy's eyes had slowly moved to him as he had spoken, and now they slowly moved to me. Doctor, they are very proud, these nobles, but we common dogs are proud too sometimes. They plunder us, outrage us, beat us, kill us, but we have a little pride left sometimes. She, have you seen her, doctor? The shrieks and the cries were audible there, though subdued by the distance. He referred to them as if she were lying in our presence. I said, I have seen her. She is my sister, doctor. They have had their shameful rights, these nobles, in the modesty and virtue of our sisters, many years. But we have had good girls among us. I know it, and have heard my father say so. She was a good girl. She was betrothed to a good young man, too, a tenant of his. We were all tenants of his, that man's who stands there. The other is his brother, the worst of a bad race. It was with the greatest difficulty that the boy gathered bodily force to speak, but his spirit spoke with a dreadful emphasis. We were so robbed by that man who stands there, as all we common dogs are by those superior beings, taxed by him without mercy, obliged to work for him without pay 
obliged to grind our corn at his mill, obliged to feed scores of his tame birds on our wretched crops, and forbidden for our lives to keep a single tame bird of our own, pillaged and plundered to that degree that when we chanced to have a bit of meat, we ate it in fear, with the door barred and the shutters closed, that his people should not see it and take it from us. I say we were so robbed and hunted and made so poor, that our father told us it was a dreadful thing to bring a child into the world, and that what we should most pray for was that our women should be barren and our miserable race die out. I had never before seen the sense of being oppressed bursting forth like a fire. I had supposed that it must be latent in the people somewhere, but I had never seen it break out until I saw it in the dying boy. Nevertheless, doctor, my sister married. He was ailing at that time, poor fellow, and she married her lover, that she might tend and comfort him in our cottage, our dog-hut, as that man would call it. She had not been married many weeks when that man's brother saw her and admired her, and asked that man to lend her to him. For what are husbands among us? He was willing enough, but my sister was good and virtuous, and hated his brother with a hatred as strong as mine. What did the two then to persuade her husband to use his influence with her, to make her willing? The boy's eyes, which had been fixed on mine, slowly turned to the looker-on, and I saw in the two faces that all he said was true. The two opposing kinds of pride confronting one another I can see even in this Bastille. The gentleman's, all negligent indifference, the peasant's, all trodden-down sentiment and passionate revenge. You know, doctor, that it is among the rights of these nobles to harness us common dogs to carts and drive us. They so harnessed him and drove him. You know that it is among their rights to keep us in their grounds all night, quieting the frogs, in order that their noble sleep might not be disturbed. They kept him out in the unwholesome mists at night, and ordered him back into harness in the day. But he was not persuaded. No taken out of harness one day at noon to feed, if he could find food. He sobbed twelve times, once for every stroke of the bell, and died in her bosom. Nothing human could have held life in the boy but his determination to tell all his wrong. He forced back the gathering shadows of death, as he forced his clenched right hand to remain clenched and to cover his wound. Then, with that man's permission, and even with his aid, his brother took her away. In spite of what I know she must have told his brother, and what that is will not be long unknown to you, doctor, if it is now, his brother took her away for his pleasure and diversion for a little while. I saw her pass me on the road. When I took the tidings home, our father's heart burst. He never spoke one of the words that filled it. I took my young sister, for I have another, to a place beyond the reach of this man, and where at least she will never be his vassal. Then I tracked the brother here, and last night climbed in. A common dog, but sword in hand. Where is the loft window? It was somewhere here. The room was darkening to his sight. The world was narrowing around him. I glanced about me and saw that the hay and straw were trampled over the floor, as if there had been a struggle. She heard me and ran in. I told her not to come near us till he was dead. He came in, and first tossed me some pieces of money, then struck at me with a whip. But I, though a common dog, so struck at him as to make him draw. Let him break into as many pieces as he will the sword that he stained with my common blood. He drew to defend himself, thrust at me with all his skill for his life. My glance had fallen but a few moments before on the fragments of a broken sword lying among the hay. That weapon was a gentleman's. In another place lay an old sword that seemed to have been a soldier's. Now lift me up, doctor, lift me up. Where is he? He is not here, I said, supporting the boy, thinking that he had referred to the brother. He, proud as these nobles are, he is afraid to see me. Where is the man who is here? Turn my face to him. I did so, raising the boy's head against my knee. But, invested for the moment with extraordinary power, he raised himself completely, obliging me to rise too, 
or I could not have still supported him. Marquis, said the boy, turned to him with his eyes opened wide and his right hand raised. In the days when all these things are to be answered for, I summon you and yours to the last of your bad race to answer for them. I mark this cross of blood upon you as a sign that I do it. In the days when all these things are to be answered for, I summon your brother, the worst of the bad race, to answer for them separately. I mark this cross of blood upon him as a sign that I do it. Twice he put his hand to the wound in his breast, and with his forefinger drew a cross in the air. He stood for an instant with the finger yet raised, and as it dropped, he dropped with it, and I laid him down dead. When I returned to the bedside of the young woman, I found her raving in precisely the same order of continuity. I knew that this might last for many hours, and that it would probably end in the silence of the grave. I repeated the medicines I had given her, and I sat at the bedside of the bed until the night was far advanced. She never abated the piercing quality of her shrieks, never stumbled in the distinctness or the order of her words. They were always, my husband, my father, and my brother, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Hush! This lasted twenty-six hours from the time when I first saw her. I had come and gone twice, and was again sitting by her when she began to falter. I did what little could be done to assist that opportunity, and by and by she sank into a lethargy and lay like the dead. It was as if the wind and rain had lulled at last, after a long, fearful storm. I released her arms, and called the woman to assist me to compose her figure and the dress she had torn. It was then that I knew her condition to be that of one in whom the first expectations of being a mother have arisen. And it was then that I lost the little hope that I had of her. "'Is she dead?' asked the Marquis, whom I will still describe as the elder brother coming booted into the room from his horse. Not dead, said I, but like to die. What strength there is in these common bodies, he said, looking down at her with some curiosity. There is prodigious strength, I answered him, in sorrow and despair. He first laughed at my words, and then frowned at them. He moved a chair with his foot near to mine, ordered the woman away, and said in a subdued voice, Doctor, Finding my brother in this difficulty with these hinds, I recommended that your aid should be invited. Your reputation is high, and as a young man with your fortune to make, you are probably mindful of your interest. The things that you see here are things to be seen and not spoken of. I listened to the patient's breathing and avoided answering. Do you honor me with your attention, doctor? Monsieur, said I, in my profession the communications of patients are always received in confidence. I was guarded in my answer, for I was troubled in my mind with what I had heard and seen. Her breathing was so difficult to trace that I carefully tried the pulse and the heart. There was life and no more. Looking round as I resumed my seat, I found both the brothers intent upon me. I write with so much difficulty, the cold is so severe. I am so fearful of being detected and consigned to an underground cell and total darkness that I must abridge this narrative. There is no confusion or failure in my memory. It can recall and could detail every word that was ever spoken between me and those brothers. She lingered for a week. Towards the last I could understand some few syllables that she said to me by placing my ear close to her lips. She asked me where she was, and I told her who I was, and I told her. It was in vain that I asked her for her family name. She faintly shook her head upon the pillow, and kept her secret, as the boy had done. I had no opportunity of asking her any question, until I had told the brothers that she was sinking fast, and could not live another day. Until then, though no one was ever presented to her consciousness save the woman and myself, one or other of them had always jealously sat behind the curtain at the head of the bed when I was there, but when it came to that they seemed careless what communication I might hold with her, as if, the thought passed through my mind, I were dying too. 
I always observed that their pride bitterly resented the younger brothers, as I call him, having crossed swords with a peasant, and that peasant a boy. The only consideration that appeared to affect the mind of either of them was the consideration that this was highly degrading to the family, and was ridiculous. As often as I caught the younger brother's eyes, their expression reminded me that he disliked me deeply for knowing what I knew from the boy. He was smoother and more polite to me than the elder, but I saw this. I also saw that I was an encumbrance in the mind of the elder, too. My patient died two hours before midnight, at a time, by my watch, answering almost to the minute when I had first seen her. I was alone with her when her forlorn young head drooped gently on one side, and all her earthly wrongs and sorrows ended. The brothers were waiting in a room downstairs, impatient to ride away. I had heard them, alone at the bedside, striking their boots with their riding whips and loitering up and down. At last she's dead, said the elder, when I went in. She is dead, said I. I congratulate you, my brother, were his words as he turned round. He had before offered me money, which I had postponed taking. He now gave me a rouleau of gold. I took it from his hand, but laid it on the table. I had considered the question, and had resolved to accept nothing. Pray excuse me, said I. Under the circumstances, no. They exchanged looks but bent their heads to me as I bent mine to them, and we parted without another word on either side. I am weary, 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 worn down by misery. I cannot read what I have written with this gaunt hand. Early in the morning the rouleau of gold was left at my door in a little box, with my name on the outside. From the first I had anxiously considered what I ought to do. I decided that day to write privately to the minister, stating the nature of the two cases to which I had been summoned, and the place to which I had gone. In effect, stating all the circumstances. I knew what court influence was, and what the immunities of the nobles were, and I expected that the matter would never be heard of, but I wished to relieve my own mind. I had kept the matter a profound secret even from my wife and this, too, I resolved to state in my letter. I had no apprehension whatever of my real danger, but I was conscious that there might be danger for others if others were compromised by possessing the knowledge that I possessed. I was much engaged that day and could not complete my letter that night. I rose long before my usual time next morning to finish it. It was the last day of the year. The letter was lying before me, just completed, when I was told that a lady waited who wished to see me. I am growing more and more unequal to the task I have set myself. It is so cold, so dark, my senses so benumbed, and the gloom upon me is so dreadful. The lady was young, engaging, and handsome, but not marked for long life. She was in great agitation. She presented herself to me as the wife of the Marquis saint Evremond. I connected the title by which the boy had addressed the elder brother with the initial letter embroidered on the scarf, and had no difficulty in arriving at the conclusion that I had seen that nobleman very lately. My memory is still accurate, but I cannot write the words of our conversation. I suspect that I am watched more closely than I was, and I know not at what times I may be watched. She had in part suspected and in part discovered the main facts of the cruel story, of her husband's share in it, and my being resorted to. She did not know that the girl was dead. Her hope had been, she said in great distress, to show her, in secret, a woman's sympathy. Her hope had been to avert the wrath of heaven from a house that had long been hateful to the suffering many. She had reasons for believing that there was a young sister living, and her greatest desire was to help that sister. I could tell her nothing but that there was such a sister. Beyond that, I knew nothing. Her inducement to come to me, relying on my confidence, had been the hope that I could tell her the name and place of abode, whereas to this wretched hour I am ignorant of both. These scraps of paper fail me. 
one was taken from me with a warning yesterday i must finish my record today she was a good compassionate lady and not happy in her marriage how could she be the brother distrusted and disliked her and his influence was all opposed to her she stood in dread of him and in dread of her husband too when i handed her down to the door there was a child a pretty boy from two to three years old in her carriage for his sake doctor she said pointing to him in tears i would do all i can to make what poor amends i can he will never prosper in his inheritance otherwise i have a presentiment that if no other innocent atonement is made for this it will one day be required of him what i have left to call my own it is little beyond the worth of a few jewels i will make it the first charge of his life to bestow with the compassion and lamenting of his dead mother on this injured family if the sister can be discovered she kissed the boy and said caressing him it is for thine own dear sake thou wilt be faithful little charles the child answered her bravely yes i kissed her hand and she took him in her arms and went away caressing him i never saw her more as she had mentioned her husband's name and the fate that i knew it i added no mention of it to my letter i sealed my letter and not trusting it out of my own hands delivered it myself that day that night the last night of the year towards nine o'clock a man in a black dress rang at my gate demanded to see me and softly followed my servant ernest defarge a youth upstairs when my servant came into the room where i sat with my wife o oh, my wife beloved of my heart my fair young english wife we saw the man who was supposed to be at the gate standing silent behind him an urgent case in the rue st honore he said it would not detain me he had a coach in waiting it brought me here it brought me to my grave when i was clear of the house a black muffler was drawn tightly over my mouth from behind and my arms were pinioned the two brothers crossed the road from a dark corner and identified me with a single gesture the marquis took from his pocket the letter i had written showed it to me burnt it in the light of a lantern that was held and extinguished the ashes with his foot not a word was spoken I was brought here. I was brought to my living grave. If it had pleased God to put in the hard heart of either of the brothers, in all these frightful years, to grant me any tidings of my dearest wife, so much as to let me know by a word whether alive or dead, I might have thought that he had quite not abandoned them. But now I believe that the mark of the Red Cross is fatal to them and that they have no part in his mercies and them and their descendants to the last of their race i alexandre manette unhappy prisoner do this last night of the year seventeen sixty seven in my unbearable agony denounce to the times when all these things shall be answered for i denounce them to heaven and to earth end of section seven International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meridiculous. International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 8, The Cauldron of Oil, by Wilkie Collins. About one French league distant from the city of Toulouse, there is a village called Croix d'Orade. In the military history of England, this place is associated with a famous charge of the 18th Hussars, which united two separated columns of the British army on the day before the Duke of Wellington fought the Battle of Toulouse. In the criminal history of France, the village is memorable as the scene of a daring crime, which was discovered and punished under circumstances sufficiently remarkable to merit preservation in the form of a plain narrative. 1. The Persons of the Drama 
In the year 1700, the resident priest of the village of croix was Monsieur Pierre Célestin Chaubard. He was a man of no extraordinary energy or capacity, simple in his habits and sociable in his disposition. His character was irreproachable. He was strictly conscientious in the performance of his duties, and he was universally respected and beloved by all his parishioners. Among the members of his flock there was a family named Siadou. The head of the household, Sardonin Siadou, had been long established in business at Quadrade as an oil manufacturer. At the period of the events now to be narrated, he had attained the age of sixty and was a widower. His family consisted of five children, three young men who helped him in the business, and two daughters. His nearest living relative was his sister, the widow Mirai. The widow resided principally at Toulouse. Her time in that city was mainly occupied in winding up the business affairs of her deceased husband, which had remained unsettled for a considerable period after his death through delays in realizing certain sums of money owing to his representative. The widow had been left very well provided for. She was still a comely attractive woman, and more than one substantial citizen of Toulouse had shown himself anxious to persuade her into marrying for the second time. But the widow Mirai lived on terms of great intimacy and affection with her brother Siadou and his family. She was sincerely attached to them, and sincerely unwilling, at her age, to deprive her nephews and nieces, by a second marriage, of the inheritance, or even of a portion of the inheritance which would otherwise fall to them on her death. Animated by these motives, she closed her doors resolutely on all suitors who attempted to pay their court to her with the one exception of a master butcher of Toulouse, whose name was Cantegrel. This man was a neighbor of the widow's, and had made himself useful by assisting her in the business complications which still hung about the realization of her late husband's estate. The preference which she showed for the master butcher was thus far of the purely negative kind. She gave him no absolute encouragement. She would not for a moment admit that there was the slightest prospect of her ever marrying him, but at the same time she continued to receive his visits, and she showed no disposition to restrict the neighborly intercourse between them, for the future within purely formal bounds. Under these circumstances, Sardinan Siadou began to be alarmed and to think it time to bestir himself. He had no personal acquaintance with Cantegrel, who never visited the village, and M. Chaubard, to whom he might otherwise have applied for advice, was not in a position to give an opinion. The priest and the master butcher did not even know each other by sight. In this difficulty, Siadou bethought himself of inquiring privately at Toulouse, in the hope of discovering some scandalous passages in Cantegrel's early life which might fatally degrade him in the estimation of the widow Mirai. The investigation, as usual in such cases, produced rumors and reports in plenty, the greater part of which dated back to a period of the butcher's life when he had resided in the ancient town of Narbonne. One of these rumors especially was of so serious a nature that Siadou determined to test the truth or falsehood of it personally by traveling to Narbonne. He kept his intention a secret, not only from his sister and his daughters, but also from his sons. They were young men, not over-patient in their tempers, and he doubted their discretion. Thus, nobody knew his real purpose but himself when he left home. His safe arrival at Narbonne was notified in a letter to his family. The letter entered into no particulars relating to his secret errand. It merely informed his children of the day when they might expect him back and of certain social arrangements which he wished to be made to welcome him on his return. He proposed on his way home to stay two days at castel for the purpose of paying a visit to an old friend who was settled there. According to this plan, his return to Quadorade would be deferred until Tuesday, the 26th of April, when his family might expect to see him about sunset, in good time for supper. He further desired that a little party of friends might be invited to the meal, to celebrate the 26th of April, which was a feast day in the village, as well as to celebrate his return. The guests whom he wished to be invited were first his sister, secondly Monsieur Chaubard, whose pleasant disposition made him a welcome guest at all the village festivals, thirdly and fourthly two neighbors, businessmen like himself, 
with whom he lived on terms of the friendliest intimacy. That was the party, and the family of Siadou took especial pains as the time approached to provide a supper worthy of the guests, who had all shown the heartiest readiness in accepting their invitations. This was the domestic position. These were the family prospects. On the morning of the 26th of April, a memorable day for years afterward in the village of Quadoad. 2. The Events of the Day Besides the curacy of the village church, good Monsieur Chaubard held some ecclesiastical preferment in the cathedral church of St. Stephen at Toulouse. Early in the forenoon of the 26th, certain matters connected with this preferment took him from his village curacy to the city, a distance which has been already described as not greater than one French league, or between two and three English miles. After transacting his business, Monsieur Chaubard parted with his clerical brethren, who left him by himself in the sacristy, or vestry, of the church. Before he had quitted the room in his turn, the beadle entered it, and inquired for the Abbé de Mariotte, one of the officiating priests attached to the cathedral. The Abbé has just gone out, replied Monsieur Chaubard. Who wants him? A respectable-looking man, said the beadle. I thought he seemed to be in some distress of mind when he spoke to me. Did he mention his business with the Abbé? Yes, sir. He expressed himself as anxious to make his confession immediately. In that case, said Monsieur Chaubard, I may be of use to him in the Abbé's absence, for I have authority to act here as confessor. Let us go into the church and see if this person feels disposed to accept my services. When they went into the church, they found the man walking backward and forward in a restless, disordered manner. His looks were so strikingly suggestive of some serious mental perturbation that Monsieur Chaubard found it no easy matter to preserve his composure when he first addressed himself to the stranger. I am sorry, he began, that the Abbé de Mariotte is not here to offer you his services. I want to make my confession, said the man, looking about him vacantly, as if the priest's words had not attracted his attention. You can do so at once, if you please, said Monsieur Chaubard. I am attached to this church, and I possess the necessary authority to receive confessions in it. Perhaps, however, you are personally acquainted with the Abbé de Mariotte? Perhaps you'd prefer waiting? No, said the man roughly. I would as soon, or sooner, confess to a stranger. In that case, replied Monsieur Chaubard, be so good as to follow me. He led the way to the confessional. The beadle, whose curiosity was excited, waited a little and looked after them. In a few minutes he saw the curtains, which were sometimes used to conceal the face of the officiating priest, suddenly drawn. The penitent knelt with his back turned to the church. There was literally nothing to see, but the beadle waited nevertheless, in expectation of the end. After a long lapse of time, the curtain was withdrawn, and the priest and penitent left the confessional. The change which the interval had worked in M. Chaubard was so extraordinary that the beadle's attention was altogether withdrawn in the interest of observing it from the man who had made the confession. He did not remark by which door the stranger left the church. His eyes were fixed on Monsieur Chaubard. The priest's naturally ruddy face was as white as if he had just risen from a long sickness. He looked straight before him with a state of terror, and he left the church as hurriedly as if he had been a man escaping from prison, left it without a parting word or farewell look, although he was noted for his courtesy to his inferiors on all ordinary occasions. Good Monsieur Chaubard, has heard more than he bargained for, said the beadle, wandering back to the empty confessional, with an interest which he had never felt in it till that moment. The day wore on as quietly as usual in the village of Quadoad. At the appointed time, the supper-table was laid for the guests in the house of Sardonel Siadou. The widow Miraille and the two neighbors arrived a little before sunset. Monsieur Chaubard, who was usually punctual, did not make his appearance with them, and when the daughters of Saranin Siadou looked out from the upper windows, they saw no signs on the high road of their father's return. Sunset came, and still neither Siadou nor the priest appeared. The little party sat waiting round the table, and waited in vain. Before long a message was sent up from the kitchen, representing that the supper must be eaten forthwith or be spoiled, and the company began to debate the two alternatives— 
of waiting or not waiting any longer. It is my belief, said the widow Mirai, that my brother is not coming home tonight. When Monsieur Chaubard joins us, we had better sit down to supper. Can any accident have happened to my father? asked one of the two daughters anxiously. God forbid, said the widow. God forbid, repeated the two neighbors, looking expectantly at the empty supper table. It has been a wretched day for traveling, said Louis, the eldest son. It rained in torrents all day yesterday, added Thomas, the second son. And your father's rheumatism makes him averse to traveling in wet weather, suggested the widow thoughtfully. Very true, said the first of the two neighbors, shaking his head piteously at his passive knife and fork. Another message came up from the kitchen, and peremptorily forbade the company to wait any longer. But where is Monsieur Chaubard? said the widow. Has he been taking a journey too? Why is he absent? Has anybody seen him today? I have seen him today, said the youngest son, who had not spoken yet. This young man's name was Jean. He was little given to talking, but he had proved himself on various domestic occasions to be the quickest and most observant member of the family. Where did you see him? asked the widow. I met him this morning on his way into Toulouse. Has he not fallen ill, I hope? Did he look out of sorts when you met him? He was in excellent health and spirits, said Jean. I never saw him look better. And I never saw him look worse, said the second of the neighbors, striking into the conversation with the aggressive fretfulness of a hungry man. What? This morning? cried Jean, in astonishment. No, this afternoon, said the neighbor. I saw him going into our church here. He was white as our plates will be when they come up. And what is almost as extraordinary, he passed without taking the slightest notice of me. Jean relapsed into his customary silence. It was getting dark. The clouds had gathered while the company had been talking, and at the first pause in the conversation, the rain, falling again in torrents, made itself drearily audible. Dear, dear me, said the widow, if it was not raining so hard, we might send somebody to inquire after good Monsieur Chaubard. I'll go and inquire, said Thomas Siadou. It's not five minutes' walk. Have up the supper. I'll take a cloak with me. And if our excellent Monsieur Chaubard is out of his bed, I'll bring him back to answer for himself. With those words, he left the room. The supper was put on the table forthwith. The hungry neighbor disputed with nobody from that moment, and the melancholy neighbor recovered his spirits. On reaching the priest's house, Thomas Siadou found him sitting alone in his study. He started to his feet, with every appearance of the most violent alarm, when the young man entered the room. I beg your pardon, sir, said Thomas. I'm afraid I've startled you. What do you want? asked Monsieur Chaubard, in a singularly abrupt, bewildered manner. Have you forgotten, sir, that this is the night of our supper? remonstrated Thomas. My father has not come back, and we can only suppose. At those words, the priest dropped into his chair again, and trembled from head to foot. Amazed to the last degree by this extraordinary reception of his remonstrance, Thomas Siadou remembered, at the same time, that he had engaged to bring Monsieur Chaubard back with him, and he determined to finish his civil speech as if nothing had happened. We are all of opinion, he resumed, that the weather has kept my father on the road, but that is no reason, sir, why the supper should be wasted, or why you should not make one of us, as you promised. Here is a good warm cloak. I can't come, said the priest. I'm ill. I'm in bad spirits. I'm not fit to go out, he sighed bitterly, and hid his face in his hands. Don't say that, sir, persisted Thomas. If you are out of spirits, let us try to cheer you, and you in your turn will enliven us. They are all waiting for you at home. Don't refuse, sir, pleaded the young man, or we shall think we have offended you in some way. You have always been a good friend to our family. Monsieur Chaubard again rose from his chair with a second change of manner, as extraordinary and as perplexing as the first. His eyes moistened as if the tears were rising in them. He took the hand of Thomas Siadou and pressed it long and warmly in his own. There was a curious mixed expression of pity and fear in the look which he now fixed on the young man. Of all the days in the year, he said very earnestly, don't doubt my friendship today. Ill as I am, I will make one of the supper party for your sake. And for my father's sake, added Thomas persuasively. 
let us go to the supper, said the priest. Tomas Siadu wrapped the cloak round him, and they left the house. Everyone at the table noticed the change in Monsieur Chaubard. He accounted for it by declaring, confusedly, that he was suffering from nervous illness, and then added that he would do his best, notwithstanding, to promote the social enjoyment of the evening. His talk was fragmentary, and his cheerfulness was sadly forced, but he contrived with these drawbacks to take his part in the conversation, except in the case when it happened to turn on the absent master of the house. Whenever the name of Saturnin Siadou was mentioned, either by the neighbors who politely regretted that he was not present, or by the family who naturally talked about the resting place which he might have chosen for the night, Monsieur Chaubard either relapsed into blank silence or abruptly changed the topic. Under these circumstances, the company, by whom he was respected and beloved, made the necessary allowances for his state of health. The only person among them who showed no desire to cheer the priest's spirits and to humor him in his temporary fretfulness being the silent younger son of Saturnin Siadou. Both Louis and Thomas noticed that from the moment when Monsieur Chaubard's manner first betrayed his singular unwillingness to touch on the subject of their father's absence, Jean fixed his eyes on the priest with an expression of suspicious attention, and never looked away from him for the rest of the evening. The young man's absolute silence at table did not surprise his brothers, for they were accustomed to his taciturn habits. But the sullen distrust betrayed in his close observation of the honored guest and friend of the family surprised and angered them. The priest himself seemed once or twice to be aware of the scrutiny to which he was subjected, and to feel uneasy and offended as he naturally might. He abstained, however, from openly noticing Jean's strange behavior, and Louis and Thomas were bound, therefore, in common politeness, to abstain from noticing it also. The inhabitants of Croix d'Orade kept early hours. Toward eleven o'clock, the company rose and separated for the night. Except the two neighbors, nobody had enjoyed the supper, and even the two neighbors, having eaten their fill, were as glad to get home as the rest. In the little confusion of parting, Monsieur Chaubard completed the astonishment of the guests at the extraordinary change in him by slipping away alone without waiting to bid anybody good night. The widow Mireille and her nieces withdrew to their bedrooms and left the three brothers by themselves in the parlor. Jean, said Thomas Siadou, I have a word to say to you. You stared at our good Monsieur Chaubard in a very offensive manner all through the evening. What did you mean by it? Wait till tomorrow, said Jean, and perhaps I may tell you. He lit his candle and left them. Both the brothers observed that his hand trembled, and that his manner, never very winning, was on that night more serious and more unsociable than usual. 3. The Younger Brother When post-time came on the morning of the 27th, no letter arrived from Saturnin Siadou. On consideration... The family interpreted this circumstance in a favorable light. If the master of the house had not written to them, it followed, surely, that he meant to make writing unnecessary by returning on that day. As the hours passed, the widow and her nieces looked out from time to time for the absent man. Toward noon, they observed a little assembly of people approaching the village. Ere long, on a nearer view, they recognized at the head of the assembly the chief magistrate of Toulouse, in his official dress. He was accompanied by his assessor, also in official dress, by an escort of archers, and by certain subordinates attached to the town hall. These last appeared to be carrying some burden, which was hidden from view by the escort of archers. The procession stopped at the house of Saturnin Siadou, and the two daughters, hastening to the door to discover what had happened, met the burden which the men were carrying, and saw, stretched on a litter, the dead body of their father. The corpse had been found that morning on the banks of the river Lair. It was stabbed in eleven places with knife or dagger wounds. None of the valuables about the dead man's person had been touched. His watch and his money were still in his pockets. Whoever had murdered him had murdered him for vengeance, not for gain. Some time elapsed before even the male members of the family were sufficiently composed to hear what the officers of justice had to say to them. When this result had been at length achieved, 
and when the necessary inquiries had been made, no information of any kind was obtained which pointed to the murderer in the eye of the law. After expressing his sympathy and promising that every available means should be tried to effect the discovery of the criminal, the chief magistrate gave his orders to his escort and withdrew. When night came, the sister and the daughters of the murdered man retired to the upper part of the house, exhausted by the violence of their grief. The three brothers were left once more alone in the parlor to speak together of the awful calamity which had befallen them. They were of hot southern blood, and they looked on one another with a southern thirst for vengeance in their tearless eyes. The silent younger son was now the first to open his lips. "'You charged me yesterday,' he said to his brother Thomas, with looking strangely at Mr. Chaubard all the evening, and I answered that I might tell you why I looked at him when tomorrow came. Tomorrow has come, and I am ready to tell you. He waited a little, and lowered his voice to a whisper when he spoke again. When Monsieur Chaubard was at our supper table last night, he said, I had it in my mind that something had happened to our father, and that the priest knew it. The two elder brothers looked at him in speechless astonishment. Our father has been brought back to us a murdered man, Jean went on, still in a whisper. I tell you, Louis, and you, Thomas, that the priest knows who murdered him. Louis and Thomas shrank from their younger brother, as if he had spoken blasphemy. Listen, said Jean. No clue has been found to the secret of the murder. The magistrate has promised us to do his best. But I saw in his face that he had little hope. We must make the discovery ourselves, or our father's blood will have cried to us for vengeance and cried in vain. Remember that and mark my next words. You heard me say yesterday evening that I had met Monsieur Chaubard on his way to Toulouse in excellent health and spirits. You heard our old friend and neighbor contradict me at the supper table and declare that he had seen the priest, some hours later, go into our church here with the face of a panic-stricken man. You saw, Thomas, how he behaved when you went to fetch him to our house. You saw, Louis, what his looks were like when he came in. The change was noticed by everybody. What was the cause of it? I saw the cause in the priest's own face when our father's name turned up in the talk round the supper table. Did Monsieur Chaubard join in that talk? He was the only person present who never joined in it once. Did he change it? On a sudden, whenever it came his way, it came his way four times, and four times he changed it, trembling, stammering, turning whiter and whiter, but still as true as the heaven above us, shifting the talk off himself every time. Are you men? Have you brains in your heads? Don't you see, as I see, what this leads to? On my salvation, I swear it, the priest knows the hand that killed our father. The faces of the two elder brothers darkened vindictively as the conviction of the truth fastened itself on their minds. How could he know it? They inquired eagerly. He must tell him himself, said Jean. And if he hesitates, if he refuses to open his lips, we must open them by main force. They drew their chairs together after that last answer and consulted for some time in whispers. When the consultation was over, the brothers rose and went into the room where the dead body of their father was laid out. The three kissed him in turn on the forehead, then took hands together and looked meaningly in each other's faces, then separated. Louis and Thomas put on their hats and went at once to the priest's residence, while Jean withdrew by himself to the great room at the back of the house, which was used for the purposes of the oil factory. Only one of the workmen was left in the place. He was watching an immense cauldron of boiling linseed oil. You can go home, said Jean, patting the man kindly on the shoulder. There is no hope of a night's rest for me after the affliction that has befallen us. I will take your place at the cauldron. Go home, my good fellow, go home. The man thanked him and withdrew. Jean followed and satisfied himself that the workman had really left the house. He then returned and sat down by the boiling cauldron. Meanwhile, Louis and Thomas presented themselves at the priest's house. He had not yet retired to bed, and he received them kindly, but with the same extraordinary agitation in his face and manner which had surprised all who saw him on the previous day. 
the brothers were prepared beforehand with an answer when he inquired what they wanted of him they replied immediately that the shock of their father's horrible death had so seriously affected their aunt and their eldest sister that it was feared the minds of both might give way unless spiritual consolation and assistance were afforded to them that night the unhappy priest always faithful and self-sacrificing where the duties of his ministry were in question at once rose to accompany the young men back to the house he even put on his surplice and took the crucifix with him to impress his words of comfort all the more solemnly on the afflicted women whom he was called on to succor thus innocent of all suspicion of the conspiracy to which he had fallen a victim he was taken into the room where jean sat waiting by the cauldron of oil and the door was locked behind him before he could speak thomas siadou openly avowed the truth it is we three who want you he said not our aunt and not our sister if you answer our questions truly you have nothing to fear if you refuse he stopped and looked toward jean and the boiling cauldron never at the best of times a resolute man deprived since the day before of such resources of energy as he possessed by the mental suffering which he had undergone in secret the unfortunate priest trembled from head to foot as the three brothers closed round him louis took the crucifix from him and held it thomas forced him to place his right hand on it jean stood in front of him and put the questions our father has been brought home a murdered man he said do you know who killed him the priest hesitated and the two elder brothers moved him nearer to the cauldron answer us on peril of your life said jean say with your hand on the blessed crucifix do you know the man who killed our father i do know him when did you make the discovery yesterday where at toulouse name the murderer at those words the priest closed his hand fast on the crucifix and rallied his sinking courage never he said firmly the knowledge i possessed was obtained in the confessional the secrets of the confessional are sacred if i betray them i commit sacrilege i will die first think said jean if you keep silence you screen the murderer if you keep silence you are the murderer's accomplice we have sworn over our father's dead body to avenge him if you refuse to speak we will avenge him on you i charge you again name the man who killed him i will die first the priest reiterated as firmly as before die then said jean die in that cauldron of boiling oil give him time cried louis and thomas earnestly pleading together we'll give him time said the younger brother there is the clock yonder against the wall we will count five minutes by it in those five minutes let him make his peace with god or make up his mind to speak they waited watching the clock in that dreadful interval the priest dropped on his knees and hid his face the time passed in dead silence speak for your own sake for our sakes speak said thomas siadou as the minute hand reached the point at which the five minutes expired the priest looked up his voice died away on his lips the mortal agony broke out on his face in great drops of sweat his head sank forward on his breast lift him cried jean seizing the priest on one side lift him and throw him in the two elder brothers advanced a step and hesitated lift him on your oath over our father's body the two brothers seized him on the other side as they lifted him to a level with the cauldron the horror of the death that threatened him burst from the lips of the miserable man in a scream of terror the brothers held him firm at the cauldron's edge name the man they said for the last time the priest's teeth chattered he was speechless but he made a sign with his head a sign in the affirmative they placed him in a chair and waited patiently until he was able to speak his first words were words of entreaty he begged thomas siadou to give him back the crucifix when it was placed in his possession he kissed it and said faintly i ask pardon of god for the sin that i am about to commit he paused and then looked up at the younger brother who still stood in front of him i am ready he said question me and i will answer 
Jean repeated the questions which he had put when the priest was first brought into the room. You know the murderer of our father? I know him. Since when? Since he made his confession to me yesterday, in the cathedral of Toulouse. Name him. His name is Contagrel. The man who wanted to marry our aunt? The same. What brought him to the confessional? His own remorse. What were the motives for his crime? There were reports against his character, and he discovered that your father had gone privately to Narbonne to make sure they were true. Did our father make sure of their truth? He did. Would those discoveries have separated our aunt from Contagrel if our father had lived to tell her of them? They would. If your father had lived, he would have told your aunt that Contagrel was married already, that he had deserted his wife at Narbonne, that she was living there with another man, under another name, and that she had herself confessed it in your father's presence. Where was the murder committed? Between Villefranche and this village. Cantegrel had followed your father to Narbonne, and had followed him back again to Villefranche. As far as that place, he travelled in company with others, both going and returning. Beyond Villefranche, he was left alone at the ford over the river. There, Cantegrel drew the knife to kill him before he reached home and told his news to your aunt. How was the murder committed? It was committed while your father was watering his pony by the bank of the stream. Cantegrel stole on him from behind and struck him as he was stooping over the saddle bow. This is the truth on your oath? On my oath, it is the truth. You may leave us. The priest rose from his chair without assistance. From the time when the terror of death had forced him to reveal the murderer's name, a great change had passed over him. He had given his answers with the immovable calmness of a man on whose mind all human interests had lost their hold. He now left the room, strangely absorbed in himself, moving with the mechanical regularity of a sleepwalker, lost to all perception of things and persons about him. At the door, he stopped, woke, as it seemed, from the trance that possessed him, and looked at the three brothers with a steady changeless sorrow, which they had never seen in him before, which they never afterward forgot. I forgive you, he said, quietly and solemnly. Pray for me when my time comes. With those last words, he left them. Four, the end. The night was far advanced, but the three brothers determined to set forth instantly for Toulouse and to place their information in the magistrate's hands before the morning dawned. Thus far, no suspicion had occurred to them of the terrible consequences which were to follow their night interview with the priest. They were absolutely ignorant of the punishment to which a man in holy orders exposed himself if he revealed the secrets of the confessional. No infliction of that punishment had been known in their neighborhood, for at that time, as at this, the rarest of all priestly offenses was a violation of the sacred trust confided to the confessor by the Roman Church. Conscious that they had forced the priest into the commission of a clerical offense, the brother sincerely believed that the loss of his curacy would be the heaviest penalty which the law could exact from him. They entered Toulouse that night, discussing the atonement which they might offer to Monsieur Chaubard, and the means by which they might best employ to make his future easy to him. The first disclosure of the consequences, which would certainly follow the outrage they had committed, was revealed to them when they made their deposition before the officer of justice. The magistrate listened to their narrative, with horror vividly expressed in his face and manner. "'Better you had never been born,' he said." than have avenged your father's death, as you three have avenged it. Your own act has doomed the guilty and the innocent to suffer alike. Those words prove prophetic of the truth. The end came quickly, as the priest had foreseen it, when he spoke his parting words. The arrest of Cantagrel was accomplished without difficulty the next morning. In the absence of any other evidence on which to justify this proceeding, the private disclosure to the authorities of the secret which the priest had violated became inevitable the parliament of languedoc was under these circumstances the tribunal appealed to and the decision of that assembly immediately ordered the priest and the three brothers to be placed in confinement as well as the murderer cantegral evidence was then immediately sought for which might convict this last criminal without any reference to the revelation that had been forced from the priest and evidence enough was found to satisfy judges 
whose minds already possessed the foregone certainty of the prisoner's guilt. He was put on his trial, was convicted of the murder, and was condemned to be broken on the wheel. The sentence was rigidly executed, with as little delay as the law would permit. The cases of Monsieur Chaubard and of the three sons of Siadou next occupied the judges. The three brothers were found guilty of having forced the secret of a confession from a man in holy orders. The cases of Monsieur Chaubard and of the three sons of Siadou next occupied the judges. The three brothers were found guilty of having forced the secret of a confession from a man in holy orders, and were sentenced to death by hanging. A far more terrible expiation of his offense awaited the unfortunate priest. He was condemned to have his limbs broken on the wheel, and to be, afterward, while still living, bound to the stake and destroyed by fire. Barbarous, as the punishments of that period were, accustomed as the population was to hear of their infliction, and even to witness it, the sentences pronounced in these two cases dismayed the public mind, and the authorities were surprised by receiving petitions for mercy from Toulouse and from all the surrounding neighborhood. But the priest's doom had been sealed. All that could be obtained by the intercession of persons of the highest distinction was that the executioner should grant him the mercy of death before his body was committed to the flames. With this one modification, the sentence was executed, as the sentence had been pronounced, on the curate of Quadoad. The punishment of the three sons of Siadou remained to be inflicted, but the people, roused by the death of the ill-fated priest, rose against this third execution with a resolution before which the local government gave way. The cause of the young men was taken up by the hot-blooded populace as the cause of all fathers and all sons. Their filial piety was exalted to the skies, their youth was pleaded in their behalf, their ignorance of the terrible responsibility which they had confronted enforcing the secret from the priest was loudly alleged in their favor. More than this, the authorities were actually warned that the appearance of the prisoners on the scaffold would be the signal for an organized revolt and rescue. Under this serious pressure, the execution was deferred, and the prisoners were kept in confinement until the popular ferment had subsided. The delay not only saved their lives, it gave them back their liberty as well. The infection of the popular sympathy had penetrated through the prison doors. All three brothers were handsome, well-grown young men. The gentlest of the three in disposition, Thomas Siadou, aroused the interest and won the affection of the head jailer's daughter. Her father was prevailed on, at her intercession, to relax a little in his customary vigilance, and the rest was accomplished by the girl herself. One morning, the population of Toulouse heard with every testimony of the most extravagant rejoicing, that the three brothers had escaped, accompanied by the jailer's daughter. As a necessary legal formality, they were pursued, but no extraordinary efforts were used to overtake them, and they succeeded accordingly in crossing the nearest frontier. Twenty days later, orders were received from the capital to execute their sentence in effigy. They were then permitted to return to France, on condition that they never again appeared in their native place or in any other part of the province of Languedoc. With this reservation, they were left free to live where they pleased and to repent the fatal act which had avenged them on the murderer of their father at the cost of the priest's life. Beyond this point, the official documents do not enable us to follow their career. All that is now known has now been told of the village tragedy at Quadorad. End of section eight. International Short Stories, Volume Two. English Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gaby Cowan. International Short Stories, Volume 2. English Stories, edited by William Patton. Section 9. The Burial of the Tithe, by Samuel Lover. Part 1. With the help of a surgeon, 
he might yet recover shakespeare it was a fine morning in the autumn of eighteen thirty two and the sun had not yet rubbed the grass of its dew as a stout built peasant was moving briskly along a small by-road in the country of tipperary the elasticity of his step bespoke the lightness of his heart and the rapidity of his walk did not seem sufficient even for the exuberance of his glee for every now and then the walk was exchanged for a sort of dancing shuffle which terminated with a short capering kick that threw up the dust about him and all the while he whistled one of those whismical jig tunes with which ireland abounds and twirled his stick over his head in a triumphal flourish then off he started again in his original pace and hummed a rollicking song and occasionally broke out into soliloquy why then and isn't the great day entirely for ireland that is in this blessed day who oh, your soul to glory but well to the job complete and here he got a caper devil a more they'll ever get and it's only a pity they ever got any but there's an end of them now they cut down from this out and here he made an appropriate down stroke of his shillelagh through a bunch of thistles that skirt the road where will be their grand doings now eh i'd like to know that where'll their be lazy livering servants oh woe and he sprang lightly over a stile and what will they do for their coaches and for here a lark sprang up at his feet and darted into the air with his thrilling rush of exquisite melody fate you've given me my answer sure enough my poor dillard that's as much as to say they may go whistle for them oh my poor fellows how pity ye is and here he broke into a turala loo and danced along the path then suddenly dropping into silence he resumed his walk and applying his hand behind his head cocked up his coffin and began to rub behind his ear according to the most approved peasant practice of assisting the power of reflection faith and it's myself that's puzzled to know well the proctors and the process savers and praises do at all by gorra they must go rough on the road since they won't be let to rough any more in the fields roving is all that is left for them for sure they couldn't turn to any honest trade after the courses they have been used to oh what a power of miscreants will be out of bread for the want of their old trade or false swearing why the vagabonds will be lost barring their scent to bot and indeed if a bridge could be built of false oaths by my soakings they could swear themselves there without wetting their feet here he overtook another peasant whom he accosted with the universal salutation of god save you god save you kindly was returned for an answer and is it yourself that's there mikey noonan said the one first introduced to the reader indeed it's myself and nobody else said noonan and where is it you're going this fine morning and is it yourself that's axing that same mikey why where is i would be going but to the bearing i thought so in trot it's yourself that is always ripe and ready for fun and a small blame to me why then it was a mighty complete thing whoever it was that thought of making a bearing out of it and don't you know not to my knowledge why then who'd you think now laid it all out Fake, i don't know maybe that's peter connolly no it wasn't though peter's a cute chap guess again well was it phil mulligan no it wasn't though you made a good offer at it sure enough for it wasn't phil it was his sister they're alive is it biddy it was 
it's cured to the one else oh she's the cutest creature in life there is not a trick out that's not up to and more besides by the powders or war she'd bait a field full of lawyers at scheming she's the devil's pity why dim but it was a great idea entirely you may say that in truth maybe it's we won't have the fun but see who's before us there isn't that old krugan sure enough by that why thin isn't he the real fine old cock to come so far to see the rights of the thing fax he was always the right sort sure in ninety eight as i hear he was maltreated a power and his place rummaged and himself almost killed because he couldn't inform on his neighbors god's blessing be an him and the likes of him that couldn't prove traitor to a friend in distress here they came up with the old man to whom they alluded he was the remains of a stately figure and his white hair hung at some length round the back of his head and his temples while a black and well-marked eyebrow overshadowed his keen grey eye the contrast of the dark eyebrow to the white hair rendered the intelligent cast of his features more striking as he was altogether a figure that one would not be likely to pass without notice he was riding a small horse at an easy pace and he answered the rather respectful salutation of the two foot passengers with kindness and freedom they addressed him as mr coogan while to them he returned the familiar term boys and of course it's going to the very end you are mr coogan and long life to you ay boys it is hard for an old horse to leave off his tricks old is it fakes and it's yourself that has more heart in you this blessed morning than many a man that's not half your age by that i'm not a cold boys though i kick up my heels sometimes well you'll never do it younger sir but sure why wouldn't you be there when all the country's going i hear and no wonder sure by the hole in my hat is enough so it is to make a sick man leave his bed to see the fun that'll be in it and sure it's right and proper and shows the spirit that is in the country when a man like yourself mr coogan joins the poor people in doing it i like to stand up for the right answered the old man and always was a good warrant to do that same said larry in his most laudatory tone will you tell us who's that furnish us and the road there asked the old man as he pointed to a person that seemed to make his way with some difficulty for he laboured under an infirmity of limb that caused a grotesque jerking action in his walk if walk it might be called why then don't you know him mr coogan by that i thought there wasn't a parish in the country that didn't know poor hoopy holigan it has been often observed before the love of sobriquet that the irish possess but let it not be supposed that their nicknames are given in a spirit of unkindness far from it a sense of the ridiculous is so closely interwoven in a irish nature that he will even jest upon his own misfortunes and while he indulges in a joke one of the few indulgences he can command the person that excites it may as frequently be the object of his open-heartedness as his mirth and is that hoppy hooligan said old coogan i often heard of him to be sure but i never seen him before oh then you may see him before and behind now said larry and indeed if he had a match for that odd skirt of his coat he wouldn't be the worse of it and if trot the corduroys themselves aren't a bit too good and there is the least taste in life of his whisht said the old man 
he's looking back and maybe he hears you not he in trot sure he's partly bothered how can he play the fiddle then and be bothered said coogan fakes so, and that's the very reason he is bothered sure he moiders the ears off of him entirely with the noise of his own fiddle oh he's a powerful fiddler so i often heard indeed said the old man he bangs all the fiddlers in the country and is in the greatest request added noonan yet he looks tattered enough said old coogan sure you never seen a well-dressed fiddler yet said larry indeed and now you remind me i believe not said the old man i suppose they all get more kicks than half pence as the saying is devil a many kicks hooligan gets he is a great favourite entirely why is he in such distress then asked coogan fate he's not in distress at all he's welcome everywhere he goes and has the best of eating and drinking the place affords wherever he is and picks up the coppers fast at the first and is no way necessitated in life though indeed it can't be denied as he limps along there that he has a great many ups and downs in the world this person of whom the preceding dialogue treats was a celebrated fiddler in these parts and his familiar name of hoopy holligan was acquired as the reader may already have perceived from his limping gait this limp was a consequence of a broken leg which was one of the consequences of an affray which is a certain consequence of a fair in tipperary hooligan was a highly characteristic specimen of an irish fiddler as larry lanigan said you never seen a well-dressed fiddler yet but hooligan was a particularly ill-fledged bird of the musical tribe his corduroys have already been hinted at by larry as well as his coat which had lost half the skirt thereby partially revealing the aforesaid corduroys or if one might be permitted to indulge in an image the half skirt that remained served to produce a partial eclipse of the disc of corduroy this was what we painters call picturesque by the way the vulgar are always amazed that some tattered remains of anything is more prized by the painter than the freshest production in all its gloss of novelty the fiddler's stockings too in the neglected falling of their folds round his leg and the wisp of a straw that fringed the opening of his gaping brogues were valuable additions to the picture and his hat but stop let me not presume his hat it would be a vain attempt to describe there are two things not to be described which to know what they are you must see these two things are taglioni's dancing and an irish fiddler's hat the one is a wonder in action the other an enigma in form hooligan's fiddle was a great curiosity as himself and like its master somewhat the worse of wear it had been broken some score of times and yet by dint of glue was continued in what an antiquary could call a fine state of preservation that is to say there was rather more of glue than wood in the article the stringing of the instrument was a great a piece of patchwork as itself and exhibited great ingenuity on the part of its owner many was the knot above the fingerboard and below the bridge that is when the fiddle was in the best order for in case of fractures on the field of action that is to say at way patron or fair where the fiddler unlike the girl he was playing for had no two strings to his bow in such case i say the old string should be knotted whatever it might require to be and i have heard it insinuated that the music was not a bit the worst of it indeed the only economy that poor hooligan ever practised was in the strings of his fiddle 
and those were an admirable exemplification of the proverb of making both ends meet hooligan's waistcoat too was a curiosity or rather a cabinet of curiosities for he appropriated its pockets to various purposes snuff resin tobacco a clasp knife with a half blade a piece of flint a tooth-in and some bits of twine and ends of fiddle strings were all huddled together promiscuously hooligan himself called his waistcoat noah's ark for as he said himself there was a little of everything in it barring money and that would never stay in his company his fiddle partly enfolded in a scanty bit of old vase was tucked under his left arm and his right was employed in helping him to hobble along by means of a black thorn stick when he was overtaken by the three travellers already named and saluted by all with the addition of a query as to where he was going and where would i be going but the verein said hooligan trot is the same answer i expected said lanigan it would be nothing at all without you i've played at many weddings said hooligan but i'm thinking there will be more fun at this verein than any ten weddings indeed you may say that hoppy agra said noonan why din hoppy jewel said lanigan what did the skirt of your coat do to you that you left it behind you and wouldn't let it see the fun did then i'll tell you larry my boy i was going last night by the by road that runs up the back of the old house nigh hand the witty cases and i hear that people was living in it since i travelled the road last and so i opened the old iron gate that was as stiff in the hinge as a miser's fist and the road ladding up to the house looking as lonely as a churchyard and the grass growing out through it and says i to myself i'm thinking it's few darkness your doors says i god be with the time the old squire was here that stayed at home and didn't go abroad out his own country letting the fine stately old place go to rack and ruin and faith i was turning back and i wish i did when i see a man coming down the road and so i waited till he came up to me and i asked him if any one was up at the house jeez says he and with that i hear terrible barking entirely and a great big lump of a dog turned the corner of the house and stood crawling at me i'm afraid these dogs in it says i to the man jeez said he but they're quiet so with that i wind my way and he wind his way but my jewels the minute i got into the yard nine great vagabonds of dogs fell on me and i thought they'd ate me alive and so they would i believe only i had a cold bones of mate and some practice that mrs mcgrain god bless her made me put in my pocket when i was going the road as i was leaving her house that morning after the christening that was in it and sure enough lashings and lavings was there oh that's the woman has a heart as big as a king's and her husband too in truth he's a decent man and keeps mightily fine drink in his house well as i was saying the cold maid and pratis was in my pocket and by god the thieving murdering villains of dogs may a dart at the pocket and dragged it clan off and thin my dear with fighting among themselves striving to come at the maid the skirt of my coat was in smithereens in one minute devil a lie in it not a tatter if i was left together and it's only a wonder i came off with my life fade i think so said lanigan and wasn't it mightily providential they didn't come at the fiddle sure what would the country do then sure enough you may say that said hooligan and then my bread would be gone as well as my maid but think of the unnatural vagabond that told me the dogs was quiet 
sure he came back while i was there and i ups and i told him what a shame it was to tell me the dogs was quiet so they are quiet says he sure there is nine of them and only seven of them bites thank you says i there was something irresistibly comic in the quiet manner that hooligan said thank you says i and the account of his canine adventure altogether excited much mirth amongst his auditors as they pursued their journey many a joke was passed and repartee returned and the laugh rang loudly and often from the merry little group as they trudged along in the course of the next mile's march their numbers were increased by some half dozen that one by one suddenly appeared by leaping over the hedge on the road or crossing a stile from some neighboring path all these newcomers pursued the same route and each gave the same answer when asked where he was going it was universally this why then where could i be going but to the bearing at a neighboring confluence of roads straggling parties of from four to five were seen in advance and approaching in the rear and the highway soon began to wear the appearance it is wont to do on the occasion of a patron a fair or a market day larry lanigan was in evident enjoyment at this increase of numbers and as the crowd thickened his exultation increased and he often repeated his ejaculation already noticed in larry's opening soliloquy why then and isn't it a great day entirely for ireland and now horsemen were more frequently appearing and their number soon amounted to almost a cavalcade and sometimes a car that is to say the car common to the country for agricultural purposes might be seen bearing a cargo of women videli said the wood woman herself and her rosy-cheeked daughters and maybe a cousin or two with an aide-de-camp on to assist in looking after the young ladies the roughness of the motion of this primitive vehicle was rendered as accommodating as possible to the gentler sex by a plentiful shake-down of clean straw on the car over which a feather bed was laid and the best quilt in the house over that to make all smart possibly a piece of hexagon patchwork of the mistress herself in which the trattiest calico pattern served to display the taste of the rural sempstress and stimulated the rising generation to feats of needlework the car was always provided with a driver who took such care upon himself for a reason he had he was almost universally what is called in ireland a clean boy that is to say a well-made good-looking young fellow whose eyes were not put into his head for nothing and these same eyes might be seen wandering backwards occasionally from his immediate charge the dumb base to take a squint at some or maybe one of his passengers this explains the reason he had for becoming a driver sometimes he sat on the crupper of the horse resting his feet on the shafts of the car and bending down his head to say something tender to the colleen that sat next to him totally negligent of his duty as guide sometimes when the girl he wanted to be sweet on was seated at the back of the car this relieved the horse from the additional burden of his driver and the clean boy could lift the horse head and fall in the rear to the luther the creature depending on the occasional hop or woo for the guidance of the beast when a too near proximity to the dike by the roadside warned him of the necessity of his interference sometimes he was called to his duty by the open remonstrance of either the mother or the aunt or maybe a mischievous cousin as does why then dinny what are you about at all at all god between me and harm if you weren't within an inch of putting us all in the gripe of the ditch array leave off your gossiping there 
and mind the horse will you a pretty thing if you'd be if my bones was broke what are you doing there at all at the back of the car when it's at the base head you ought to be arrah sure the base knows the way herself fax i believe so for it's little beholden to you she's for the showing her ah murder there we are in the gripe at most lave over your screeching can't you and be quiet sure the poor creature only just went over to get a mouthful of the grass by the side of the ditch what business has she to be eating now because she's hungry i suppose and why isn't she fed better because rocks tails her oats dinny i seen you in the stable by the same token yesterday sure enough ma'am for i went there to look for my coat that was missing i thought it was the filly you wore after dinny said a cousin with a wink and dinny grinned and his sweetheart blushed while the rest of the girls tittered the mother pretended not to hear the joke and bidding dinny to go mind his business by attending the horse but lest i should tire my reader by keeping him so long on the road i will let him find the rest of his way as well as he can to a certain romantic little valley where a comfortable farmhouse was situated besides a small mountain stream that tumbled along noisily over its rocky bed and in which some dogs noisier than the stream were enjoying their morning bath the geese were indulging in dignified rest and silence upon the bank a cock was crowing and strutting with his usual swagger amongst his hens a pig was endeavouring to save his ears not from his rural tumult but from the teeth of a half terrier dog who was chasing him away from an iron pot full of potatoes which the pig had dared to attempt some impertinent liberties with and a girl was bearing into the house a pail of milk which she had just taken from the cow that stood placidly looking on an admirable contrast to the general bustle of the scene everything about the cottage gave evidence of comfort on the part of its owner and to judge from the numbers without and within the house you would say he did not want for friends for all as they arrived at his door greeted philemon o'hara kindly and philemon welcomed each newcomer with a heartiness that did honour to his grey hairs frequently passing to and fro busily engaged in arranging an ample breakfast in the barn appeared his daughter a pretty round-faced girl with black hair and the long and silky lashed dark grey eyes of her country where merriment loves to dwell and a rosy mouth whose smile served at once to display her good temper and her fine teeth her colour gets fresher for a moment and a look of affectionate recognition brightens her eye as a light young fellow springs briskly over the stepping stones that lead across the stream and trips lightly up to the girl who offers her hand in welcome who is the happy dog that is so well received by honor o'hara the prettiest girl in that parish or the next and the daughter of a snug man into the bargain it is the reader's old acquaintance larry lanigan and maybe larry did not give a squeeze extraordinary to the hand that was presented to him the father received him well also indeed for that matter the difficulty would have been to find a house in the whole district that larry would not have been welcome in so here you are at last larry said old o'hara i was wondering you were not here long ago and so i could i thank you kindly said larry only i overtook old hoppy here on the road and sure i thought i might as well take my time and wait for poor hoppy and bring my welcome along with me and here he shoved the fiddler into the house before him the girls will be glad to see the pair of jeers said the old man following the interior of the house was crowded with guests 
and the usual laughing and courting so often described as common to such assemblages were going forward amongst the young people at the farther end of the largest room in the cottage a knot of the older men of the party was engaged in the discussion of some subject that seemed to carry deep interest along with it and at the opposite extremity of the same room a coffin of very rude construction lay on a small table and around this coffin stood all the junior part of the company male and female and the wildness of their mirth and the fertility of their jest over this tenement of mortality and its contents might have well startled a stranger for a moment until he saw the nature of the deposit the coffin contained enshrouded in a sheaf of wheat lay a pig between whose open jaws a large potato was placed and the coffin was otherwise grotesquely decorated the reader will wonder no doubt at such an exhibition for certainly never was coffin so applied before and it is therefore necessary to explain the meaning of all this and i believe ireland is the only country in the world where the facts i am about to relate could have occurred it may be remembered that some time previously to the date at which my story commences his majesty's minister declared that there should be a total extinction of tithes this declaration was received in ireland by the great mass of the people with the utmost delight as they fancied they should never have tithes to pay again the peasantry in the neighbourhood of templemore formed the very original idea of burying the tithe it is only amongst an imaginative people that such a notion could have originated and indeed there is something highly poetical in the conception the tithe that which the poor felt the keenest that which they considered a tax on their industry that which they looked upon as an hereditary oppression that hateful thing they were told was to be extinct and in joyous anticipation of the blessing they determined to enact an emblematic interment of this terrible enemy i think it is not too much to call this idea a fine one and yet in the execution of it they invested it with the broadest marking of the grotesque such is the strange compound of an irish peasant whose anger is often vented in a jest and whose mirth is sometimes terrible i must here pause for a moment and request it to be distinctly understood that in relating this story in giving the facts connected with it and in stating what the irish peasants feelings are respecting tithe i have not the most distant notion of putting forward any opinions of my own on the subject in the pursuit of my own quiet art i am happily far removed from the fierce encounter of politics and i do not wish to offend against the feelings or opinions of any one in my little volume and i trust therefore that i may be permitted to give a sketch of a characteristic incident as it came to my knowledge without being mistaken for a partisan i tell the tale as it was told to me i have said a group of seniors was collected at one end of the room and as it is meet to give precedence to age i will endeavour to give some idea of what was going forward amongst them there was one old man of the party whose furrowed forehead compressed eyebrows peaked nose and mouth depressed at the corners at once indicated to a physiognomist a querulous temper he was one of your doubters upon all occasions one of the unfailing elements of an argument as he said himself he was doversome about everything and he had hence earned the name of daddy doversome amongst his neighbours well daddy began to doubt the probability that any such boon as the extinction of the tithes was to take place and said he was certain sure 
that's too good news to be true there are no indeed said another who was the very antithesis of daddy in his credulous nature sure didn't i see it myself in print i was told often that things was in print returned daddy dryly that come out lies after to my own knowledge but sure added a third sure didn't the prime ear himself lay it all out before the parliament what prime ear are you talking about man dear said daddy rather testily why the prime ear of his majesty and no less is that satisfaction for you eh well and who is the prime ear why the prime ear of his majesty i told you before you see he is the one that hears of everything that is to be done for the whole empire in particular and because he hears of everything that is the reason he's called the prime ear and a good reason it is well but what has that to do with the tides i ask you again said daddy with his usual pertinacity here he was about to be answered by the former speaker whose definition of the prime ear had won him golden opinions amongst the bystanders when he was prevented by a fourth orator who rushed into the debate with this very elegant opening all right their announces are setting me mad so jis are why i wonder any one i'd be such a fool as to argify with that crooked old disciple there meaning me said daddy i'd be sorry to contradict you sir said the other with an admirable mockery of politeness thank you sir said daddy with a dignity more comical than the other's buffonery you're kindly welcome daddy returned the aggressor sure you never believed anything yet and i wonder any one would throw away their time striving to rectify you come boys said o'hara interrupting the discourse with a view to prevent further bickering there is no use talking about the thing now for whatever way it is sure we are met to bury the tide and it's proud i am to see you all here to make merry upon the strength of it and i think i hear honour said this minute that everything is ready in the barn without so you'll have no difference of opinion about tackling to the breakfast or i am mistaken come my heart is the mate and the practice is crying who laid me away with you that's your sword and he enforced his summons to the feast by pushing his guests before him towards the scene of action end of section nine part one read by gabby cowan april two thousand fourteen wherefore means dot block spot dot c a international short stories volume two english stories this is a librebox recording all librebox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibreVox.org. Recording by Gabby Cowan. International Short Stories, Volume Two, English Stories, edited by William Patton. Section Ten, The Burial of the Tide, by Samuel Lover, Part Two. This was an ample barn, where tables of all sorts and sizes were spread loaded with viands of the most substantial character wooden forms three-legged stools broken-backed chairs etc etc were in requisition for the accommodation of the female portion of the company and the men attended first to their wants with a politeness which though deficient in the external graces of polished life did credit to their natures the eating part of the business was accompanied with all the clatter that might be expected to attend such an affair and when the eatables had been tolerably well demolished o'hara stood up in the midst of his guests and said 
he should propose to them a toast which he knew all the boys would fill their glasses for and that was to drink the health of the king and long life to him for seeing into the rights of the thing and doing such a power for them and more power to his elbow this toast was prefaced by a speech to his friends and neighbours upon the hardships of the tide in particular spice with the last taste in life of politics in general wherein the repeat of the union and daniel o'connell cut no inconsiderable figure yet in the midst of the rambling address certain glimpses of good sense and shrewd observation might be caught and the many and powerful objections he advanced against the impost that was to be extinct so soon were put forward with a force and distinctness that were worthy a better speaker and might have been found difficult to reply to by a more accustomed hand he protested that he thought he had lived long enough when he had witnessed in his own lifetime two such national benefits as the catholic emancipation bill and the abolition of tithes o'hara further declared he was the happiest man alive that day only in the regard of one thing and that was that his reverence father heli the priest was not there amongst them and certainly the absence of the pastor on an occasion of festivity in the house of a snug farmer is of rare occurrence in ireland but you see said o'hara when his reverence heard that it was we were going to do he thought it would be prettier on his part for to have nothing whatsoever to do with it in hand act or part and indeed boys that shows a great deal of good breeding in father healy this was quite agreed to by the company and after many cheers for o'hara's speech and some other toasts pertinent to the occasion the health of o'hara as founder of the feast with the usual addenda of long life prosperity etc to him and his was drunk and then preparations were entered into for the proceedings with the ceremony of the funeral i believe we have nothing to wait for now said o'hara since you won't have any more to drink boys so let us set about it at once and make a clean day's work of it oh we're not quite ready yet said larry lanigan who seemed to be a sort of master of the ceremonies on the occasion what's the delay asked o'hara why the chief murners is not arrived yet what murners are you talking about man said the other why you know at the grand bearing they have always thief murners and there's a pair that i ordered to be brought here for that same myself doesn't know anything about murners said o'hara for i never seen anything finer than the kinners at a bearing but larry's up to the ways of the quality as well as of his own sort but you wouldn't have kinners for the tide would you sure the kinners is to say all good they can of the departed and more if they can invent it but sure the devil a good thing at all they could say of the tide very neat was lies the word telling and so it would only the throwing away trouble true for you lanigan besides it's likely a grand bearing belonging to the quality to have chief murners and you know the tide was a quail to a lord or a king a most for power in a short time the murners as larry called them arrived in custody of half a dozen of larry's chosen companions to whom he had entrusted the execution of the mission these chief murners were two tight proctors who had been taken forcibly from their homes by the lanigan party and threatened with death unless they attended the summons of larry to be present at the bearing their presence was hailed with a great shout and the poor devils looked excessively frightened but they were assured by o'hara they had nothing to fear i depend on you mr o'hara for seeing us safe out of their hands said one of them for the other was dumb from terror so you may was the answer o'hara returned 
hurt nor harm shall be put on you i give you my word on that devil a harm said larry we only put you into a shoot of clothes that is ready for you and you may look as melancholic as you please for its murder you are to be well honour said he addressing o'hara's daughter have you got the mitre and vestments ready as i told you yes said honour here comes biddy mulligan with them from the house for biddy herself helped me to make them and who had a better right said larry when it was herself that laid it all out complete the whole thing from the beginning and sure enough but it was a bright thought of her faix he'll be the lucky man that gets pity yet you had better have her yourself i think said honour with an arch look at larry full of meaning and it's that same i've been thinking of for some time said larry laughing and returning honour's look with one that repaid it with interest but where is she at all oh here she comes with the dust and mike noonan after her trod trod he's following her about all this morning like a sucking calf i'm afraid mike is going to circumvent me with biddy but he'd better mind what he said here the conversation was interrupted by the advance of biddy mulligan and mike noonan after her bearing some grotesque imitation of clerical vestments made of coarse sacking and two enormous head dresses made of straw in the fashion of mitres these were decorated with black rags hung fantastically about them while the vestments were smeared over with black stripes in no very regular order come here said larry to the tight proctors come here until we put you into your regiments what are you going to do to us mr lanigan said the frightened poor wretch while his knees knocked together with terror we are just going to make a pair of bishops of you said lanigan and sure that's promotion for you oh mr o'hara said the proctor sure you won't let them tie us up in them sacks do you hear what he calls the elegant vestments we made on purpose for him they are sackcloth to be sure and why not seeing as how that you are to be the chief mourners and sackcloth and ashes is what you must be dressed in according to reason here my bog said the rollicking larry i'll be your valley the sham myself and he proceeded to put the dress on the terrified tight proctor oh mr lanigan dear said he don't murder me if you please murder you hurray who's going to murder you do you think i dirty my hands with killing a snake in tight proctor indeed that's true mr lanigan it could not be worth your while here now said larry hold your head till i put the mitre on you and make you a bishop complete but wait a bit trot i was nine for getting the ashes and that would have been a great loss to both of you because you wouldn't be right mourners at all without them and the people would think you weren't only pretending this last bit of larry's waggery produced great merriment amongst the bystanders for the unfortunate tight proctors were looking at that moment most doleful examples of wretchedness a large showful of turfed ashes was now shaken over their heads and then they were decorated with their mitres toot man said larry to one of them don't trimble like a dog in a wet sack oh thin look at him how pale he's turned the dirty coward that he is i'll tell you we're not going to do any hurt so you needn't be looking in such martial dread by gore you're as white as a penthord of curds in a swift's fist with many such jokes at the expense of the tight proctors they were attired in their caricature robes and mitres and presented with a pair of pitchforks by the way of crossiers and were recommended at the same time to make hail while the sun shone because the fine weather would be laving them soon 
with many other bitter sarcasms conveyed in the language of ridicule the procession was now soon arranged and as they had their chief mourners it was thought a good point of contrast to have their chief rejoices as well to this end in a large cart they put a sow and her litter of pigs decorated with ribbons a sheaf of wheat standing proudly erect a bowl of large potatoes which at honor sohara's suggestion were boiled that they might be laughing on the occasion and over this was hung a rude banner on which was written we may stay at home now in this card hoppy hooligan the fiddler with a piper as a coadjutor rasped and squeaked their best to the tune of go to the devil and shake yourself which was meant to convey a delicate hint to the tides for the future the whole assemblage of people and it was immense then proceeded to the spot where it was decided the tide was to be interred as the most fitting place to receive such a deposit and this place was called by what they considered the very appropriate name of the devil's pit in a range of hills in the neighborhood where this singular occurrence took place there is a sudden gap occurs in the outline of the ridge which is stated to have been formed by his sable majesty taking a bite out of the mountain whether it was a spite of hunger that had made him do so is not ascertained but he evidently did not consider it very savoury morsel for it is said he spat it out again and the rejected morsel forms the rock of cashel such is the wild legend of this wild spot and here was the interment of the tide to be achieved as an appropriate addition to the devil's bid the procession now moved onward and as it proceeded its numbers were considerably augmented its approach was looked for by a scout on every successive hill it came within sight of and a wild halloo or the winding of a cow's horn immediately succeeded which called forth scores of fresh attendants upon the bearing thus their numbers were increased every quarter of a mile they went until on their arriving at the foot of the hill which they were to ascend to reach their final destination the multitude assembled presented a most imposing appearance in the course of their march the great point of attraction for the young men and the women was the cart that bore the piper and fiddler and the road was rather danced than walked over in this quarter the other distinguished portion of the train was where the two tight proctors played their parts of chief mourners they were the delight of all the little ragged urchins in the country the half-naked young vagabonds hung on their flanks plunk at their vestments made wry faces at them called them by many ridiculous names and an occasional lump of clay was slyly flung at their mitres which were too tempting a cock shot to be resisted the multitude now round up the hill and the mingling of laughter of singing and shouting produced a wild compound of sound that rang far and wide as they doubled an angle in the road which opened the devil's pit full upon their view they saw another crowd assembled there which consisted of persons from the other side of the hills who could not be present at the breakfast nor join the procession but who attended upon the spot where the interment was to take place as soon as the approach of the funeral train was perceived from the top of the hill the mass of people there sent forth a shout of welcome which was returned by those from below short space now served to bring both parties together and the digging of a grave did not take long with such a plenty of able hands for the purpose come boys said larry lanigan to two or three of his companions while they are digging the grave here we'll go cut some sods to put over it when the thieving tide is buried 
not for any respect i have for it in particular but that we may have the place smooth and clean to dance over afterwards and may i never shuffle the brogue again if myself and honor o'hara won't be the first pair that'll set you a pattern all was soon ready for the interment the tight coffin was lowered into the pit and the shouted that rent the air was terrific as they were about to fill up the grave with earth their wild hurrah that had rung out so loudly was answered by a fierce shout at some distance and all eyes were turned towards the quarter whence it arose to see from whom it proceeded for it was evidently a solitary voice that had thus arrested their attention toiling up the hill supporting himself with a staff and bearing a heavy load in a wallet slung over his shoulders appeared an elderly man whose dress proclaimed him at once to be a person who depended on eleemosynary contributions for his subsistence and many when they caught the first glimpse of him proclaimed at once that it was tatter the road was coming tatter the roadway the very descriptive name that had been applied to this poor creature for he was always travelling about the highways he never rested even at night in any of the houses of the peasants who would have afforded him shelter but seemed to be possessed by a restless spirit that urged him to constant motion of course the poor creature sometimes slept but it must have been under such shelter as a hedge or cave or gravel pit might afford for in the habitation of man he was never seen to sleep and indeed i never knew any one who bad seen this strange thing in the act of sleep this fact attached a sort of mysterious character to the wanderer and many would tell you that he wasn't right and firmly believe that he never slept at all his mind was unsettled and though he never became offensive in any degree from his mental aberration yet the nature of his distemper often induced him to do very extraordinary things and whenever the gift of speech was upon him for he was habitually taciturn he would make an outpouring of some rhapsody in which occasional bursts of very powerful language and striking imagery could occur indeed the peasants said that sometimes could make their hand stand on end to hear tatter the road make an oration this poor man history as far as i could learn was a very melancholy one in the rebellion of ninety eight his cabin had been burned over his head by the germani after every violation that could disgrace his heart had been committed he and his son then little more than a boy had attempted to defend their hut, and they were both left for dead his wife and his daughter a girl of sixteen were also murdered the wretched father unfortunately recovered his life but his reason was gone for ever even in the midst of his poverty and madness there was a sort of respect attached to this singular man though depending on charity for his meat and drink he could not well be called a beggar for he never asked for anything even on the road when some passenger ignorant of his wild history saw the poor wanderer a piece of money was often bestowed to the silent appeal of his rags his haggard features and his grisly hair and beard thus eternally up and down the country was he moving about and hence his name of tatter the road it was not long until the old man gained the summit of the hill but while he was approaching many were the wonders that in the name of fortune could have brought tatter the road there and by that said one he's pulling foot of a great rate and it's wonderful how an old cop like him can clamber up the hill so fast Aye, said another and with the weight he's carrying too sure enough said a third fix 
he's got a fine love in his wallet to-day whish said o'hara here he comes and his ears are as sharp as needles and his eyes too said a woman lord be good to me did you ever see poor tatter's eyes look so terrible bright afore and indeed this remark was not uncalled for for the eyes of the old man almost gleamed from under the shaggy brows that were darkly bent over them as with long strides he approached the crowd which opened before him and he stalked up to the side of the grave and threw down the ponderous wallet which fell to the ground with a heavy crash you were going to close the grave too soon were the first words he uttered sure when the tide it wasn't buried what more have we to do said one of the bystanders hush you have put the tide in the grave but will it stay there why indeed said larry lanigan i think he be a bold resurrection man that would come to rise it i have brought you something here to lie heavy on it and it will never rise more said the maniac striking forth his arm fiercely and clenching his hand firmly and what have you brought us akra said o'hara kindly to him look here said the other unfolding his wallet and displaying five or six large stones some were tempted to laugh but a mysterious dread of the wild being before them prevented any outbreak of mirth god help ye creature said a woman so loud as to be heard he has brought a bag full of stones to throw up at the tides to keep them down oh wish wish a poor creature ah stones said the maniac but do you know what the stones these are look woman and his manner became intensely impressive from the excitement even of madness under which was acting look i say there is not a stone there that's not a curse ay a curse so heavy that nothing can ever rise that falls under it oh i don't want to say against it dear said the woman the maniac did not seem to notice her submissive answer but pursuing his train of madness continued his address in his native tongue whose figurative and poetical construction was heightened in its effect by a manner and action almost theatrically descriptive you all remember the window dancy the first choice of her bosom was long gone but the sound she loved was left to her and her heart was not quite lonely and at the widow's heart there was still a welcome for the stranger and the son of her heart made his choice like the father before him and the joy of the widow's house was increased for the son of her heart was happy and in due time the widow welcomed the fair-haired child of her son to the world and a dream of her youth came over her as she saw the joy of her son and her daughter when they kissed the fair-haired child but the hand of god was heavy in the land and the fever fell hard upon the poor and the widow was again bereft for the son of her heart was taken and the wife of his bosom also and the fair-haired child was left an orphan and the widow would have laid down her bones and died but for the fair-haired child that had none to look to but her and the widow blessed god's name and bent her head to the blow and the orphan that was left to her was the pulse of her heart and often she looked on his pale face with a fearful eye for hell was not on the cheek of the boy but she cherished him tenderly but the ways of the world grew crooked to the lone woman when the son was the staff of her age was gone and one trouble followed another but still the widow was not quite destitute and what has it brought the heavy stroke of distress and disgrace to the widow's door the tide the widow's cow was driven and sold to pay a few shillings the drop of milk was no longer in the widow's house and the tender child that needed the nourishment wasted away before the widow's eye 
like snow from the ditch and died and fast the widow followed the son of her heart and his fair hair boy and now the home of an honest race is a heap of rubbish and the bleak wind whistles over the heart where the warm welcome was ever found and the cold frog crouches under the ruins these stones are from that desolate place and the curse of god that follows oppression is on them and let them be cast into the grave and they will lie with the weight of a mountain on the monster that is buried for ever so saying he lifted a stone after a stone and flung them fiercely into the pit's den after a moment's pause upon its verge he suddenly strode away with the same noiseless step that he had approached and left the scene in silence End of section 10. Read by Gabby Cowan. April 2014. Wherefore means dot blogspot dot ca. International Short Stories, Volume 2. English Stories. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Kirkby. International Short Stories, Volume 2. English Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 11. The Knightsbridge Mystery by Charles Reed. Part 1. In Charles the Second's day, the Swan was denounced by the dramatists as a house where unfaithful wives and mistresses met their gallants. But in the next century, when John Clark was the freeholder, no special imputation of that sort rested on it. It was a country inn with large stables, horsed the Brentford coach, and entertained man and beast on journeys long or short. It had also permanent visitors, especially in summer, for it was near London, and yet a rural retreat, meadows on each side, Hyde Park at back, Knightsbridge Green in front. Amongst the permanent lodgers was Mr. Gardiner, a substantial man, and Captain Cowan, a retired officer of moderate means, had lately taken two rooms for himself and his son. Mr. Gardiner often joined the company in the public room, but the Cowans kept to themselves upstairs. This was soon noticed, and resented, in that age of few books and free converse. Some said, Oh, we are not good enough for him. Others inquired what a half-pay captain had to give himself airs about. Candor interposed and supplied the climax. Nay, my masters, the captain may be in hiding from duns, or from the runners. Now I think on it, the York mail was robbed scarce a night before his worship came a-hiding here. But the landlady's tongue ran the other way. Her weight was sixteen stone, her sentiments were her interests, and her tongue her tomahawk. "'Tis pity," said she one day, "'some folk can't keep their tongues from blackening of their betters. The captain is a civil-spoken gentleman. Lord send there were more of them in these parts, as takes his hat off to me whenever he meets me, and pays his reckoning weekly. If he has a mind to be private, what business is that of yours or ours? But curs must bark at their betters. Detraction, thus roughly quelled for certain seconds, revived at intervals whenever Dame Gust's broad back was turned. It was mildly encountered one evening by Gardiner. Nay, good sirs, said he, you mistake the worthy captain. To have fought at Blenheim and Malpaquet, no man has less vanity. Tis for his son he holds aloof. He guards the youth like a mother, and will not have him to hear our taproom jests. He worships the boy, a sullen lout, sirs, but parental love is blind. He told me once he had loved his wife dearly, and lost her young, and this was all he had of her, and, said he, I'd spill blood like water for him, my own the first. Then, sir, says I, I fear he will give you a sore heart one day. And welcome, says my captain, and his face like iron. Somebody remarked that no man keeps out of company who is good company, but Mr. Gardner parried that dogma. When young master is abed, my neighbour does sometimes invite me to share a bottle, and a sprightlier companion I would not desire. Such stories of battles and duels and love intrigues. 
Now there's an old fox for you, said one approvingly. It reconciled him to the captain's decency to find that it was only hypocrisy. I like not a man who wears a mask. He coughed, a hitherto silent personage, revealing his clandestine drunkenness and unsuspected wisdom at one blow. These various theories were still fermenting in the bosom of the swan when one day there rode up to the door a gorgeous officer, hot from the minister's leave in scarlet and gold, with an order like a starfish glittering on his breast. His servant, a private soldier, rode behind him, and, slipping hastily from his saddle, held his master's horse while he dismounted. Just then Captain Cowan came out for his afternoon walk. He started and cried out, "'Colonel Barrington!' "'Ah, brother!' cried the other, and instantly the two officers embraced, and even kissed each other, for that feminine custom had not yet retired across the channel. And these were soldiers who had fought and bled side by side, and nursed each other in turn, and your true soldier does not nurse by halves. His vigilance and tenderness are an example to women, and he rustleth not. Captain Cowan invited Colonel Barrington to his room, and that warrior marched down the passage after him, single file, with long brass spurs and sabre clinking at his heels. And the establishment ducked and smiled, and respected Captain Cowan for the reason we admire the moon. Seated in Cowan's room, the newcomer said heartily, Well, Ned, I come not empty-handed. Here is thy pension at last, and handed him a parchment with a seal like a poached egg. Cowan changed colour, and thanked him with an emotion he rarely betrayed, and gloated over the precious document. His cast-iron features relaxed, and he said, It comes in the nick of time, for now I can send my dear Jack to college. This led, somehow, to an exposure of his affairs. He had just a hundred and ten pounds a year, derived from the sale of his commission, which he had invested at fifteen per cent, with a well-known mercantile house in the city. So now, said he, I shall divide it all in three. Jack will want two parts to live at Oxford, and I can do well enough here on one. The rest of the conversation does not matter, so I dismiss it, and Colonel Barrington, for the time. A few days afterward Jack went to college, and Captain Cowan reduced his expenses and dined at the shilling ordinary, and, indeed, took all his moderate repasts in public. Instead of the severe and reserved character he had worn while his son was with him, he now shone out a boon companion, and sometimes kept the table in roar with his marvellous mimicries of all the characters, male or female, that lived in the inn or frequented it, and sometimes held them breathless with adventures, dangers, intrigues, in which a leading part had been played by himself or his friends. He became quite a popular character, except with one or two envious bodies whom he eclipsed. They revenged themselves by saying it was all Vargadocio. His battles had been fought over a bottle and by the fireside. The district east and west of Knightsbridge had long been infested with footpads. They robbed passengers in the country lanes, which then abounded, and sometimes on the King's Highway, from which those lanes offered an easy escape. One moonlit night, Captain Cowan was returning home alone from an entertainment at Fulham, when suddenly the air seemed to fill with a woman's screams and cries. They issued from a lane on his right hand. He whipped out his sword and dashed down the lane. It took a sudden turn, and in a moment he came upon three footpads, robbing and maltreating an old gentleman and his wife. The old man's sword lay at a distance, struck from his feeble hand. The woman's tongue proved the better weapon, for at least it brought an ally. The nearest robber, seeing the captain come at him with his drawn sword glittering in the moonshine, fired hastily and grazed his cheek, and was skewered like a frog the next moment. His cry of agony mingled with two shouts of dismay, and the other footpads fled, but even as they turned, Captain Cowan's nimble blade entered the shoulder of one and pierced the fleshy part. He escaped, however, but howling and bleeding. Captain Cowan handed over the lady and the gentleman to the people who flocked to the place. Now the work was done, and the disabled robber to the guardians of the public peace, who arrived last of all. He himself withdrew apart and wiped his sword very carefully and minutely with a white pocket handkerchief, and then retired. He was so far from parading his exploit that he went round by the park and let himself into the swan with his private key and was going quietly to bed when the chambermaid met him 
and up flew her arms with cries of dismay oh captain oh captain look at you smothered in blood i shall faint tush silly wench said captain cowan i am not hurt not hurt sir i'm bleeding like a pig your cheek your poor cheek captain cowan put up his hand and found that blood was really welling from his cheek and ear he looked grave for a moment then assured her it was but a scratch and offered to convince her of that bring me some lukewarm water and thou shalt be my doctor but barbara prithee publish it not next morning an officer of justice inquired after him at the swan and demanded his attendance at bow street at two that afternoon to give evidence against the footpads this was the very thing he wished to avoid but there was no evading the summons the officer was invited into the bar by the landlady and sang the gallant captain's exploit with his own variations the inn began to ring with cowan's praises indeed there was now but one detractor left the hostler daniel cox a drunken fellow of sinister aspect who had for some time stared and lowered at captain cowan and muttered mysterious things doubts as to his being a real captain etc which incoherent murmurs of a muddled-headed drunkard were not treated as oracular by any human creature though the stable boy once went so far as to say i sometimes almost thinks as how our dan do know summat only he don't rightly know what tis along o being always muddled in liquor cowan who seemed to notice little but noticed everything had observed the lowering looks of this fellow and felt he had an enemy it even made him a little uneasy though he was too proud and self-possessed to show it with this exception then everybody greeted him with hearty compliments and he was cheered out of the inn marching to bow street daniel cox who as accidents will happen was sober that morning saw him out and then put on his own coat take thou charge of the stable sam said he why where's best going at this time of day i be going to bow street said daniel doggedly at bow street captain cowan was received with great respect and a seat given him by the sitting magistrate while some minor cases were disposed of in due course the highway robbery was called and proved by the parties who unluckily for the accused had been actually robbed before cowan interfered then the oath was tendered to cowan he stood up by the magistrate's side and deposed with military brevity and exactness to the facts i have related but refused to swear to the identity of the individual culprit who stood pale and trembling at the dock the attorney for the crown after pressing in vain said quite right captain cowan a witness cannot be too scrupulous he then called an officer who had found the robber leaning against a railing fainting from loss of blood scarce a furlong from the scene of the robbery and wounded in the shoulder that let in captain cowan's evidence and the culprit was committed for trial and soon after peached upon his only comrade at large the other lay in hospital at newgate the magistrate complimented captain cowan on his conduct and his evidence and he went away universally admired yet he was not elated nor indeed content sitting by the magistrate's side after he had given his evidence he happened to look all round the court and in a distant corner he saw the enormous mottled nose and sinister eyes of daniel cox glaring at him with a strange but puzzled expression cowan had learned to read faces and he said to himself what is there in that ruffian's mind about me did he know me years ago i cannot remember him curse the beast one would almost think he is cudgelling his drunken memory i'll keep an eye on you he went home thoughtful and discomposed because this drunkard glowered at him so the reception he met with at the swan effaced the impression he was received with acclamations and now that publicity was forced on him he accepted it and reveled in popularity about this time he received a letter from his son enclosing a notice from the college tutor speaking highly of his ability good conduct devotion to study this made the father swell with loving pride jack hinted modestly that there were unavoidable expenses and his funds were dwindling he enclosed an account that showed how the money went the father wrote back and bade him be easy he should have every farthing required and speedily for said he my half year's interest is due now two days after he had a letter from his man of business begging him to call 
he went with alacrity making sure his money was waiting for him as usual his lawyer received him very gravely and begged him to be seated he then broke to him some appalling news the great house of brown molyneux and co had suspended payments at noon the day before and were not expecting to pay a shilling in the pound captain cowan's little fortune was gone all but his pension of eight pounds a year he sat like a man turned to stone then he clasped his hands with agony and uttered two words no more my son he rose and left the place like one in a dream he got down to knightsbridge he hardly knew how at the very door of the inn he fell down in a fit the people of the inn were round him in a moment and restoratives freely supplied his sturdy nature soon revived but with a moral and physical shock his lips were slightly distorted over his clenched teeth his face too was ashy pale when he came to himself the first face he noticed was that of daniel cox eyeing him not with pity but with puzzled curiosity cowan shuddered and closed his own eyes to avoid this blighting glare then without opening them he muttered what has befallen me i feel no wound laws forbid sir said the landlady leaning over him your honour did not swoon for once to show you was born of a woman and not made of naught but steel here you gaping loons and sluts help the captain to his room amongst ye and then go about your business this order was promptly executed so far as assisting captain cowan to rise but he was no sooner on his feet than he waved them all from him hoitily and said let me be it is the mind it is the mind and he smote his forehead in despair for now it all came back on him then he rushed into the inn and locked himself into his room female curiosity buzzed about the doors but was not admitted until he had recovered his fortitude and formed a bitter resolution to defend himself and his son against all mankind at last there came a timid tap and a mellow voice said tis only me captain prithee let me in he opened to her and there was barbara with a large tray and a snow-white cloth she spread a table deftly and uncovered a roast capon and uncorked a bottle of white port talking all the time the mistress says you must eat a bit and drink this good wine for her sake indeed sir twill do you good after your swoon with many such encouraging words she got him to sit down and eat and then filled his glass and put it to his lips he could not eat much but he drank the white port a wine much prized and purer than the purple vintage of our day at last came barbara's post diet but alack to think of your fainting dead away o oh, captain what is the trouble the tear was in barbara's eye though she was the emissary of dame cust's curiosity and all curiosity herself captain cowan who had been expecting this question for some time replied doggedly i have lost the best friend i had in the world dear heart said barbara and a big tear of sympathy that had been gathering ever since she entered the room rolled down her cheeks she put up a corner of her apron to her eyes alas poor soul she said ah i do know how hard it is to love and lose but bethink you sir tis the lot of man our own turn must come and you have your son left to thank god for and a warm friend or two in this place though they be but humble ah good wench said the soldier his iron nature touched for a moment by her goodness and simplicity and none i value more than thee but leave me a while the young woman's honest cheeks reddened at the praise of such a man your will's my pleasure sir she said and retired leaving the capon and the wine any little compunction he might have at refusing his confidence to this humble friend did not trouble him long he looked on women as leaky vessels and he had firmly resolved not to make his situation worse by telling the base world that he was poor many a hard rub had put a fine point on this man of steel he closed the matter too in his own mind i told her no lie i have lost my best friend for i've lost my money from that day captain cowan visited the tap-room no more and indeed seldom went out by daylight he was all alone now for mr gardiner was gone to wiltshire to collect his rents in his solitary chamber cowan ruminated his loss and the villainy of mankind 
and his busy brain revolved scheme after scheme to repair the impending ruin of his son's prospects it was there the iron entered his soul the example of the very footpads he had baffled occurred to him in his more desperate moments but he fought the temptation down and in due course one of them was transported and one hung the other languished in newgate by and by he began to be mysteriously busy and the door always locked no clue was ever found to his labors but bits of melted wax in the fender and a tuft or two of gray hair and it was never discovered in Knightsbridge that he often begged in the city at dusk, in a disguise so perfect that a frequenter of the Swan once gave him a groat. Thus did he levy his tax upon the stony place that had undone him. Instead of taking his afternoon walk as heretofore, he would sit, disconsolate, on the seat of a staircase window that looked into the yard, and so took the air and sun and it was owing to this new habit he overheard one day a dialogue in which the foggy voice of the hostler predominated at first he was running down captain cohen to a potboy the potboy stood up for him that annoyed cox he spoke louder and louder the more he was opposed till at last he bawled out i tell ye i've seen him sitting by the judge and i've seen him in the dock at these words captain cowen recoiled though he was already out of sight and his eye glittered like a basilisk's but immediately a new voice broke upon the scene a woman's thou foul-mouthed knave is it for thee to slander men of worship and give the inn a bad name remember i have but to lift my finger to hang thee so drive me not to it be gone to thy horses this moment thou art not fit to be among christians be gone i say or it shall be the worse for thee and she drove him across the yard and followed him up with a current of invectives eloquent even at a distance though the words were no longer distinct and who should this be but the housemaid barbara lamb so gentle mellow and melodious before the gentlefolk and especially her hero captain cowan as for daniel cox he cowered writhed and wriggled away before her and slipped into the stable captain cowan was now soured by trouble and this persistent enmity of that fellow roused at last a fixed and deadly hatred in his mind all the more intense that fear mingled with it he sounded barbara asked her what nonsense that ruffian had been talking and what he had done that she could hang him for but barbara would not say a malicious word against a fellow-servant in cold blood i can keep a secret said she if he keeps his tongue off you i'll keep mine so be it said cowan then i warn you i am sick of his insolence and drunkards must be taught not to make enemies of sober men nor fools of wise men he said this so bitterly that to soothe him she begged him not to trouble about the ravings of a sot dear heart said she nobody heeds dan cox some days afterward she told him that dan had been drinking harder than ever and wouldn't trouble honest folk long for he had the delusions that go before a drunkard's end why he had told the stable boy he had seen a vision of himself climb over the garden wall and enter the house by the back door the poor wretch says he knew himself by his bottle nose and his cowskin waistcoat and to be sure there is no such nose in the parish thank heaven for it and not many such waistcoats she laughed heartily but cowan's lip curled in a venomous sneer he said more likely twas the knave himself look to your spoons if such a face as that walks by night barbara turned grave directly he eyed her askant and saw the random shot had gone home captain cowan now often slept in the city alleging business mr gardiner wrote from salisbury ordering his room to be ready and his sheets well aired one afternoon he returned with a bag and a small valise prodigiously heavy he had a fire lighted though it was fine autumn for he was chilled with his journey and invited captain cowan to sup with him the latter consented but begged it might be an early supper as he must sleep in the city i'm sorry for that said gardiner i have a hundred and eighty guineas there in that bag and a man could get into my room from yours not if you lock the middle door said cowan but i can leave you the key of my outer door for that matter this offer was accepted but still mr gardiner felt uneasy there had been several robberies at inns and it was a rainy gusty night 
He was depressed and ill at ease. Then Captain Cowan offered him his pistols, and helped him load them, two bullets in each. He also went and fetched him a bottle of the best port, and, after drinking one glass with him, hurried away, and left his key with him for further security. Mr. Gardiner, left to himself, made up a great fire, and took a glass or two of the wine. It seemed remarkably heady, and raised his spirits. After all, it was only for one night. Tomorrow he would deposit his gold in the bank. He began to unpack his things, and put his nightdress to the fire. But by and by he felt so drowsy, that he did but take his coat off, put his pistols under the pillow, and lay down on the bed, and fell fast asleep. That night Barbara Lamb awoke twice, thinking each time she heard doors open and shut on the floor below her. But it was a gusty night, and she concluded it was most likely the wind. Still, a residue of uneasiness made her rise at five instead of six, and she lighted her tinder and came down with a rushlight. She found Captain Cowan's door wide open. It had been locked when she went to bed. That alarmed her greatly. She looked in. A glance was enough. She cried, Thieves! Thieves! and in a moment uttered scream upon scream. In an incredibly short time pale and eager faces of men and women filled the passage. Cowan's room, being open, was entered first. On the floor lay what Barbara had seen at a glance, his portmanteau rifled, and the clothes scattered about. The door of communication was ajar. They opened it, and an appalling sight met their eyes. Mr. Gardiner was lying in a pool of blood and moaning feebly. There was little hope of saving him. No human body could long survive such a loss of the vital fluid. But it so happened there was a country surgeon in the house. He stanched the wounds. There were three, and somebody or other had the sense to beg the victim to make a statement. He was unable at first, but under powerful stimulants, revived at last, and showed a strong wish to aid justice in avenging him. By this time they had got a magistrate to attend, and he put his ear to the dying man's lips, but others heard, so hushed was the room, and so keen the awe and curiosity of each panting heart. I had gold in my portmanteau, and was afraid. I drank a bottle of wine with Captain Cowan, and he left me. He lent me his key and his pistols. I locked both doors. I felt very sleepy, and lay down. When I woke, a man was leaning over my portmanteau. His back was toward me. I took a pistol, and aimed steadily. It missed fire. The man turned and sprang on me. I had caught up a knife, one we had for supper. I stabbed him with all my force. He wrested it from me, and I felt piercing blows. I am slain. Ah, I am slain. But the man, sir, did you not see his face at all? Not till he fell on me. But then, very plainly, the moon shone. Pray describe him. Broken hat. Yes. Hairy waistcoat. Yes. Enormous nose. Do you know him? Ah, the hostler Cox. There was a groan of horror and a cry for vengeance. Silence, said the magistrate. Mr. Gardiner, you are a dying man. Words may kill. Be careful. Have you any doubts? About what? That the villain was Daniel Cox? None whatever. At these words the men and women who were glaring with pale faces, and all their senses strained at the dying man and his faint yet terrible denunciation, broke into two bands. Some remained rooted to the place, the rest hurried with the cries of vengeance in search of Daniel Cox. They were met in the yard by two constables, and rushed first to the stables. Not that they hoped to find him there, of course he had absconded with his booty. The stable door was ajar, they tore it open. The grey dawn revealed Cox, fast asleep on the straw in the first empty stall, and his bottle in the manger. His clothes were bloody, and the man was drunk. They pulled him, cursed him, struck him, and would have torn him in pieces, but the constables interfered, set him up against the rail, like timber, and searched his bosom, and found a wound, then turned all his pockets inside out, amidst great expectation, and found three halfpence and the key of the stable door. End of section 11. Recording by Edward Kirkby, Warwick, England.
International Short Stories, Volume 2 English Stories This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Kirkby International Short Stories, Volume 2 English Stories Edited by William Patton Section 12 The Knightsbridge Mystery by Charles Reed Part 2 they ransacked the straw and all the premises and found nothing Then to make him sober and get something out of him they pumped upon his head till he was very nearly choked However, it told on him He gasped for breath a while and rolled his eyes and then coolly asked them had they found the villain? They shook their fists at him. Ah, we have found the villain red-handed I mean him as prowls about these parts in my waistcoat, and drove his knife into me last night. Wonder I didn't kill me out of hand. Have you found him amongst ye? This question met with a volley of jeers and execrations, and the constables pinioned him and bundled him off in a cart to Bow Street to wait examination. Meantime, two Bow Street runners came down with a warrant and made a careful examination of the premises. The two keys were on the table. Mr. Gardiner's outer door was locked. There was no money either in his portmanteau of Captain Cowan's. Both pistols were found loaded, but no priming in the pan of the one that lay on the bed. The other was primed, but the bullets were above the powder. Bradbury, one of the runners, took particular notice of all. Outside, blood was traced from the stable to the garden wall, and under this wall, in the grass, a bloody knife was found belonging to the Swan Inn. There was one knife less in Mr. Gardiner's room than had been carried up to his supper. Mr. Gardiner lingered till noon, but never spoke again. The news spread swiftly, and Captain Cowan came home in the afternoon very pale and shocked. He had heard of a robbery and murder at the Swan, and came to know more. The landlady told him all that had transpired, and that the villain Cox was in prison. Cowan listened thoughtfully and said, Cox, no doubt he is a knave, but murder? I should never have suspected him of that. The landlady pooh-poohed his doubts. Why, sir, the poor gentleman knew him, and wounded him in self-defence, and the rogue was found a-bleeding from that very wound, and my knife, as done the murder, not a stone's throw from him as done it, which it was that Dan Fox, and he'll swing for it, please God. Then, changing her tone, she said solemnly, "'You'll come and see him, sir?' "'Yes,' said Cowan, resolutely, with scarce a moment's hesitation. The landlady led the way and took the keys out of her pocket and opened Cowan's door. "'We keep all locked,' said she, half apologetically. "'The magistrate bade us, and everything as we found it. God help us. There, look at your portmanteau. I wish you may not have been robbed as well.' "'No matter,' said he. But it matters to me, said she, for the credit of the house. Then she gave him the key of the inner door, and waved her hand toward it, and sat down, and began to cry. Cowan went in and saw the appalling sight. He returned quickly, looking like a ghost, and muttered, This is a terrible business. It is a bad business for me and all, said she. He have robbed you too. I'll go bail. Captain Cowan examined his trunk carefully. Nothing to speak of, said he. I've lost eight guineas and my gold watch. There, 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 cried the landlady. What does that matter, dame? He has lost his life. Ah, poor soul. But twon't bring him back, you being robbed and all. Was ever such an unfortunate woman? Murder and robbery in my house? Travellers will shun it like a pest house. And the new landlord, he only wanted a good excuse to take it down altogether. This was followed by more sobbing and crying. Cowan took her downstairs into the bar and comforted her. They had a glass of spirits together, and he encouraged the flow of her egotism, till at last she fully persuaded herself it was her calamity that one man was robbed and another murdered in her house. Cowan, always a favourite, quite won her heart by falling into this view of the matter, and when he told her he must go back to the city again, for he had important business, and besides, had no money left, 
either in his pockets or his rifled valise. She encouraged him to go, and said kindly, indeed it was no place for him now. It was very good of him to come back at all, but both apartments should be scoured and made decent in a very few days, and a new carpet down in Mr. Gardiner's room. Sir Cowan went back to the city, and left his notable woman to mop up her murder. At Bow Street next morning, in answer to the evidence of his guilt, Cox told a tale which the magistrate said was even more ridiculous than most of the stories uneducated criminals get up on such occasions. With this single comment, he committed Cox for trial. Everybody was of the magistrate's opinion, except a single Bow Street runner, the same who had already examined the premises. This man suspected Cox, but had one qualm of doubt founded on the place where he had discovered the knife, and the circumstances of the blood being traced from that place to the stable, and not from the inn to the stable, and on a remark Cox had made to him in the cart. I don't belong to the house. I hadn't a got no keys to get in and out o' nights, and if I took a hatful of gold, I'd be off with it into another country, wouldn't you? Him as took the gentleman's money, he knew where twas, and he have got it. I didn't, and I hadn't. Bradbury came down to the swan, and asked the landlady a question or two. She gave him short answers. He then told her that he wished to examine the wine that had come down from Mr. Gardiner's room. The landlady looked him in the face, and said it had been drunk by the servants, or thrown away long ago. I have my doubts of that, said he. And welcome, said she. Then he wished to examine the keyholes. No, said she. There has been prying enough into my house. Said he angrily, You are obstructing justice. It is very suspicious. It is you that is suspicious, and a mischief-maker into the bargain, said she. How do I know what you might put into my wine, and my keyholes, and say you found it? You are well known, you Bow Street runners, for hanky-panky tricks. Have you got a search warrant, to throw more discredit upon my house? No, then pack, and learn the law before you teach it to me. Bradbury retired bitterly indignant, and his indignation strengthened his faint doubt of Cox's guilt. He set a friend to watch the swan, and he himself gave his mind to the whole case, and visited Cox in Newgate three times before his trial. The next novelty was that legal assistance was provided for Cox by a person who expressed compassion for his poverty and inability to defend himself, guilty or not guilty, and that benevolent person was Captain Cowan. In due course Daniel Cox was arranged at the bar of the Old Bailey for robbery and murder. The deposition of the murdered man was put in by the Crown, and the witnesses sworn who heard it and Captain Cowan was called to support a portion of it. He swore that he supped with the deceased, and loaded one pistol for him, while Mr. Gardiner loaded the other, lent him the key of his own door for further security, and himself slept in the city. The judge asked him where, and he said, 13 Farringdon Street. It was elicited from him that he had provided counsel for the prisoner. His evidence was very short and to the point. It did not directly touch the accused, and the defendant's counsel, in spite of his client's eager desire, declined to cross-examine Captain Cowan. He thought a hostile examination of so respectable witness, who brought nothing home to the accused, would only raise more indignation against his client. The prosecution was strengthened by the reluctant evidence of Barbara Lamb. She deposed that three years ago Cox had been detected by her stealing money from a gentleman's table in the Swan Inn, and she gave the details. The judge asked her whether this was at night. No, my lord, at about four of the clock. He is never in the house at night. The mistress can't abide him. Has he any key of the house? Oh, dear, no, my lord. The rest of the evidence for the Crown is virtually before the reader. For the defence, it was proved that the man was found drunk, with no money nor keys upon him and that the knife was found under the wall, and the blood was traceable from the wall to the stable. Bradbury, who proved this, tried to get in about the wine, but this was stopped as irrelevant. There is only one person under suspicion, said the judge, rather sternly. 
as counsel were not allowed in that day to make speeches to the jury but only to examine and cross-examine and discuss points of law daniel cox had to speak in his own defence my lord said he it was my double done it your what asked my lord a little peevishly my double there's a rogue prowls about the swan at nights which you couldn't tell him from me laughter from the court you needn't to laugh me to the gallows i tell you he have got a nose like mine laughter from the court clerk of arraigns keep silence in the court on pain of imprisonment and he have got a waistcoat the very spit of mine and a tumble-down hat such as i do wear i saw him go by and let hisself in through the swan with a key and i told sam pot next morning judge who is sam pot culprit why my stable boy to be sure judge is he in court culprit i don't know ah there he is judge then you better call him culprit hi sam sam here be i <laughs> loud laughter the judge explained calmly that to call a witness meant to put him in the box and swear him and that although it was irregular yet he should allow pot to be sworn if it would do the prisoner any good prisoner's counsel said he had no wish to swear mr pot well mr gurney said the judge i don't think he can do you any harm meaning in so desperate a case thereupon sam pot was sworn and deposed the cox had told him about his double when often and often before the murder long before that counsel for the crown did you ever see this double not i counsel i thought not daniel cox went on to say that on the night of the murder he was up with a sick horse and he saw his double let himself out of the inn the back way and then turned round and closed the door softly so he slipped out to meet him but the double saw him and made for the garden wall he ran up and caught him with one leg over the wall and seized a black bag he was carrying off the figure dropped it and he heard a lot of money chink that thereupon he cried thieves and seized the man but immediately received a blow and lost his senses for a time when he came to the man and the bags were both gone and he felt so sick that he staggered to the stable and drank a pint of neat brandy and he remembered no more till they pumped on him and told him he had robbed and murdered a gentleman inside the swan inn what they can't tell me said daniel beginning to shout is how i could know who has got money and who hasn't inside the swan inn i keeps the stables not the inn and where be my keys to open and shut the swan i never had none and where's the gentleman's money twas somebody in the inn has done it for to have the money and when you find the money you'll find the man the prosecuting counsel ridiculed this defence and inter alia asked the jury whether they thought it was a double the witness lamb had caught robbing in the inn three years ago the judge summed up very closely giving the evidence of every witness what follows is a mere synopsis of his charge he showed it was beyond doubt that mr gardner returned to the inn with money having collected his rents in wiltshire and this was known in the inn and proved by several and might have transpired in the yard or the tap-room the unfortunate gentleman took captain cowan a respectable person his neighbor in the inn into his confidence and revealed his uneasiness captain cowan swore that he supped with him but could not stay all night most unfortunately but he encouraged him left him his pistols and helped him load them then his lordship read the dying man's deposition the person thus solemnly denounced was found in the stable bleeding from a recent wound which seems to connect him at once with the deed as described by the dying man but here said my lord the chain is no longer perfect a knife taken from the swan was found under the garden wall and the first traces of blood commence there and continue to the stable and were abundant on the straw and on the person of the accused this was provided by the constable and others no money was found on him and no keys that could have opened any outer doors of the swan inn the accused had however three years before been guilty of a theft from a gentleman in the inn which negatives his pretence 
that he always confined himself to the stables it did not however appear that on the occasion of the theft he had unlocked any doors or possessed the means the witness for the crown barbara lamb was clear on that the prisoner's own solution of the mystery was not very credible he said he had a double or a person wearing his clothes and appearance and he had seen this person prowling about long before the murder and had spoken of the double to one pot pot deposed that cox had spoken of this double more than once but admitted he never saw the double with his own eyes this double says the accused on the fatal night let himself out of the swan and escaped to the garden wall there he cox came up with this mysterious person and a scuffle ensued in which a bag was dropped and gave the sound of coin and then cox held the man and cried thieves but presently received a wound and fainted and on recovering himself staggered to the stables and drank a pint of brandy the story sounds ridiculous and there is no direct evidence to back it but there is a circumstance that lends some color to it there was one blood-stained instrument and no more found on the premises and that knife answers to the description given by the dying man and indeed may be taken to be the very knife missing from his room and this knife was found under the garden wall and there the blood commenced and was traced to the stable here said my lord to my mind lies the defence look at the case on all sides gentlemen and undoubted murder done by hands no suspicion resting on any known person but the prisoner a man who had already robbed in the inn a confident recognition by one whose deposition is legal evidence but evidence we cannot cross-examine and a recognition by moonlight only and in the heat of a struggle if on this evidence weakened not a little by the position of the knife and the traces of blood and met by the prisoner's declaration which accords with that single branch of the evidence you have a doubt it is your duty to give the prisoner the full benefit of that doubt as i have endeavored to do and if you have no doubt why then you have only to support the law and protect the lives of peaceful citizens whoever has committed this crime it certainly is an alarming circumstance that in a public inn surrounded by honest people guarded by locked doors and armed with pistols a peaceful citizen can be robbed like this of his money and his life the jury saw a murder at an inn an accused who had already robbed in that inn and was denounced as the murderer by the victim the verdict seemed to them to be cox of impunity they all slept at inns a double they had never seen and detected accomplices they had all heard of they waited twenty minutes and brought in their verdict guilty the judge put on his black cap and condemned daniel cox to be hanged by the neck till he was dead end of section 12 recording by edward kirkby warwick england International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Edward Kirkby. International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 13. The Knightsbridge Mystery by Charles Reed. Part 3. After the trial was over, and the condemned man went back to the prison to await his execution, Bradbury went straight to 13 Farrington Street and inquired for Captain Cowan. No such name here, said the good woman of the house. But you keep lodgers? Nay, we keep but one, and he is no captain. He is a city clerk. Well, madam, it is not ideal curiosity, I assure you. 
but was not the lodger before him captain cowan laws no it was a parson your rakedly captains wouldn't suit the like of us twas a reverend clerk a grave old man he wasn't very well to do i think his cassock was worn but he paid his way keep late hours no not when he was in town but he had a country cure then you have let him in after midnight nay i keep no such hours i let him a pass-key he came in and out from the country when he chose i would have you to know he was an old man and a sober man and an honest man i'd wager my life on that and excuse me sir but who be you that you categorize me about my lodgers i'm an officer madam the simple woman turned pale and clasped her hands an officer she cried alack what have i done now why nothing madam said the wily bradbury an officer's business is to protect such as you not to trouble you for all the world there now i'll tell you where the shoe pinches this captain cowan has just sworn in a court of justice that he slept here on the fifteenth of last october he never did then our good parson had no acquaintances in the town not a soul ever visited him mother said a young girl peeping in i think he knew somebody of that very name he did ask me once to post a letter for him and it was to some man of worship and the name was cowan yes cowan twas i'm sure of it by the same token he never gave me another letter and that made me pay the more attention jane you are too curious said the mother and i am very much obliged to you my little maid said the officer and also to you madam and so he took his leave one evening all of a sudden captain cowan ordered a prime horse at the swan strapped his valise on before him and rode out of the yard post haste he went without drawing bridle to clapham and then looked round him and seeing no other horseman near trotted gently round into the borough then into the city and slept at an inn in holborn he had bespoke a particular room beforehand a little room he frequented he entered it with an air of anxiety but this soon vanished after he had examined the floor carefully his horse was ordered at five o'clock next morning he took a glass of strong waters at the door to fortify his stomach but breakfasted at uxbridge and fed his good horse he dined at beaconsfield halted at tame and supped with his son at oxford next day paid all the young man's debts and spent a week with him his conduct was strange boisterously gay and sullenly despondent by turns during the week came an unexpected visitor general sir robert barrington this officer was going out to america to fill an important office he had something in view for young cowan and came to judge quietly of his capacity but he did not say anything at that time for fear of exciting hopes he might possibly disappoint however he was much taken with the young man oxford had polished him his modest reticence until invited to speak recommended him to older men especially as his answers were judicious when invited to give his opinion the tutors also spoke very highly of him you may well love that boy said general barrington to the father god bless you for praising him said the other ah i love him too well soon after the general left cowan changed some gold for notes and took his departure for london having first sent word of his return he meant to start after breakfast and make one day of it but he lingered with his son and did not cross magdalen bridge till one o'clock this time he rode through dorchester benson and henley and as it grew dark resolved to sleep at maidenhead just after hurley bottom at four crossroads three highwaymen spurred on him from right and left your money or your life he whipped a pistol out of his holster and pulled at the nearest head in a moment the pistol misfired the next moment a blow from the butt of a horse pistol dazed him and he was dragged off his horse and his valise emptied in a minute before they had done with him however there was a clatter of hoofs and the robbers sprang to their nags and galloped away for the bare life as a troop of yeomanry rode up the thing was so common the newcomers read the situation at a glance and some of the best mounted gave chase 
The others attended to Captain Cowan, caught his horse, strapped on his valise, and took him with them into Maidenhead, his head aching, his heart sickening, and raging by turns. All his gold gone, nothing left but a few one-pound notes that he had sewn into the lining of his coat. He reached the swan next day in a state of sullen despair. A curse is on me, he said, my pistol misfire, my gold gone. He was welcomed warmly. He stirred with surprise. Barbara led the way back to his old room and opened it. He started back. Not there, he said with a shudder. Alack, Captain, we have kept it for you. Sure, you are not afeard. No, said he doggedly. No hope, no fear. She stirred but said nothing. He had hardly got into the room when, click, a key was turned in the door of communication. A traveller there, said he. Then bitterly, things are soon forgotten in an inn. Not by me, said Barbara solemnly. But you know our dame, she can't let money go by her. Tis our best room, mostly, and nobody would use it that knows the place. He is a stranger. He is from the wars. Will have it he is English, but talks foreign. He is civil enough when he is sober, but when he has got a drop he does maunder away to be sure, and sing such songs I never. How long has he been here? asked Cowan. Five days, and the mistress hopes that he will stay as many more, just to break the spell. He can stay or go, said Cowan. I am in no humour for company. I have been robbed, girl. You rob, sir? Not openly, I am sure. Openly, but by numbers, three of them. I should soon have sped one, but my pistol snapped fire just like his. There, leave me, girl. Fate is against me, and a curse upon me. Bubbled out of my fortune in the city, robbed of my gold upon the road. To be honest is to be a fool. He flung himself on the bed with a groan of anguish, and the ready tears ran down soft Barbara's cheeks. She had tact, however, in her humble way, and did not prattle to a strong man in a moment of wild distress. She just turned and cast a lingering glance of pity on him, and went to fetch him food and wine. She had often seen an unhappy man the better for eating and drinking. When she was gone, he cursed himself for his weakness in letting her know his misfortunes. They would be all over the house soon. Why, that fellow next door must have heard me bawl them out. I have lost my head, said he, and I never needed it more. Barbara returned with the cold powdered beef and carrots and a bottle of wine she had paid for herself. She found him sullen but composed. He made her solemnly promise not to mention his losses. She consented readily, and said, You know I can hold my tongue. When he had eaten and drunk and felt stronger, he resolved to put a question to her. How about that poor fellow? She looked puzzled for a moment, then turned pale, and said solemnly, Tis for this day week, I hear. Twas to be a last week. But the king did not respite him for a fortnight. Ah, indeed. Do you know why? No, indeed. In his place I'd rather have been put out of the way at once, for they will surely hang him. Now in our day the respite is very rare. A criminal is hanged or reprieved. But at the period of our story men were often respited for short or long periods, yet suffered at last. One poor wretch was respited for two years, yet executed. This respite, therefore, was nothing unusual, and Cowan, though he looked thoughtful, had no downright suspicion of anything so serious to himself as really lay beneath the surface of this not unusual occurrence. I shall, however, let the reader know more about it. The judge in reporting the case notified to the proper authority that he desired His Majesty to know he was not entirely at ease about the verdict. There was a lacuna in the evidence against this prisoner. He stated the flaw in a very few words but he did not suggest any remedy. Now the public clamoured for the man's execution, that travellers might be safe. The king's adviser thought that if the judge had serious doubts, it was his business to tell the jury so. The order for execution issued. Three days after this the judge received a letter from Bradbury, which I give verbatim. The King versus Cox My lord, forgive my writing to you in a case of blood, 
There is no other way. Daniel Cox was not defended. Counsel went against his wish and would not throw suspicion on any other. That made it Cox or nobody. But there was a man in the inn whose conduct was suspicious. He furnished the wine that made the victim sleepy, and, I must tell you, the landlady would not let me see the remnant of the wine. She did everything to baffle me, and defeat justice. He loaded two pistols, so that neither could go off. He has got a passkey, and goes in and out of the swan at all hours. He provided counsel for Daniel Cox. That could only be through compunction. He swore in court that he slept that night at 13 Farringdon Street. Your lordship will find it in your notes. For twas you put the question, and methinks heaven inspired you. An hour after the trial I was at 13 Farringdon Street. No Cowan and no captain had ever lodged there, nor slept there. The present lodger, a city clerk, lodger at date of murder, an old clergyman that said he had a country cure, and got the simple body to trust him with a pass-key, so he came in and out at all hours of the night. This man was no clerk, but, as I believe, the cracksman that did the job at the Swan. My lord, there is always two in a job of this sort, the professional man and the confederate. Cowan was the confederate, accused the wine, loaded the pistols, and lent his pass-key to the cracksman. The cracksman opened the door with his tools, unless Cowan had made him duplicate keys. Neither of them intended violence, or they would have used their own weapons. The wine was drugged expressly to make that needless. The cracksman, instead of a black mask, put on a calfskin waistcoat and a bottle nose and that passed muster for Cox by moonlight. It puzzled Cox by moonlight, and deceived Gardiner by moonlight. For the love of God, get me a respite for the innocent man, and I will undertake to bring the crime home to the cracksman and to his confederate Cowan. Bradbury signed this with his name and quality. The judge was not sorry to see the doubt his own wariness had raised so powerfully confirmed. He sent this missive on to the minister, with a remark that he had received a letter which ought not to have been sent to him, but to those in whose hands the prisoner's fate rested. He thought it his duty, however, to transcribe from his notes the question he had put to Captain Cowan, and his reply that he had slept at 13 Farrington Street on the night of the murder, and also the substance of the prisoner's defence, with a remark that, as stated by that uneducated person, it had appeared ridiculous, but after studying this Bow Street officer's statement, and assuming them to be in the main correct, it did not appear ridiculous, but only remarkable, and it reconciled all the undisputed facts, whereas that Cox was the murderer was, and ever must remain, irreconcilable with the position of the knife and the track of the blood. Bradbury's letter and the above comment found their way to the king, and he granted what was asked, a respite. Bradbury and his fellows went to work to find the old clergyman, alias Cracksman, but he was melted away without a trace, and they got no other clue. But during Cowan's absence they got a traveller, i.e. a disguised agent, into the inn, and found relics of wax in the keyholes of Cowan's outer door, and of the door of communication. Bradbury sent this information in two letters, one to the judge and one to the minister. But this did not advance him much. He had long been sure that Cowan was in it. It was the professional hand, the actual robber, and the murderer he wanted. The days succeeded one another, nothing was done. He lamented too late. He had not applied for a reprieve or even a pardon. He deplored his own presumption in assuming that he could unravel such a mystery entirely. His busy brain schemed night and day. He lost his sleep and even his appetite. At last, in sheer despair, he proposed to himself a new solution, and acted upon it in the dark and with consummate subtlety. For he said to himself, I am in deeper water than I thought, Lord, how they skim a case at the old bailey. They took a pond for a puddle, and go to fathom it with a forefinger. Captain Cowan sank into a settled gloom, but he no longer courted solitude. It gave him the horrors. He preferred to be in company, though he no longer shone in it. He made acquaintance with his neighbour, and rather liked him. 
the man had been in the commissariat department and seemed half surprised at the honor a captain did him in conversing with him but he was well versed in all the incidents of the late wars and cowan was glad to go with him into the past for the present was dead and the future horrible this mr cutler was so deferential when sober was inclined to be more familiar when in his cups and that generally ended in his singing and talking to himself in his own room in the absurdest way he never went out without a black leather case strapped across his back like a dispatch box when joked and asked as to the content he used to say papers papers curtly one evening being rather the worse for liquor he dropped it and there was a metallic sound this was immediately commented on by the wags of the company that fell heavy for paper said one there was a ring said another come unload thy pack comrade and show us thy papers cutler was sobered in a moment and looked scared cowan observed this and quietly left the room he went upstairs to his own room and mounting on the chair he found a thin place in the partition and made an eyelet hole that very night he made use of this with good effect cutler came up to bed singing and whistling but presently threw down something heavy and was silent cowan spied and saw him kneel down draw from his bosom a key suspended round his neck by a ribbon and open the dispatch box there were papers in it but only to deaden the sound of a great many new guineas that glittered in the light of the candle and seemed to fire and fill the receptacle cutler looked furtively round plunged his hand in them took them out by handfuls admired them kissed them and seemed to worship them locked them up again and put the black case under his pillow while they were glaring in the light cowan's eyes flashed with an unholy fire he clutched his hands at them where he stood but they were inaccessible he sat down despondent and cursed the injustice of fate bubbled out of money in the city robbed on the road but when another had money it was safe he left his keys in the locks of the doors and his gold never quitted him not long after this discovery he got a letter from his son telling him that the college bills for battles or commons had come in and he was unable to pay it he begged his father to disperse it or he should lose credit this tormented the unhappy father and the proximity of gold tantalized him so that he bought a file of laudanum and secreted it about his person better die said he and leave my boy to barrington such a legacy from his dead comrade will be sacred and he has the world at his feet he even ordered a bottle of red port and kept it by him to swill the laudanum in and so get drunk and die but when it came to the point he faltered meantime the day drew near for the execution of daniel cox bradbury had undertaken too much his cracksman seemed to the king's advisers as shadowy as the double of daniel cox the evening before that fatal day cowan came to a wild resolution he would go to tyburn at noon which was the hour fixed and would die under that man's gibbet so was this powerful mind unhinged this desperate idea was uppermost in his mind when he went to his bedroom but he rested no he would never play the coward while there was a chance left on the cards while there is life there is hope he seized the bottle uncorked it and tossed off a glass it was potent and tingled through his veins and warmed his heart he set the bottle down before him he filled another glass but before he put it to his lips jocund noises were heard coming up the stairs and noisy drunken voices and two boon companions of his neighbor cutler who had a double-bedded room opposite him parted with him for the night he was not drunk enough it seems for he kept demanding t'other bottle his friends however were of a different opinion they bundled him into his room and locked him in from the other side and shortly after burst into their own room and were more garrulous than articulate cutler thus disposed of kept saying and shouting and whining that he must have t'other bottle in short any one at a distance would have thought he was announcing sixteen different propositions so various were the accents of anger grief expostulation deprecation supplication 
imprecation and whining tenderness in which he declared he must have t'other bottle at last he came bump against the door of communication neighbor said he your worship i mean great man of war well sir let's have t'other bottle cowan's eyes flashed he took out his file of laudanum and emptied about a fifth part of it into the bottle cutler whined at the door do open the door your worship and let's have t'other why the key is on your side a feeble-minded laugh at the discovery a fumbling with the key and the door opened and cutler stood in the doorway with his cravat disgracefully loose and his visage wreathed in foolish smiles his eyes joggled he pointed with a mixture of surprise and low cunning at the table why there it is other bottle let's have em nay said cowan i drain no bottles at this time one glass suffices me i drink your health he raised his glass cutler grabbed the bottle and said brutally and i'll drink yours and shut the door with a slam but was too intent on his prize to lock it cowan sat and listened he heard the wine gurgle and the drunkard draw a long breath of delight then there was a pause then a snatch of song rather melodious and more articulate than mr cutler's recent attempts at discourse then another gurgle and another loud ah then a vocal attempt which broke down by degrees then a snore then a somnolent remark all right then a staggering on to his feet then a swaying to and fro and a subsiding against the door then by and by a little reel at the bed and a fall flat on the floor then stertorous breathing cowan sat at the keyhole some time then took off his boots and softly mounted his chair and applied his eye to the peephole cutler was lying on his stomach between the table and the bed cowan came to the door on tiptoe and turned the handle gently the door yielded he lost nerve for the first time in his life what horrible shame should the man come to his senses and see him he stepped back into his own room ripped up his portmanteau and took out from between the leather and the lining a disguise and a mask he put them on then he took his loaded cane for he thought to himself no more stabbing in that room and he crept through the door like a cat the man lay breathing stertorously and his lips blowing out at every exhalation like lifeless lips urged by a strong wind so that cowan began to fear not that he might wake but that he might die it flashed across him he should have to leave england what he came to do seemed now wonderfully easy he took the key by its ribbon carefully off the sleeper's neck unlocked the dispatch box took off his hat and put the gold into it locked the dispatch box replaced the key took up his hat full of money and retired slowly on tiptoe as he came he had but deposited his stick and the booty on the bed when the sham drunkard pinned him from behind and uttered a shrill whistle with a fierce snarl cowan whirled his captor round like a feather and dashed with him against the post of his own door stunning the man so that he relaxed his hold and cowan whirled him round again and kicked him in the stomach so fairly that he was doubled up out of the way and contributed nothing more to the struggle except his last meal at this very moment two bow street runners rushed madly upon cowan through the door of communication he met one in full career with a blow so tremendous that it sounded through the house and drove him all across the room against the window where he fell senseless the other he struck rather short and though the blood spurted and the man staggered he was on him again in a moment and pinned him cowan a master of pugilism got his head under his left shoulder and pummeled him cruelly but the fellow managed to hold on till a powerful foot kicked in the door at a blow and bradbury himself sprang on captain cowan with all the fury of a tiger he seized him by the throat from behind and throttled him and set his knee to his back the other though mauled and bleeding whipped out a short rope and pinioned him in a turn of the hand then all stood panting but the disabled men and once more the passage and the room were filled with pale faces and panting bosoms lights flashed on the scene and instantly loud screams from the landlady and her maids and as they screamed they pointed with trembling fingers 
and well they might there caught red-handed in an act of robbery and violence a few steps from the place of the mysterious murder stood the stately figure of captain cowan and the mottled face and bottle nose of daniel cox condemned to die in just twelve hours time end of section thirteen recording by edward kirkby warwick england international short stories volume two english stories this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by edward kirkby international short stories volume two english stories edited by william patton section fourteen the knightsbridge mystery by charles reed part four ah scream ye fools roared bradbury that couldn't see a church by daylight then shaking his fist at cowan thou villain tisn't one man you have murdered tis two but please god i'll save one of them yet and hang you in his place way there not a moment to lose in another minute they were all in the yard and a hackney coach sent for captain cowan said to bradbury this thing on my face is choking me ah better than you've been choked at tyburn and all hang me don't pillory me i've served my country bradbury removed the wax mask he said afterward he had no power to refuse the villain he was so grand and gentle thank you sir now what can i do for you save daniel cox ah do that and i'll forgive you give me a sheet of paper bradbury impressed by the man's tone of sincerity took him into the bar and getting all his men round him placed paper and ink before him he addressed to general barrington in attendance on his majesty these general see his majesty betimes tell him from me that daniel cox condemned to die at noon is innocent and get him a reprieve o barrington come to your lost comrade the bearer will tell you where i am i cannot edward cowan send a man you can trust to windsor with that and take me to my most welcome death a trusty officer was dispatched to windsor and in about an hour cowan was lodged in newgate all that night bradbury labored to save the man that was condemned to die he knocked up the sheriff of middlesex and told him all don't come to me said the sheriff go to the minister he rode to the minister's house the minister was up his wife gave a ball windows blaring shadows dancing musics lights night turned into day bradbury knocked the door flew open and revealed a line of bedesigned footmen dotted at intervals up the stairs i must see my lord life or death i'm an officer from bow street you can't see my lord ha is entertaining the petition ambassador and his suite i must see him or an innocent man will die to-morrow tell him here's a guinea is there step aside here he waited in torments till the message went through the gamut of lackeys and got more or less mutilated to the minister he detached a buffet who proposed to bradbury to call at the doolittle office in westminster next morning no said bradbury i don't leave the house till i see him innocent blood shall not be spilled for want of a word in time the buffer retired and in came a duffer who said the occasion was not convenient ah but it is said bradbury and if my lord is not here in five minutes i'll go upstairs and tell my tale before them all and see if they are all hairdressers dummies without heart or conscience or sense in five minutes in came a gentleman with an order on his breast and said you are a bow street officer yes my lord name bradbury you say the man condemned to die tomorrow is innocent yes my lord how do you know just taken the real culprit when is the other to suffer twelve tomorrow seems short time hmm will you be good enough to take a line to the sheriff formal message tomorrow the actual message ran delay execution of cox till we hear from windsor bearer will give reasons with this bradbury hurried away not to the sheriff but to the prison and infected the jailer and the chaplain 
and all the turnkeys with pity for the condemned and the spirit of delay bradbury breakfasted and washed his face and off to the sheriff sheriff was gone out bradbury hunted from pillar to post and could find him nowhere he was at last obliged to go and wait for him at newgate he arrived at the stroke of twelve to superintend the execution bradbury put the minister's note into his hand this is no use said he i want an order from her majesty or the privy council at least not to delay suggested the chaplain you have and the day for it all the day i can't be all the day hanging a single man my time is precious gentlemen then his bark being worse than his bite he said i shall come again at four o'clock and then if there is no news from windsor the law must take its course he never came again though for even as he turned his back to retire there was a faint cry from the farthest part of the crowd a paper raised on a hussar's lance and as the mob fell back on every aide a royal aide de camp rode up followed closely by the mounted runner and delivered to the sheriff a reprieve under the sign manual of his majesty george the first at two p m of the same day general sir robert barrington reached newgate and saw captain cowan in private that unhappy man fell on his knees and made a confession barrington was horrified and turned as cold as ice to him he stood erect as a statue a soldier to rob said he murder was bad enough but to rob cowan with his head and hands all hanging down could only say faintly i have been robbed and ruined and it was for my boy ah me what will become of him i have lost my soul for him and now he will be ruined and disgraced by me who would have died for him the strong man shook with agony and his head and hands almost touched the ground sir robert barrington looked at him and pondered no said he relenting a little that is the one thing i can do for you i had made up my mind to take your son to canada as my secretary and i will take him but he must change his name i sail next thursday the broken man stirred wildly then started up and blessed him and from that moment the wild hope entered his breast that he might keep his son unstained by his crime and even ignorant of it barrington said that was impossible but yielded to the father's prayers and consented to act as if it was possible he would send a messenger to oxford with money and instructions to bring the young man up and put him on board the ship at gravesend this difficult scheme once conceived there was not a moment to be lost barrington sent down a mounted messenger to oxford with money and instructions cowan sent for bradbury and asked him when he was to appear at bow street tomorrow i suppose do me a favor get all your witnesses make the case complete and show me only once to the public before i am tried well captain said bradbury you are square with me about poor cox I don't see as it matters much to you but i'll not say you nay he saw the solicitor for the crown and asked a few days to collect all his evidence the functionary named friday this was conveyed next day to cowan and put him in a fever it gave him a chance of keeping his son ignorant but no certainty ships were eternally detained at gravesend waiting for a wind there were no steam tugs then to draw them into the blue water even going down the channel letters boarded them if the wind slacked he walked his room to and fro like a caged tiger day and night wednesday evening barrington came with the news that his son was at the star in cornhill i have got him to bed said he and lord forgive me i have let him think he will see you before we go down to gravesend tomorrow then let me see him said the miserable father he shall know naught from me they applied to the jailer and urged that he could be a prisoner all the time surrounded by constables in disguise no the jailer would not risk his place and an indictment bradbury was sent for and made light of the responsibility i brought him here said he and i will take him to the star i and my fellows indeed he will give us no trouble this time why that would blow the gaff and make the young gentleman fly to the whole thing it can only be done by authority was the jailer's reply then by authority it shall be done said sir robert 
Mr. Bradbury, have three men here with a coach at one o'clock, and a regiment, if you like, to watch the star. Punctually at one came Barrington with an authority. It was a request from the Queen. The jailer took it respectfully. It was an authority not worth a button, but he knew he could not lose his place with this writing to brandish at need. The father and son dined with the general at the star. Bradbury and one of his fellows waited as private servants. Other officers in plain clothes watched back and front. At three o'clock father and son parted, the son with many tears, the father with dry eyes, but a voice that trembled as he blessed him. Young Cowan, now Morris, went down to Gravesend with his chief, the criminal back to Newgate, respectfully bowed from the door of the star by landlord and waiters. At first he was comparatively calm, but as the night advanced became restless, and by and by began to pace his cell again like a caged lion. At twenty minutes past eleven a turnkey brought him a line. A horseman had galloped in with it from Gravesend. A fair wind, we weigh anchor at the full tide. It is a merchant vessel, and the captain under my orders to keep off shore and take no messages. Farewell. Turn to the guard you have forgotten. He alone can pardon you. On receiving this note, Cowan betook him to his knees. In this attitude the jailer found him when he went his round. He waited till the captain rose, and then let him know that an able lawyer was in waiting, instructed to defend him at Bow Street next morning. The truth is, the females of the Swan had club money for this purposes. Cowan declined to see him. I thank you, sir, he said. I will defend myself. He said, however, he had a little favour to ask. I have been, said he, of late much agitated and fatigued, and a sore trial awaits me in the morning. A few hours of unbroken sleep would be a boon to me. The turnkeys must come in to see you are all right. It is their duty, but I will lie in sight of the door if they will be good enough not to wake me. There can be no objection to that, Captain, and I am glad to see you calmer. Thank you. Never calmer in my life. He got his pillow, set two chairs, and composed himself to sleep. He put the candle on the table, that the turnkeys might peep through the door and see him. Once or twice they peeped in very softly, and saw him sleeping in the full light of the candle, to moderate which, apparently, he had thrown a white handkerchief over his face. At nine in the morning they brought him his breakfast, as he must be at Bow Street between ten and eleven. When they came so near him, it struck them he lay too still. They took off the handkerchief. He had been dead some hours. Yes, there, calm, grave, and noble, incapable, as it seemed, either of the passions that had destroyed him, or the tender affection which redeemed yet inspired his crimes, lay the corpse of Edward Cohen. Thus miserably perished a man in whom were many elements of greatness. He left what little money he had to Bradbury, in a note imploring him to keep particulars out of the journals for his son's sake, and such was the influence on Bradbury of the scene at the star, the man's dead face, and his dying words, that, though public detail was his interest, nothing transpired but that the gentleman who had been arrested on suspicion of being concerned in the murder at the Swan Inn had committed suicide to which was added by another hand. Cox, however, was the king's pardon, and the affair still remained shrouded with mystery. Cox was permitted to see the body of Cowan, and whether the features had gone back to youth, or his own brain, long sobered in earnest, had enlightened his memory, recognized him as a man he had seen committed for horse-stealing at Ipswich, when he himself was the Murr's groom. But some girl lent the accused a file, and he cut his way out of the cage. Cox's calamity was his greatest blessing. He went into Newgate scarcely knowing there was a god. He came out thoroughly enlightened in that respect, by the teaching of the chaplain and the death of Cowan. He went in a drunkard. The noose that dangled over his head so long terrified him into lifelong sobriety, for he laid all the blame on liquor and he came out as bitter a foe to drink as drink had been to him. His case excited sympathy. A considerable sum was subscribed to set him up in trade. He became a horse-dealer, on a small scale, 
but he was really a most excellent judge of horses and being sober enlarged his business horsed a coach or two attended fairs and eventually made a fortune by dealing in cavalry horses under government contracts as his money increased his nose diminished and when he died old and regretted only a pink tinge revealed the habits of his earlier life mrs martha cust and barbara lamb were no longer sure but they doubted to their dying day the innocence of the ugly fellow and the guilt of the handsome civil-spoken gentleman but they converted nobody to their opinion for they gave their reasons end of section 14 recording by edward kirkby warwick england International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. International Short Stories, Volume 2, English Stories. Edited by William Patton. Section 15. The Courting of Dinah Shad by Rudyard Kipling Part 1 All day I had followed at the heels of a pursuing army engaged on one of the finest battles that ever camp of exercise beheld. Thirty thousand troops had, by the wisdom of the government of India, been turned loose over a few thousand square miles of country to practice in peace what they would never attempt in war. The army of the south had finally pierced the center of the army of the north and was pouring through the gap hotfoot to capture a city of strategic importance Its front extended fanwise the sticks being represented by regiments strung out along the line of route backward to the divisional transport columns and all the lumber that trails behind an army on the move on its right the broken left of the army of the north was flying in mass Chased by the southern horse and hammered by the southern guns till these had been pushed far beyond the limits of their last support Then the flying army of the north sat down to rest while the commandant of the pursuing force telegraphed that he held it in check and observation Unluckily he did not observe that three miles to his right flank a flying column of northern horse with a detachment of gorkas and british troops had been pushed round as fast as the falling light allowed to cut across the entire rear of the southern army to break as it were all the ribs of the fan where they converged by striking at the transport reserve ammunition and artillery supplies their instructions were to go in avoiding the few scouts who might not have been drawn off by the pursuit and to create sufficient excitement to impress the southern army with the wisdom of guarding their own flank and rear before they captured cities It was a pretty maneuver neatly carried out Speaking for the second division of the second army Our first intimation of it was at twilight When the artillery were laboring in deep sand Most of the escort were trying to help them out and the main body of the infantry had gone on a Noah's Ark of elephants camels and the mixed menagerie of an Indian transport train bubbled and squealed behind the guns When there rose up from nowhere in particular British infantry to the extent of three companies Who sprung to the heads of the gun horses and brought all to a standstill amid oaths and cheers? How's that umpire said the major commanding the attack and with one voice the drivers and limber gunners answered Hout! while the colonel of artillery sputtered All your scouts are charging our main body said the major your flanks are unprotected for two miles I think we've broken the back of this division and listen there go the Gorkas a Weak fire broke from the rear guard more than a mile away and was answered by cheerful howlings the Gorkas who should have swung clear of the second division had stepped on its tail in the dark but drawing off hastened to reach the next line which lay almost parallel to us five or six miles away Our columns swayed and surged irresolutely 
three batteries the divisional ammunition reserve the baggage and a section of hospital and bearer corps the commandant ruefully promised to report himself cut up to the nearest umpire and commending his cavalry and all other cavalry to the care of eblis toiled on to resume touch with the rest of the division we'll bivouac here tonight said the major i have a notion that the gorkas will get caught they may want us to reform on stand easy till the transport gets away a hand caught my beast's bridle and led him out of the choking dust a larger hand deftly canted me out of the saddle and two of the hugest hands in the world received me sliding pleasant is the lot of the special correspondent who falls into such hands as those of privates mulvaney authoress and leroyd and that's all right said the irishman calmly we thought we'd find you somewhere hereby is there anything of yours in the transport authoress will fetch it out authoress did fetch it out from under the trunk of an elephant in the shape of a servant and an animal both laden with medical comforts the little man's eyes sparkled if the brutal and licentious soldiery of these parts get sight of the thruck said mulvaney making practised investigation they'll loot everything they're being fed on iron filings and dog biscuit these days but glory's no compensation for a bellyache praise be we're here to protect you sir beer sausage bread soft and that's a curiosity soup in a tin whiskey by a smell of it and fowls mother of moses but ye take the field like a confectioner tis scandalous here's a officer said authoress significantly when the sergeant's done lushing the private may clean the spot I bundled several things into Mulvaney's haversack before the major's hand fell on my shoulder and he said tenderly Requisition for the Queen's service Worsley was quite wrong about special correspondence. They are the best friends of the soldier Come and take potluck with us tonight And so it happened amid laughter and shoutings that my well-considered commissariat Melted away to reappear on the mess table which was a waterproof sheet spread on the ground the flying column had taken three days ration with it and there be few things nastier than government rations especially when government is experimenting with german toys herbsvurst tinned beef of surpassing tinniness compressed vegetables and meat biscuits may be nourishing but what thomas atkins wants is bulk in his inside the major assisted by his brother officers purchased goats for the camp and so made the experiment of no effect long before the fatigue party sent to collect brushwood had returned the men were settled down by their valises kettles and pots had appeared from the surrounding country and were dangling over fires as the kid and the compressed vegetables bubbled together there rose a cheerful clinking of mess tins outrageous demands for a little more stuffing with that there liver wing and gust on gust of chaff as pointed as a bayonet and as delicate as a gun butt the boys are in a good temper said the major they'll be singing presently well a night like this is enough to keep them happy over our heads burned the wonderful indian stars which are not all pricked in on one plane but preserving an orderly perspective draw the eye through the velvet darkness of the void up to the barred doors of heaven itself the earth was a gray shadow more unreal than the sky we could hear her breathing lightly in the pauses between the howling of the jackals the movement of the wind in the tamarisks and the fitful mutter of musketry fire leagues away to the left a native woman in some unseen hut began to sing the mail train thundered past on its way to delhi and a roosting crow cawed drowsily then there was a belt loosening silence about the fires and the even breathing of the crowded earth took up the story the men full fed turned to tobacco and song their officers with them happy is the subaltern who can win the approval of the musical critics in his regiment and is honored among the more intricate step dancers by him as by him who plays cricket craftily will thomas atkins stand in time of need when he will let a better officer go on alone the ruined tombs of forgotten mussulman saints 
heard the ballad of Agra Town, the Buffalo Battery, marching to Kabul, the long, long Indian day, the place where the Punka Kuli died, and that crashing chorus which announces youth's daring spirit, manhood's fire, firm hand and eagle eye, must be a choir who would aspire to see the grey boar die. Today, of all those jovial thieves who appropriated my commissariat, and lay and laughed round that waterproof sheet, not one remains. They went to camps that were not of exercise, and battles without umpires. Burma, the Sudan, and the frontier fever, and fight, took them in their time. I drifted across to the men's fires in search of Mulvaney, whom I found greasing his feet by the blaze. There is nothing particularly lovely in the sight of a private thus engaged after a long day's march, but when you reflect on the exact proportion of the might, majesty, dominion, and power of the British Empire that stands on those feet, you take an interest in the proceedings. There's a blister, bad luck to it, on the heel, said Mulvaney. I can't touch it. Prick it out, little man. Authoris produced his housewife eased the trouble with a needle, stabbed Mulvaney in the calf with the same weapon, and was incontinently kicked into the fire. "'I've broke the best of my toes over you, ye grinning child of disruption,' said Mulvaney, sitting cross-legged and nursing his feet. Then, seeing me, "'Oh, it's you, sir. Be welcome and take that marauding scut's place. Jock, hold him down on the cinders for a bit.' But Orthrus escaped and went elsewhere as I took possession of the hollow he had scraped for himself and lined with his greatcoat. Leroyd, on the other side of the fire, grinned affably and in a minute fell fast asleep. There's the height of politeness for you, said Mulvaney, lighting his pipe with a flaming branch. But Jock's eaten half a box of your sardines at one gulp, and I think the tin too. What's the best with you, sir, and how do you happen to be on the losing side this day when we captured you? The Army of the South is winning all along the line, I said. Thin that line's the hangman's rope, save in your presence. You'll learn tomorrow how we retreated to draw him on before we made them trouble, and that's what a woman does. By the same token, we'll be attacked before the dawn in, and it would be better not to slip your boots. How do I know that? By the light of pure reason. Here are three companies, and as ever so far inside of the enemy's flank, and a crowd of roaring, tearing, and squealing cavalry's gone on just to turn out the whole nest of them. Of course, the enemy will pursue by brigades like us not, and then we'll have to run for it. Mark my words, I'm of the opinion of Polonius when he said, Don't fight with every scut for the pure joy of fighting, but if you do, knock the nose of him first. And frequent we ought to have gone and helped the Gurkhas. But what do you know about Polonius? I demanded. This was a new side of Mulvaney's character. All that Shakespeare ever wrote, and a deal more than the gallery shouted, said the man of war, carefully lacing his boots. Did I not tell you and Silver's Theatre in Dublin when I was younger than I am now, and a patron of the drama? Old Silver would never pay actor, man or woman. They're just Jews, and by consequence his companies was collapsible at the last minute. Then the boys would clamour to take a part, and oft as not, old Silver made them pay for the fun. Faith, I've seen Hamlet played with a new black eye, and the Queen as full as a cornucopia. I remember once Hogan, that listed in the Black Tyrone as was shot in South Africa, he seduced old Silver into giving him Hamlet's part, instead of me that had a fine fancy for rhetoric in those days. Of course, I went into the gallery and began to fill the pit with other people's hats, and I passed the time of day to Hogan, walking through Denmark like a hamstrung mule with a pall on his back. Hamlet, says I, there's a hole in your heel. Pull up your stockings, Hamlet, says I. Hamlet, Hamlet, for the love of decency, drop that skull and pull up your stockings. The whole house began to tell him that. He stopped his soliloquisms mid between my stocking may be coming down or they may not says he screwing his eye into the gallery for well he knew who i was but after the performance is over me and the ghost'll trample the guts out of you terence with your ass's bray with your ass's bray and that's how i came to know about hamlet 
Ay, ah, those days, those days. Did you ever have an end in divilment, and nothing to pay for it in your life, sir? Never without having to pay, I said. That's true. Tis main, and you consider on it, but it's the same with horse or foot. A headache if you drink, and a belly ache if you eat too much, and a heartache to keep you all down. Faith, the beast only gets the colic, and he's the lucky man. He dropped his head and stared into the fire, fingering his moustache for a while. From the far side of the bivouac, the voice of Corbett Nolan, senior subaltern of B Company, uplifted itself in an ancient and much appreciated song of sentiment, the men moaning melodiously behind him. The north wind blew coldly, she dropped from that hour, my own little Kathleen, my sweet little Kathleen, Kathleen, my Kathleen, Kathleen no more. With forty-five O's in the last word, even at that distance you might have cut the soft South Irish accent with a shovel. For all we take we must pay, but the price is cruel high, murmured Mulvaney when the chorus had ceased. What's the trouble? I said gently, for I knew that he was a man of an unextinguishable sorrow. Here now, said he, you know what I am now. I know what I meant to be at the beginning of my service. I've told you time and again, and what I have not, Dinah Shad has. And what am I, O oh, Mother Mary of Heaven, an old, drunken, untrustable beast of a private, that has seen the regiment change out from colonel to drummer boy, not once nor twice, but scores of times, ay, scores, and me not so near getting promotion as in the first, and me living on and caping clear a clink, not by my own good conduct, but the kindness of some officer boy, young enough to be son to me. Do I not know it? Can I not tell when I'm passed over at parade, though I'm rocking full of liquor, and ready to fall all in one piece? such as even a sucking child might see, because, oh, tis only old Mulvaney, and when I'm let off in the orderly room, through some trick of the tongue, and a ready answer, and the old man's mercy, is it smiling I feel, when I fall away and go back to Dinashad, trying to carry out all off as a joke? Not I. Tis hell to me, dumb hell through it all. And next time, when the fit comes, I will be as bad again, Good cause the regiment has to know me for the best soldier in it. Better cause have I to know myself for the worst man. I'm only fit to teach the new drafts what I'll never learn myself, and I'm sure as though I heard it, that the minute one of these pink-eyed recruities gets away from my mind you now, and listen to this, Jim, boy, sure I am that the sergeant holds me up to join him for a warning. So I teach, as they say at musketry instruction, by direct and ricochet fire. Lord be good to me, for I have stood some trouble. Lie down and go to sleep, said I, not being able to comfort or advise. You're the best man in the regiment, and, next to Authoris, the biggest fool. Lie down, and wait till we're attacked. What force will they turn out? Guns, think you. Thry that with your lords and ladies, twisting and turning the talk, though you mint it well. You could say nothing to help me and yet you never knew what cause I had to be what I am. Begin at the beginning and go on to the end, I said royally, but rake up the fire a bit first. I passed Orthrus's bayonet for a poker. That shows how little you know what to do, said Mulvaney, putting it aside. Fire takes all the heart out of the steel, and the next time may be that our little man is fighting for his life. His bradle will break, and you'll have killed him, meaning no more than to keep yourself warm. "'Tis a recruity's trick, that. Pass the cleaning rod, sir.' I snuggled down, abashed, and after an interval the low, even voice of Mulvaney began. End of section 15